All right, it is uh, October 4th. I will open the special workshop between the Grand County Planning Commission and the Grand County Commission on the uh, alternative dwelling overlay. Uh, present, we have commissioners uh, Trisha Dean, Mary McGann, Sarah Stock, Josie Kobosh, Evan Clapper, Kevin Walker, and myself, Jacques Hadler. We also have uh, planning commissioners Makeda Barkley, uh, Emily Campbell. Uh, live with us is are there any commissioners on Zoom that you guys can see? And our uh, our planning department head, uh, Elisa Martin. We also have uh, commission admin Mallory Nassau and uh, associate admin Quinn Hall and clerk Dave Wojtek. Uh, I will. I would request that we try to wrap it up by 3.50 so that we can rearrange the room and get us ready for our regular commission meeting if possible. And as long as there's only, at this point, only one person in the audience, I would invite you, if you care to, Steve, to, uh, to sit at the table if you like. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right, I will turn it over to Elisa, planning and zoning. Okay. Thanks, Elisa. Awesome. Okay, so I um, I updated the staff report from the original meeting on September 20th and just kind of added a couple of the items that were brought up at that meeting. Um, but some of the main sticking points that we need to go through today, I think, are, um, are, are still relevant from, from that staff report. So I left them on there. Um, the, you know, I don't think we need to go into the summary or background too much. I think we could just get right into some of these sticking points and then um, and see if we can find consensus on each thing. So the first thing that we were, the first sticking point that I have on the staff report um, is the pilot program terms. And uh, I don't think this was really settled at the last meeting, but um, there's been some debate whether or not uh, we should cap the program at as low as 50 units or as maybe as high as 150. It was originally set at 300, um, but I think everybody kind of agreed that that was a little too high for a pilot program. So um, staff's recommendation is the 150 cap, and that's kind of based on estimating that there's probably around 50 illegal residential situations going on. Um, in terms of uh, camping, res residential camping in Grand County. There's also um, estimated to be about 50 people on the wait list uh, for HASU's affordable housing or uh, affordable apartment complexes. And there's also a, around over 100 people estimated to be um, at risk for homelessness. So that, there's that. And then we set the sunset date to be a year out. So people could apply for this um, within a year's time after it being adopted. I think that's pretty reasonable. Okay, so weigh in on that. I like the year. We can always like add another year at the closure of the year. We're coming close to it. I also like the bigger number because uh, I think that with the point of people might apply and then it might take that's kind of the first step in just having the overlay applied. And so if there's some kind of disruption in the project or delays, I'd like it to not just be one or two projects that are in play. And I don't know, I know that when we were looking at a small RV park, it was like 60 units. And so if there is somebody willing to do a medium or large size, I would hate to see all those allotments eaten up by one project. We had a uh, public comment that came in today too that suggested that if we do approve 150 units, he said uh, this. This is someone who has done some developing. Suggested that we'd be uh, that we'd probably get considerably less than that, even if we, we sold it just due to due to people not following through or or people sit on them, right. etc. So mm -hmm. that, that'd be a consideration as well. Would you like to share? He asked, he put yeah, his so name on it, but he said he, he at the bottom, he said, please redact his name. But his name is on the, on the email. Okay, I just started checking. Another. Is it 
I, I don't have strong feelings about the cap, but I just wonder whether it makes sense to discuss this at the end once we know you know what the program okay, yeah. look like. Yeah, it's one of the bigger issues for sure, or maybe not issues, but um it's yeah, we could wait till the end. Um so the other the next sticking point uh that was included here is um whether or not to allow wells and septic for ADOs. And I guess this would only really be a consideration if we were anticipating any of these being approved outside of the, the valley. Um, and so I don't know, it almost seems like it could be a moot point because if we if we all agree that um, these could be, these would, wouldn't really be appropriate out in more outlying areas, then they would need to connect to, to this up. So if um, so, knowing that there's currently the water um, hookup moratorium in the Thompson, if there was interest in having an overlay applied and they were willing to truck in water, since this is sort of in between that residential and non-residential use, how would that apply, or would that apply? This wouldn't be because of the hookup constraint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any need for us to? I mean, I think on all the other land use categories, we don't specify connection versus well versus septic. So why can't we just be silent? Um, yeah, in, in our land use code currently, like new subdivisions, any new development is required to connect to public service oh. uh, utilities if they're within the bounds of that. If they can connect, they're required to connect. Could that same stuff apply? Like if somebody wanted to do one in Cisco, or want to truck water or whatever. Well, that's the yeah, that's the question. Like that would be something to consider if we were going to <laughs> support development like that. Um, and, and I know that there's been discussion about kind of getting away from that completely, like in the future, maybe updating the land use code to not allow uh, cistern water storage. For new development so it just feels like a larger issue to me and not really specific to this type of mm -hmm. development it does, so, definitely. i mean I, you know, I think we should decide whether we anticipate an outside of spanish valley or not but i would discuss that directly not be able to talk about what I'm saying. right so i guess it does bring up then the the issue to consider is whether or not we could see these being approved in like an area maybe Along, you know, North 191 corridor. If that's a hard no, then. <laughs> well, you know, it's already being used that North corridor for uh, people who don't have places to stay. They yeah. stay on the public land. They stay on the public land and then you know, yeah. drive it into town. So it's already being used uh, in that manner. Mm -hmm. Whether we want to make it so that it's more controlled and sanitary. That would be a reason for having, you know, making. I'm kind of with Kevin that that seems more like a mapping exercise of where we want to then. I think just defaulting to whatever the underlying zone coding yeah. Yeah. is fine. Yeah, I was going to bring this up because I, I noticed in those first numbered points where we decide where they lay. Like if we're looking at the location of ADO should be within one mile to work centers. That includes Red Cliffs and Sorrel and and the airport and, the airport and I don't right. know, Thompson. And I don't think I'm prepared to allow an increase in density out on 128 or even in the private lands outside of Castle Valley. Um, I, the North Corridor, I'm not sure about, but I think we should be specific about those zones instead of trying to to write it in with like the one mile to work centers mm -hmm. like in specific yeah. terms. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, so the way that the code is written right now, it wouldn't uh, exclude those areas. Right. So we'd have to kind of we would want to either put in um, add like a map or some language that would say specifically that ADLs would be appropriate only in you know a certain area which yeah. is the valley basically but i mean that originally i think we did think about 
the idea of housing needs outside of the valley for those areas like the airport and the parks um, where there are employees commuting in a lot of cases, maybe even from Mohawk Valley and all the way out to that area or living in Thompson. So I don't know, that was, we were leaving it open, I guess, is what the original consensus was. But that one of the other topics in here to discuss was to create a map, map or an eligibility map like the HGHO had or um, the, conversely, like a restricted area map. So just kind of showing areas that would be off limits instead of specific parcels that would be eligible. So what, what are, what are you well, that would be if you chose, if you had, if you wanted to limit the ADO opportunities to just the valley instead of the outlying areas, North Corridor and the, those kinds of areas. It is a large discussion for sure. And it kind of right. goes into the whole future land use planning. Um, and maybe for just this pilot program, we just kind of keep right. it to the valley. Because the idea is if it's a successful pilot, hopefully it could expand and then we could re address. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that was the discussion at the planning commission level was there are certainly trade-offs between do you draw a map and run the risk of missing an opportunity where it actually could be a very viable location, especially if the map is somewhat arbitrary to um, underlying zone specifically. Um, we also, the conversation around um, the pilot program, there's obviously a trade off there between certainty for people who own land and want to be able to know exactly what they can do with the land, but also wanting to make sure that we were beginning with the places where this was already a feasible use, maybe it already had existing similar infrastructure on the ground, um, and, and saw the pilot as a way to learn, not just sort of grow slowly. And so um, having more control and a smaller scope of the pilot would allow us to make smart improvements before deciding whether or not to expand either location or the use itself. Do we want to say, because I think that is one of the big questions is where yeah. these things are going to be allowed. Um, and that's what it feels like. Some of the angst mm -hmm. that people are having is coming from that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so I, I guess my comment on that is this, this is kind of you know, dense residential development. So one approach would be to say these are allowed, if, you know, where we allow other types of dense residential development. Um, and, and then maybe you know carve out some little sec exception that would allow us to do the map type thing, which is a you know parcels kind of unique characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that that makes sense to me. I think I think it's also worth keeping in mind that you know, this is a you know that each of these requires a separate commission vote. So you know, we're not accidentally going to approve something if we, if we don't get the standards quite right, then we just don't approve that plan. Yeah. So we can put some general language in there that just allows us to basically we can say no if it just seems it's not appropriate to the area. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, I mean, there is, so I think a lot of these things get covered, these topics that we're, we're bringing up get do get covered in the um, issues of consideration in, in the draft language. So like compatibility with the existing community characteristics, existing density, or future land use designation. Um, and that's under 4.9.2. It's just, I put it up here on the screen. Um, I would, yeah, yeah before we I guess to... what I was pr proposing is to make that a little bit more explicit, saying that you know, the under, you know, either the underlying zone allows for dense residential things like this, or you know, there's a very, very minimal impact of this. And I think that would cover probably most of the places that we're thinking of this and would also cover the, Although we don't have, I can't think off the top of my head where we have very much density that's allowed currently in our zoning. I mean, small lot residential is quarter or 0.20 acre minimum. So you would be able to put is the MFR, I guess well, that's, that's not, so not really on the We map. don't really have that applied on the zone, it's not in the zoning. So that's why I think this would be something that would kind of that's why it would be an overlay, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the first place is because we don't really have that density allowance currently in our zoning. Mm -hmm. 
So we are about to revise at some point. Mm -hmm. That's all kind of happening at the same time, which puts us in good timing with a pilot that allowed you to get the use on the ground to address the urgent need, learn through those initial projects and applications while we're revising our future land use map. And since the future land use map should represent where we think uses are more appropriate in the future, sometimes you know, indistinct to the current underlying zone, I think that also opens up more what you're talking about, which is where do we believe in a county higher density residential makes sense? What is that gradation of density and then potentially reflecting that in a uh, map down the road? So does our old future land use map have areas that call that areas for density? It does, yeah. So a little bit of that, that, like it calls it, I think, infill, residential mm -hmm. infill. Um, I did create, as long as we're on the topic of a map, I created a map. Uh, actually, our new GIS tech person created it for us. And it just kind of shows, I'll share that with you in just a second. Is that the one you said? The potential yeah. idea of property. Potential. Yeah, I was going to ask about the zoning of, the, of all these potential parcels. And what does this be in? Yeah, I should have had him put the zoning layer on there. Um, but so some of the suggested areas that we we imposed on this map were like that Mill Creek Spanish Valley node yeah. area, um, which we've actually had some folks interested in uh, a couple properties along the eastern side of Mill Creek, where there's currently like a the old yeah. junk junkyard. Yeah, there's yeah, a yeah, historic yeah. of abuse there. Mm -hmm. but. That property specifically was being brought up as like converting it to an ADO yeah. from, a, from a junkyard. Right, and it's right next to a trailer park. Right, yeah. what turned it to tiny mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. So there's similar yeah, there's uses in that area. Also, um, some of these other kind of random ones are just property owners that have come to us over the last several months asking about being able to do something like this. Um, I do think that Mill Creek area is appropriate for sure. I would I would be worried if a lot of those lots started to fill up with this because that is some of the only other like prime commercial future oh, yeah. development for that. sure. I don't think we'd want to have like a big expanse, but just kind of those would be sort of eligible properties maybe or an, an area to right. consider, but not yeah, you wouldn't want to fill it up. For sure. Well, and to me, these random ones, I mean, other than the highway ones, which I'm totally okay with, but the other random ones that are sprinkled in, in residence, residential areas, that's spot zoning, right? Like, we're, that, I, I would really avoid that. But the, the, you know, the highway ones make perfect sense to me. Yeah. On the highway here. What's but that, what's for us thing? to just, if we just have random residents going, I want to do it, it's like, well. Oof. Well, and so we do have the consideration here in the code that says that it should be connect, or uh, the access right. should be provided on, along um, a, uh, an arterial or collector. Right. And so those are identified here. Mm -hmm. Murphy Drive, a uh, Spanish trail. And so on back you go back to this map, Spanish right. Trail is right here. Right. And that's where a couple of them were kind of being proposed or thought of. Um, I had a I had a question about that too. Like, isn't it best practices for developments to not be on like major places with high traffic because then in the future you have more potential to control that intersection. You know what I mean? Like, so say, say the development is like right off of Spanish Valley Drive, but the access is not on Spanish Valley Drive. It's on another access road. Um, if traffic increases in the future, you can then put a light on that, that secondary road. Whereas if traffic increases in the future and the access is on the main right. road, it just, it's harder to manage the traffic. Uh, see what you're saying. But I mean, I, yeah. I think that's a, it's an okay, like, I think that would be really course. true for commercial use, for commercial use. Um, but 
but I think for residential use, I think that I think the idea was kind of to try to keep it keep these more because they're going to increase the traffic um, because of the density that you would want to place them near or at least having some vicinity to uh, roads that can handle the traffic. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So. There's a parcel on Murphy Drive up there. Is that the high speed car? Uh, over here? No, no the, the first one. one. Oh, this one here. It's on the general. It is. It's a mix of highway commercial and general business. Yeah. Something else. Over there? Too? Yeah. It's highway commercial? Part of, or not highway commercial. It's not general business. Sorry. General business. Yeah. But it's an existing mobile home park. Sure. Is that where we Yeah, that's Oh, that's that why it's sense. on there because she's sense. actually been inquiring about that. Yeah, because that would be a kind of like they used to have quite but, a bit. But there are already like really, I'm just wondering where their extra room is. Well, they just had eight units, I think, that demoed in the fire. Oh, I see. Yeah. Easier way of posting. Right. So instead of replacing them with a single wide. So, so I, but so it seems like you know one question is, you know, do we like the existing thing that says these have to be on art arterial roads, or do we want to? One place that we've been talking about, right. um, or do we want to make that just advisory a little bit softer since this requires a vote? And then you know, you know, the idea, which I like, which is these should be allowed where you know large decided density is allowed. Response to that is around a whole lot of places, but we're about to change change the map, and that's one thing you keep in mind when we advise. So would that be anything but rural residential? Yeah, I, I just think those, I, I guess what I'm disagreeing with is making spot decisions about zoning. I, I think we should you know, have, if we want you know, eight units an acre in some place, we should say so as part of a comprehensive plan, not in the process of approving these things. And I think for the same reason, we don't like approving special events one at a time. We can make better decisions looking so, at a bunch at a time. I think when we decide about density on the zoning map, we should do it in big chunks, not you know, looking at one parcel in response to one application. So uh, manufactured home communities are conditional to are currently in small lot residential and highway commercial, um, dwelling multifamily, multifamily residential, and then highway commercial. Um, Resort commercial and resort special, interestingly, not general business, which is that larger parcel there at Hunt Murphy. Um, that's four to bit. Um, right. So, no large lot, no overall. Certainly, no large lot, no overall, currently in the land use. Okay. Right. So, if we were going to, if we were going to go the route that you're saying, Kevin, I think that would, that would mean probably postponing this, or were you saying to write into the to the language that we would wait until the future language. Well, I think we, we do have some. I, I just I think the app we can write it and adopt it right now, but then the places it applies to might change if we change the zoning plan. Uh huh. References. Okay. Yeah. Are you saying that that the underlying density would determine the density yeah. of the paper? I, I, I guess what I'm proposing, what I'm throwing out there is we should you know this. These developments are some kind of dense residential thing. And so we should we be deciding them one parcel at a time as the applications come up to us, or should we be allowing them to be decided right. based on but I, I think part of it is enticing people to build workforce health because if it's if it's determined by whatever the underlying zoning is, if they could build eight McMansions or have eight campers there, they're gonna go for the big one. But my understanding is in the upcoming zoning revision, we are going to have these sort of elig eligibility zones for something Higher similar density. to HD HDHO. Mm -hmm. This could use those same. <clears throat> for example. Mm -hmm. I was kind of seeing this as a carrot where you'd be able to do something that you wouldn't typically be able to do. But, but that's also 
true. I mean, I think we're building carrots in the green. The problem is the new the revised maps won't be available in time. I just yeah, I think that process will be taking a little bit longer than what we were hoping to get done with this. Is you know the timing is a little bit. I see that that it, it would be nice to have it all wrapped up in one future land use comprehensive planning process. Um, but yeah, it just that is going to be probably a few several months maybe that we yeah. get that finalized. So That's if we, I, I mean to me a couple months isn't long. I mean it, it'd be one thing if you if you were going to say a couple of years I'd be like okay, mm -hmm. but to me. To delay a couple months, anyways, I, I would be more apt to do something like that. The, the challenge with the delay of a couple months is it's already October, and so if this were adopted before the new year, maybe the last commission meeting, um, for people whose whose parcels were included in that underlying the the eligibility zone, you know that would give them a fairly limited amount of time to get infrastructure on the ground if they were permitted. So getting the permits through and so on first to create housing before the season for next year, which, you know, ostensibly starts in February or March these years. So, I mean, one possible way to approach this is by defining the pilot more strictly and giving a sort of eligibility zone for the pilot that was inclusive of places where existing density reflected this type of density. So that would exclude our most of our residential zones. Um, and potentially include in even that eligibility map using those zones, the parcels that have already been identified that fit outside of that, but are otherwise highly um, acceptable for this use, such as the, the one near town. So that is one way to approach it from a pilot perspective, which would not create the risk that people are feeling in our residential areas about what this could do to their neighborhoods. Most of these are along 191 already. Uh, and so you could unblock the creative thinking for people to come to the table and let the commission start to see what the market is interested in producing, at which point you would be able to, I mean, there's nothing that stops you from revising this pilot program when those maps are available, even if it's, you know, before that one year period. And this whole, whole ordinance is, you know, overlay is being proposed at this time on this timeline because of the urgency of the need for housing for people in our community who are upholding our community and our workforce. And there's entire um, trailer parks being, you know, kicking people out, and there's lots of people at risk of homelessness right now. So that's part of the urgency of this right now, um, and why we're trying to propose having this pilot and see it sooner. Uh, I, I mean, I will say, and I, I understand delaying it a couple months just delays it more. But I'll just tell you from a contractor's perspective, and Dan kind of knows this. There's no, you're not going to find a contractor do this work within a couple of months. I'll tell you that most contractors are a year or two or three years out right now. I mean, just ask around. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's, it, I think, I, I, it'd be really hard to get something on the down right away. I think there's people ready to move right now on this. I, I, I think I agree with you on almost a traditional built things that yes, that's happening, but I think there are some people who we still have to get in contractor to put pipes in the ground to get the infrastructure in place. Yeah, I, I don't think that we should base our timelines around, you know, like other people's availability. I think that, I understand that. and I think that to your point that like a few months is only a few months, but we're also talking about making this available for only a year. And so that year is going to come and go pretty quick. So I'm kind of more on the uh, set the eligibility broad. Yeah and then have them propose projects where we have a more uh, you know the ability to, to pick and choose what we like and what we don't like because it, it with the uh, high density housing overlay there were definitely projects that came to us that the neighborhoods were like no this isn't appropriate you know people were wanting to build multi-story apartments in places where it was just out of place and we had the ability to just say no nah, we don't like it and, and you didn't really have to give much reason why. So it's not like it's hard to deny inappropriate projects. I think I one more, just to speak to your concern over density and not, like I have a concern over willy-nilly increasing density, but I, I think that um, in this code, it's written to kind of reflect that with 
the I'm not going to speak very well to it, but it's um, the coverage of acre, mm -hmm. the acre. So we're never going beyond the building coverage max. We're never going beyond what would already be permitted in that zone on that property. So like a rural residential spot is not just going to fill up with trailers. It's just a different kind of coverage. It's just a different kind of coverage. Mm -hmm. well, it's, like, more, it's, it's more family, more it's more residential density in terms of like families or people right. that would be living yeah. in individual dwellings. Um, that correct. does increase, but the actual footprint of the buildings and the coverage of the lot doesn't increase. So that's, it, yeah, that's kind of how we designed it. So like for an acre, you have um, 10, I think it's like 25% for rural residential or even large lot residential is the, is the max building coverage. And so for, for an acre, that comes out to be 10,890 square feet. Um, and if you had 800 square foot dwelling sites, you could fit roughly 13, but you probably wouldn't put that many in because of, you know, there would still be the need for other structures on the site. Like if they were gonna do a communal bathroom or any kind of storage or anything like that, um, they could reduce it down. I could see those being realistically around 10 per yeah. 10 dwelling sites per acre. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I mean, I, later in this conversation, I was, I'm kind of skeptical of this coverage idea. And I think you, if I understood you correctly, you're saying on it, something that's currently zoned one unit per acre, we could fit you know, 10 things on it, which mm -hmm. seems like a very, very different use that's of a, land. Than that what's, is an increase for sure in density, so but I, it's definitely not, it's not the so whole it's lot. Not on the yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I mean, Evan brought up HDHO, and I, I was going to bring it up to try to maybe you know, a different conclusion, which is I, I think during HDHO, we, in hindsight, we didn't know this at the time, but we kind of drew the eligibility zones too large. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were getting all these projects, and we were getting them one at a time, and not as part of some comprehensive thing. And a lot of the early ones are pretty far south on Spanish Valley Road. And we did a lot of stuff there, whereas in hindsight, there was a lot of interest in the program. We could have made the eligibility zone you know, probably half the size it was. It would have filled up a little bit slower, but we would have had things closer to town and closer to high. You know, so I, I guess my concern this is to avoid making that same mistake again. And if, you know, if, if it's not convenient to have some kind of hard restriction about the underlying density, we could at least put in language so that you know our future selves you know, six months from now when we're trying to do something. Hey, you know, this is kind of really discouraging to be doing this in the Southern Spanish Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and so that. So I think this, um, because also the minimum lot size, I think if you're trying to reorient a lot of this towards like multifamily or residential and single lot residential, then having a half acre minimum lot size is actually pretty prohibitive because a lot of those lots might be smaller if it's a more appropriate zoning. So what I'm hearing is like maybe we just leave that range and raise it even for a residential and you know rein it in from there, but then we might have to rethink some of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, our zoning map are, is pretty. It's covered with rural residential, but there's a lot of large lot residential mm -hmm. and some lot residential. There, yeah, the, yeah, especially with right. interest. Yeah, it is. I I am a fan of reining it in, like you said, whether it's with the eligibility map or maybe reining it in the wrong word, but clarifying the areas. Well, in the areas that Elisa showed that we've already had interest, it largely follows the highway commercial line already, 191 down the Mill Creek Spur. And then there's some general business off of Murphy, but there's pre-existing uses that are very similar to what this use would be on the ground. Um, so, you know, already just looking at where the application and interest is coming from, it's reflecting that pattern we've already been somewhat discussing uh, with a few very targeted exceptions, such as the lot, uh, you know, next to the water treatment plant in town. Um, a few things in the Spanish trailer. Yeah. The, in the uh, Spanish trail area. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, which is, you know, now a, a 
fairly established commercial node already, although there are residents along that street. So, um, I mean, I guess I just kind of maybe flip this around and say, what are the what are the reasons not to go the approach of during the pilot phase, putting some constraints in terms of underlying zone and underlying density with some exceptions for, um, you know, surrounding land use where it is appropriate. So it still gives you the discretion as the commission to make decisions as the overlay come in. It wouldn't be prohibiting those types of applications, but it would also give more certainty to developers who already own land that, you know, they wouldn't be just chasing chasing a stick uh, in, in trying to come forward with this type of approach. And I think to like bring it down to specifics and for instance, the Navtech property I'm seeing, I think it's rural residential mm -hmm. and it's not really close to arterial or connector streets. So already right. it's like doubly disqualified from a lot of what we're talking about, but I for one think it is more appropriate mm -hmm. than a lot of other parcels. So that is kind of the hindrance of not having the overlay and getting more specific is that we might lose these outliers. But, but I think they can also just say, you know, put in some kind of exception that, that would cover places okay. like that parcel, which I, which I agree. Yeah. Agree. And I'm not suggesting to get rid of the overlay. What I'm suggesting is that in the um, criteria, the 4.9.2, um, making it specific that the county commission will specifically look at either location with regards to underlying zones that already support similar density or location to commercial properties um, and similar pre-existing uses or some historic use of this land that reflects a more or less you know, con con continuity of, of the usage. So I think that would still give you the ability to attract interest from people who maybe think, well, we don't fit into this exact category, but we, we think that our, our land makes a lot of sense and it would give you that ability to see those creative ideas come forward as well. So are, are folks opposed to including large lot residential in this lineup? It just covers a lot of the county without a lot of definition to what specifically would be used to determine whether or not that large lot less residential parcel makes right sense. in addition to like yeah. on the arterial road and yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I, think what, I mean i i like what emily just said i mean you don't even have to call out specific zones you, you can just but just there's nowhere that has the similar density. density like we're increasing the density so to so, say like areas with a similar density. Well, on the ground there are like it, not in the zoning, you're, you're right, but like on the ground there are, there are, you know, denser areas right. that don't line up with the zoning, you know, they're yeah, not. So, so we could say, you know, either zone density or existing density mm -hmm. would just be compatible. I mean, that, that's still a kind so of a subjective soft language, language, but it does make it clear that we're not talking about most of the backyards in the county are not talking about parcel. Right. I think there it could be as simple as adding a, a, some kind of language in these issues of consideration to include um, referencing like uh, discourage the approval of these in rural generally in rural residential with the exception of blah blah blah. So if you wanted to try to kind of block off Sort of those more areas. state than preferred. Yeah, I, I'd rather be more on the preferred so you can still bring in ideas where they are creative. Okay. Um, yeah. Recommendation. Dana asked a question in the oh. chat. And it was maybe more. Is it Michael? Yeah, Brian. It's Brian. I'm sorry. My, my bad. I'm sorry. Um, I barely know my last name, let alone somebody <laughs> else's name. Dana asks, have you guys looked into so sewer? Would you be able to hook that lot into sewer? sewer. You would. Okay, yeah. so you've already looked into that. Okay, so she asked that question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Danny's ready. You have a contract ready. Okay. Great, 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 great. Okay. It's this okay, great. Okay. And the other thing about that is you wouldn't you wouldn't have to be we it wouldn't necessarily be every single site that would have to be hooked up if they were going to provide one communal bathhouse. That would be one hookup yeah but it still would require the impact fees for, for yeah but that is appropriate i think to be able to then use yeah it is but yeah so i can just make note of adding that language i don't know how you guys want to go forward in terms of making revisions during as a result of this, the outcomes of this workshop, and then going into the meeting tonight. 
Um, do we want to kind of, I can keep, get a running list and have the revisions ready to present back to you all at the meeting tonight and then, or I'm not sure how you wanted to do that. Is it kind of- I, I wonder whether there might be so many revisions that make sense to, to, to table it. I, I was thinking that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, rather than having you like duck out for right. 10 right. 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 minutes. Okay, I'm going to go. You got all this game? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Elisa, you can hear me? You can, yes. good, good. I got to the meeting late because somehow I didn't have a um, password to get in, but I found out how to get one, which was kind of, uh, kind of nice. Did we discuss uh, septic and water already? Because I know it was on your list. Yeah, I think the, the general direction we were going with that is that for this pilot program, um, we would like the consensus was to limit the approving of ADOs to the valley instead of the outlying areas. So it would kind of become a new point because um, if it was just limited to the valley, then would have to, folks would have to connect to WISA. So there wouldn't really be an opportunity for that. Got it, because I was actually the person who probably suggested it, and uh, I'm I'm fine with that decision. Obviously, places since we didn't have, as I understood, we weren't didn't have a map for who would be eligible. It looks like a broad ranging map, but it's uh, centered in the valley. Um, so I guess septic and water would all be hookups. Of course, almost anywhere outside of the valley where you can imagine people wanting to house um, folks like, let's say, uh, Sorrel River Ranch or uh, further up would probably both need to use their own water and septic, but I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm, well, and I mean, one caveat to those larger properties is this would be appropriate for places where the employer didn't the commercial use was not the place where this was happening but if they wanted to have people on their commercial right. property we already right. have that that's so, true. Yeah. Um, i think you know the 128 properties are probably less uh i mean i don't want to speak in terms of absolutes but i think yeah. this is more where we see larger density of people who don't have safe stable housing closer to their um, jobs in the commercial centers Did you have anything else, Obi? Uh, no, because of course I missed out on most of the discussion, but uh, as I'm gathering in the last five or so minutes, it sounds like the uh, you're gonna limit dwelling units and probably not time. Is that what it looks like in terms of- uh, No, we, uh, the pilot program would still have a sunset date of uh, within a year of adopting the ordinance. And then just a smaller limit on uh, number of dwelling units? We had we decided to wait to decide on that until later in the discussion. Great, okay. Has there I, been any interest from property owners outside of the valley? Not really. No, I wouldn't say there, would, there really is. Um, Aside from, uh, you, you know, there's always kind of that interest with, with the, the Willow Springs property where there was an RV park proposed, but that was for overnight. Yeah. Um, I think that that property owner is now going in the direction of proposing development based on the use by right in that zone and that it would also um, be proposing to have employee housing as part of that project based on what we already allow for on-site employee housing. Um, I had one more thing in the, this lineup, but number five, the mm -hmm. impact on water resources as compared to a single family dwelling development with equivalent number of housing units. I just wondered what, why that was relevant since the density wouldn't be allowed for single family dwellings in that area. So like why the comparison? I think it was kind of, uh, so maybe it's confusing the way we worded it, but it was to try to compare what, what a higher density K-12 
camp park type development would, um, as far as water consumption, would be compared to a single family dwelling. Like at the maximum density? The, yeah, yes. Okay. Like if there was going to be a subdivision on a, you know, a 20 acre parcel and okay. they were able to go to, to put 20 homes, single family homes on one acre parcels with a bunch of lawns and right. landscaping and everything that that would be comparably different than uh, Camp Park density. So maybe it should just say instead of with equivalent number of housing units at maximum number. Okay, yeah, we can units. clarify that for sure. I can see how that so sounds like, a little confusing. I guess I have more basic confusion with that the same number five. I mean, what, what is it we're trying to prevent? With well, group? the idea is that um, these individual camp sites would have a, a less, of, would consume less water based on the fact that they might not have as much landscaping and, um, and also maybe even family size, bedroom size. Right. Than a single family dwelling on a one acre lot. But why? What would happen if we just struck five? What kind of bad thing might happen? Um, I guess it was kind of like the to try to come up with. We were going to come up with some more data to, to support that that would help to kind of justify the decision to up the density. Well, it would be kind of more of a justification. Jane is online. Okay. Can we ask her specifically what an RV slot is considered as far as water? Um, I mean, can we? She's. I think she's still online. Well, I, I can ask that. Sure, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Just on a but, say a quarter acre lot, right. family residence. Typical household is going to carry on. 300 gallons per day per person. Quarter acre lot. Per quarter acre. Okay. Now, on my, I'm calculating that and it's coming out about 50 gallons per person. Per day. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, so typically, right. what about uh, three to four sites, two to three people right. Right. per site? Right. So it's considerably less. Right. Granted, we're not watering lawns. We're not watering the landscape. You know, I have some trees and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So, like I said, that so, difference is quite yeah. huge. And that's consistent with research we've seen elsewhere as well. Can, can we have Dana just speak to this for just a second? Go yeah, ahead, Dana. Dana. We can see you. How are you? Um, <laughs> good. So, a couple of things. Uh, we use indoor water use to calculate a lot of stuff that we do. And that's a little over 4,000 gallons a month indoor non, non landscape water use per household. 4.4, I think is what we landed on with the city because we concurred with them. Um, and then all this happened when we were doing the sewer treatment plant in 2016. So um, there's that. Also the state requires us to hold a certain amount of water per per capita or per connection, um, both in storage and the de delivery. So regardless of what our people use and, and in general, our, our users are a lot less than anywhere in the state, but I believe right off the top of my head that there, we're required to have 800 gallons per day per person in storage um, or per connection in storage and in capacity in the pipes. So, um, you know, for us planning wise, it doesn't matter what the dwelling type is because as soon as, you know, when we hit a certain number, the pipes won't hold anymore and we'll be in violation with the state if we don't uh, comply. So uh, there's that, but that was all I really wanted to say. I do have a couple um, just sort of questions um, before you guys end, if, whenever that's appropriate for me to talk. Just following up, so I think maybe now I understand my confusion. This, this list, you know, some of the items read like restrictions on like the first two, for example, but is number five supposed to be a, encouraging the commission to approve these things because they use less water per dwelling? That was kind of the idea. Okay. Yeah. That was confusing, yeah. I guess. But now, I see. now I get it. Right. Yeah, it's kind of just like an, another a sort of. Okay. Well, it's, it's showing that we're analyzing water resources as we're increasing density. So, but, right. but to me, it, it's, it sounded like, I mean, 
Because my first thought was, of course, these things are not going to use much water compared to other mm -hmm. alternatives. So why are we putting these extra restrictions on? It's, it's not a restriction. Right. It's not a restriction. It's more like a finding, a finding of that. However, I will say that all of our RV parks, the, the ones that are overnight and <clears throat> others, um, use more water than most. Um, so that's that's that, but they also have other factors. And if you're not going to require any kind of landscaping improvements, then that'll probably really help. So that'll, you know, make a big, that'll make a big difference, especially on a super small parcel. I don't think we'd have the same impact if you did, if you had something huge. They use more water than most compared to a single family dwelling. That's just for overnight, overnight rental yeah, overnight RVs. RVs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they count as more um, in the treatment for the sewer because their sewage is generally um, very condensed, uh, high, high strength, and so their BOD is higher and it takes more to treat that at the wastewater treatment plant. So the city charges us more for any kind of RV park. Um, I don't know that if they were connected directly to sewer that they'd use as much water when they flush or shower. I'm not, well, not shower, but when they flush, especially, um, I don't really have an RV, so I don't know how that's set up, but the strength of the wastewater coming out of the RV parks is definitely a concern for the wastewater treatment plant. And then some of those RV parks have like um, laundry facilities, um, one of them has a pool. Yeah. yeah, so there's some different, very, some factors that are playing into that. Well, to be fair, if you're on vacation, the desert was a good, you're showering multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. True. Going out and doing right. things and showering in tubs. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so I have a, like a long list of specific comments about further down we go, and most of them are on the theme of, you know, be making it too hard to make movies so, you know, things right. that seem a little bit less restrictive. Sure. So I don't know which part of. Yeah, I think we could move on to some things that were discussed at the last meeting in terms of like, um, you know, whether or not we need to require the communal kitchen. That was brought up to maybe just, that was on the chopping block. Um, the other thing was uh, requiring a bathroom for ADOs, um, whether or not they have hookups, but. I think it was it was just brought up by a person who had experience with RV parks saying that even if you do have hookups, that it might be good to have a restroom on site in case the there's any failures going on with us, with a particular RV. I don't know if we need to require that. There was going to be just the caveat of in there for you know for smaller versions of these. Um, but I'm open to your, your suggestions and your list as well. Let's get into those things. Okay. All right. Let me know when it's appropriate. Okay. To well, start let's, running through the list. let's. Should we talk about the communal kitchen first of all? First of all, I mean, we went back and forth at the planning commission whether or not that was going to be required. And I know you had mentioned that you didn't, there was, for a moment there, we weren't going to require it. And then we thought, well, not everybody should have to be uh, subject, you know, subject to um, buying food in town. And so we thought it was just kind of one of those basic amenities that should be provided. And I, but, well, I think part of it was, um, you know, the, the nature and the character of these that we've people live in more of a neighborhood. You know, is this one development or is this a neighborhood of people mm -hmm. who may have some common areas that they share? And so the community
think it should be a rigid requirement. Right. Well, I do, and if I it's do think located that, close to a commercial area with nearby, you know, grocery stores and things like that, that's a different. Sorry. If there's no hookups, um, that means that people don't have their own sinks. And I can see the requirement for a sink because it helps catch all the food. It helps like it's a simple requirement it doesn't cost that much and right. having a surface nearby where you can put your own stove or whatever it just seems minimal to me and it would do a lot for like just sanitation like an outside three sink system or something mm -hmm. just like that's standard at a lot of more outfitter style yeah so maybe just anyway. because there there is a requirement no matter what um for potable water supply to be provided okay. within 200 feet of dwelling sites. So maybe that could just be incorporated with the requirement to have a sink basin, a wash basin. If there's no hookups. Right, if there's no hookups. Yeah. yeah. Then a shelter of some sort. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of the, like the original shelter, language here says you know, a covered communal kitchen with, just with a, a wash basin. Just a, just like a shelter. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Not a, not right, not an enclosed. No, not necessarily enclosed. Just a roof. I just need to yeah. okay. I mean, I don't know if the, uh, other people feel differently. No, I, think that's, I mean, she's, you know, thinking about living in a tent as a river yeah. guy and just having some place to wash your dishes because maybe you've well, got a camp stove. Definitely. You've got, yeah, but just to have like a sanitary. What do you think of that, Brian? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I was a little bit worried at first about the, the entire new yeah. structure. Absolutely, right. Yeah. But, you know, a barbecue and you know, something like that set up, right. that doesn't, I mean, that's, that's all fine. And, you know, sink outside, of course, you got water. You know, sure. Kind of and then I'll uh, give you a wing to off of the side of it. And that's, that's yeah. Sure. yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the gas requiring a gas hookup for cooking, maybe that's going a little too far. To, yeah. To propane bomb or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Just a space, you know. I, yeah. I, I guess I'm in the minority, but I happily go you know, backpack for weeks with no sink and no nothing. And it's great. If I were car <laughs> camping, I would be fine doing the same thing. So I, I, I can see encouraging it, but making it, but if it, that's what, it just, I think it just makes it, it raises the bar for getting more pieces established. And I think it raises the bar minimally. And when, when you're working up in a situation, living out in my car and working and spend yeah, 10 hours at work and you come home, like the simpler, the better, just having a counter and shelter if it's raining out would make all the difference in the world. You're not on vacation. You're not on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Where? Okay, so I, I just modified that to say a covered area with a wash or sink basin and a utility surface or countertop. And it doesn't have to be any certain size, just just really basic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we just go down it. Yeah. Are we keeping the shower thing? Oh, well, so yeah, that's the other thing. Um, well, for for sites that don't have hookups, it is required by state health code to provide a communal bathhouse. But um, as far as the ones that do have hookups, there is this requirement we put here for ADOs over five sites, even with hookups, that there should be a restroom required. If it's all hookups, we wouldn't require the same of a development of five manufactured houses. So right. I don't know that it's. I think it's a little as, superfluous. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. a concern that originally came from somebody who owned an RV mm -hmm. campground. Right, in case something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But that could happen in your house also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of like. Yeah. So I think, I think we could scratch that. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody. So, so for number two, is dwelling site defined? Is that just, I mean, is that like a, the area that has gravel or is it the, yeah. of the trailer or is it? Yeah, so the dwelling area? site would be just the, the pad basically. Um, and that that does have a minimum of 600 square feet and no larger than 1200 square feet. So that, that seems a little too rigid to me if you're just looking for a place to park a van. Mm -hmm. You need 600 square feet of that gravel. Okay. So, yeah. I, I think that was just kind of a, a rough estimate that we came up with. Um, I think having a minimum for um, 
anything with a hook with hookups or things that are over a certain size, mm -hmm. but things below a certain size. Um, to your point, be a lot more flexible and sort of variable anyway. So if we just didn't have that in there, are we worried that people would set up things where their pads is always the wrong size? Well, again, you have discretion over the master plan, and while the sites themselves may evolve, you know, can require in the master plan that the maximum number of sites that they're needed be shown, uh, so that at least you can make sure that it wouldn't be inappropriate to have that number of units if you were to require some siting. What do you mean, like the intention of this was to prevent too many units from being crammed? On the too many units from being crammed, and also the units being crammed together in a way that didn't create, you know, neighborhood feel and the ability for people to have privacy in their own. Dwelling, even but if they're dwelling, but that is also something I guess we could do with by requesting a modification. Mm -hmm. I think maybe some of this could be solved with some definitions because, like, I hear what you're saying cal the calculation is based on the dwelling site size, so mm -hmm. it, it does make sense that dwelling sites shall be like allocated 600 square feet or something, you know, that they're given that square footage. Even if it doesn't require 600 square feet around the tent, but at least that would be available on the property. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And, but then nowhere does it distinguish between um, sites that would require a pad and sites that wouldn't require a pad. Like if we are permitting yeah. tents, right. definitely don't want to require a big <laughs> a gravel concrete pad. gravel. No, right. definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think we've mentioned that. I think the just there, in a few different places, maybe not on this section. Just distinguishing that ten sites are have an exception. Well, it sounds like we're thinking about not being so explicit on the gravel or road base, even for like vehicles or. Yeah. So the the requirement currently for that is, I believe, it's just. Um, Each site should be arranged. Uh, the interior driveway, that's that's one thing. Um, oh, so yeah, it's number six. Each site designated for tiny homes on a chassis, RVs, tra travel trailers, or camper vans shall provide an improved surface with compacted road base or gravel. Perhaps like appropriately sized. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. Appropriate to the size intended for, I think that, yeah. yeah. I also think number five should have a tent exception. Yes, yeah, so that was one of the other big kind of not big sticking points, but something we hadn't really covered at the planning commission to get specific about allowing tents or, um, and then there, there were some comments from the public to even be more in, implicit to allow yurts. So that is something I wanted to try to, to nail down if we could. So on five, appropriate to the, the use, the intended use, that seems like it would also, or could also apply to five. For the internal driveway? Well, gravel, compacted road base, all weather surface appropriate to the use, such as, you know, packed dirt, wet gravel, compacted road space. Oh, that's all. okay, yeah. Something to that effect. Like including just packed dirt. Right, but I think, you know, packed oh. dirt would make sense for an RV, obviously. So like, you know, right. the, the use where it was right. meant to be situated. Yes. But I think to your point, yeah, a tent wouldn't require gravel. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Saying the actual improved surface is well, that's referring in relation to the use. That one's referring to the driveway. So for mm -hmm. six, also for um, yeah, interior driveway. So that's the isn't that the driveway that goes into the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you're absolutely right, Sarah. So six with regards to just the yeah. the base of what needed to be underneath it. Rather than saying shall provide an improved surface with compacted road base, improved surface appropriate to the use, such as compacted road base, compacted dirt, gravel, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's just easier to require a site plan. 
Oh, yeah. Engineered site plan? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So drainage about, will be dealt with. Right. The engineer will be looking at it. Yeah. Right. Sure. So then so if we're not going to just define dwelling in number seven, any dwelling not on a chassis will require foundation and a building permit. We also need a tent exception. Right. And then potentially but is a yurt a tent? I think yurts probably, if they're permanent, would require a building permit and a foundation. But I don't know. Yeah, I how many years? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, well, like the ones that get set up in the mountains. Yeah. And I was looking at Utah State Code, there's an exception for building permits and foundation for remote years in the state of Utah, which mm -hmm. led me to believe that there might they might be required to have a building permit. They might be. in yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the ones in Castle Valley that are like people's houses definitely have them. Which wouldn't be a problem with this. I mean, if, if they had to get building permits, it wouldn't preclude them from being an ADO. Right. But uh, so I was just saying, yeah. we need a, a camping tent exception on number seven if if that's what we were going to oh, allow. Oh, I see. Any dwelling on a chassis, not on a chassis somewhere. Dwelling, excluding right. temporary oh, tents, yeah. maybe temporary. Temporary. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's like camping tents, but you could also have like a what about yeah, a TV? What about a? They would be Yeah. On um, is C one necessary? Has some solar design. Yeah, that was. That seems a little too much. We went yeah. back and forth on the planning. Yeah, that one did. too. I think that one was. We were trying to mitigate the, um, you know, sort of the development of these out on areas that didn't have any shade or um, they're just kind of out on a, on a fair lot and trying to provide some kind of design that would mitigate that. But when we get permits for other types of buildings, I don't think we have an explicit mm -hmm. passive solar requirement. So why should we pay for that? Right. The reality is RVs are not energy efficient. They're not going to be energy efficient and we need to suck that up. They're just not. Yeah. I've lived in RVs for many years. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They suck a lot of power. They're not. They yes. have no ins or minimal insulation. So we need to know that there's small. no way around that. Solar capability. Actually, are pretty nice. The technology is pretty good. There. That's true. Right. Yeah. That's um, very true. Right. Those that have had it, which is usually coaches, uh, they have reduced their power consumption through my supply right. by at least 50%. That's mm. cool. So, that's just good. FYI, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. This, that, that's in there. It's really basically kind of a guideline. Right. Uh, my particular property. You can put a solar panel on just about anybody's roof, and you're going to acquire it all day long, as long as the sun's up. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I can see other places, other properties, depending on the trees and things like that. Yeah, it might be a little bit difficult, but that being in there and being said is still just discretionary. Just and they end up encouraging. Yeah. But most people probably aren't heating their solar. Heating. Yeah. Oh, you say that? A, a, like the electric, electric heat is yeah. probably not what's not as common. Right. It's probably propane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or no heat. Yeah. <laughs> or it's just yeah. <laughs> From a seasonal position. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd be fine taking that out. I don't know if people thought it was just a, yeah. It's or you could say you can encourage it. Encourage. I mean, it seems like in general, there's like design and sort of you know somewhat obvious encouraging things that are not required, but that we would mm -hmm. judge. So that was part of the should too, because we went back up with it a lot. We were like. Talking about it, should never require that. And so the should is saying basically, right, this would be a good thing to do, but it's not required. It's just not where the teeth of our recommendations are. It's not for us. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. 
Yeah, I guess I was reading the should is more of a shall. The should is is in replacement of the shall. Yeah. I think if this was removed, it would be. Yeah, so it might be fine. nice that it is encouraged. Yeah. Right, okay. it's encouraged. Any shoulds are written like this. Encouraged instead of word. What's Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> so your mom always say that? She didn't mean should. She meant shall. Are we ready for? Yes, we want to move on. Which one? Uh, D, D1. I was wondering if that could be made like a soft requirement or anything like that. Evaluate from the master plan. I think this comes back to that, that question of. Um, the community value in community spaces, again, which we have precedent for in our other overlays. Yeah, I'm, so I'm once just imagining we, a place where people don't park their vans. And it would seem essential, but mm -hmm. it might be nice. But, I mean, is this another encouraged? Yeah. It could be, and then we can get rid of the minimum 5% because the reason that had to go in there is to be more specific. In, if it's a shall, then Christina wanted to have more specificity to right. what the requirement would be. To encourage so we could take out the kind of creative. Yeah, I don't know what you think. Though. I don't know. I mean, I, I went up and I visited with the residents at, at your place, Dan, and you know, many of them have created their own little gardens outside of their units. And there was a very nice residential feel. And I don't, do you have a designated community area? Not yet. Uh -huh. uh, it's in the future plan, but. Um, yeah, everybody just kind of made it comfortable for themselves. I do have an area that has grass on it. That, and in the front of my building will hold 4th of July picnics, New Year's, we can watch fireworks from there. So it's it's kind of fun. And the community, like tenants and stuff, we get together and barbecue and cook out and have a good time. That space, in my mind, is nice to have where people could gather. Making a requirement, I think most people are going to make one way or another, they're going to make a space that yeah. and make everything happen. Yeah. Uh, some of my tenants have actually thrown down uh, turf, or not turf, uh, master turf. Should, should artificial grass, grass. Yeah, someone it. has very enviable ba basil plants so i'll say yeah. that <laughs> set out long furniture and stuff and, and have some uh, uh, solar powered lighting going yeah. on at night and they can sit around and, and I mean, enjoy the something i've noticed with like you know like snow kind of snowbird rv parks you see further south and then i was just in nature of colorado that has kind of a little you know river camp for the summer and everybody's got like their little gardens and picket fences and the ways that they kind of gussy up their sites and it's quite nice actually we've got people That's with personal. right the i would recommend for two of you come up to the table because when we ask you questions i know people on youtube will not be able to see or hear you Okay. Yeah, uh, Brian. Sure. Thank you. So, I mean, one one way to capture this is to say they're encouraged to incorporate this in. Um, you know, I think you could go so far as to suggest that the um, you know site plan um, should be presented to encourage residential use and residential feel. I mean, that to me feels like the intent behind Outside this. Outside space. And let the applicant interpret that. You know, if people back up to open space, that could look different than if not. But, um, you know. I feel like if you get too specific, people yeah. can follow the specifics, but still not create a space that's conducive to hanging out that's in. That's also and, a good point. Isn't you it? know, sometimes. As a developer, and I'm looking at this and I'm planning my spaces and stuff like that. To me, I would like to see that community area so that you have a community instead of just like your traditional nightly rental, come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go. All right, you can party in your camper, that's right. what you want to do. Yeah. Um, but as a community, like what I've developed, it's just made it nice and co comfortable for everybody. And I get some pretty good tenants. 
you know, I have in the past had some bad ones, but there's ways of weeding them out. I like the yeah. way it reads now. Yeah, I just took out shall and yeah. put in place are encouraged mm -hmm. to incorporate into their site plan. Yeah, that would encourage to developers to get creative and mm -hmm. really to vision rather than just check boxes. Okay, yeah. on number four, I thought um, we could just X the relocating plants somewhere else on your property. Okay. Just because it's really hard. You have a giant shrub. It's just going to die. I don't know. It's it takes not skill. It's hard. It's not feasible, huh? Okay. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> it's hard to try. It's so really hard. Like, you're doing all day. Okay? Maybe it's not your hard. Yeah. I've seen the side of it. I know. <laughs> 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 I'm the daughter of a construction worker, <laughs> you know, contractor. <laughs> so, how would you, would you say that we should make this more relaxed and say just encourage uh, preserving native plants existing on the property? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good time to mention that Sarah Melnikoff has started offering the relocation of native plants from developments in progress and moving them up towards the um, recycling center. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah, she's just started that. But yeah. Maybe it's like the flowers you must relocate, but shrubs <laughs> you can just get rid of. <laughs> okay. Relocating, removing and relocating, or just repairing. Planting. Yeah. Yeah. Is they replacing? Replacing. replacing. Yeah. 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 Preserved, preserved or replaced. Great. Right. Shirley, do you want to um, come up to the table? We have another oh, seat here. Sorry, <laughs> I'm like. Okay. Are we good with the rest of those requirements or um, sh shoulds or shalls? We have the one tree or shrub or bush of a species suitable for the area. Maybe it's a shrub. Maybe the bush should go away. Yeah. We were well, originally with just a tree. Little bonsai rabbit for the state. Yeah, I can leave a bush. Yeah. 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 Okay. True. Um, one thing in, in the next section. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. And then the number six on here, we just wanted to encourage, or I think we require it to. Um, it's the same thing we require for the ordinary subdivisions. Yeah, I think to preserve the trails. Right. Yep. I had something for free, but people have comments for one or two. In this section we were just in, or? Dwelling design. Oh, dwelling design. OK. I um, wonder where there are any of those are necessary. No. Yeah, those came out of kind of some standard things that we found in other example codes um, for just, you know, Kind of mitigating the visual impact of. Yeah, like I, I recognize plastic and vinyl awnings from our overnight accommodation code. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that did come from there. Yep. I feel strongly that should be included because I've been at many encampments that are multi year encampments that have tarps, and tarps oh. just shred. Yeah. They like turn into, they turn into microplastics. microplastics. Like um, so I think that's reasonable. Yeah. 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 I mean, I do know, I mean, yeah, I've done like camped with a plastic tarp over my tent for like, summer, but the I'll last like a season. home use, it's yeah. like, yeah, and then it just gets in the ground and mm -hmm. watershed. And yeah, it's messy. But on, on number three, I thought, um, I thought this might exclude yurts. Structures on site shall be constructed of a durable primary material, such as stone, brick, earth, derived materials, wood, black, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I I think maybe it could include like felt or durable high tech architectural fabric mm -hmm. in that lineup. Is or sufficient to say permanent structures shall be. Permanent yours could be permanent or temporary. Yeah, like you are either primary material or your window. 
right. So in the canvas, whatever it's, that is. It's that. solar treated. So earth derived materials would be a very broad. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's <laughs> pretty broad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I had highlighted. I was like, it's the primary <laughs> material that what they're referring to. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that edit. I can think about that a little. And if it I mean, needs to be on number three, that's another thing I, I recognize from the overnight. Yeah. Kind of, so yeah. when we initially got that, these are for these really multi-million dollar mm -hmm. things that we were not trying to encourage. Mm -hmm. I think here we're trying to get people to do housing cheaply and easily. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know that that's appropriate. That whole thing I'm is there. Um, Sustainable 3D printed manufactured houses now coming online in New Mexico and Arizona that are quite yeah. quite aesthetic. So mm -hmm, you know, so you would, would all three of these apply to a nice RV that has that air conditioning on the top, has vinyl awnings, and is not made of earth or stone? Pretty much all campers, air conditioning units are. Yeah. Reside on the, on the roof, right? And we have vinyl awnings. So, how do we? Well, they're solar stabilized. What about the air conditioning units, so though? But, yeah. I mean, the yeah, screening and air conditioning unit, I mean, that's something that's appropriate for large buildings. Right. That seems more of a structure. Is there a way to word it if it's like a permanent structure that we don't want an air conditioning on the roof? Yeah. But, for but even if you buy a tiny home, if you put number one in there, they're going to have to modify the tiny home, which is going to add to the cost. So the tiny home is not a permanent structure; it's just on a chassis. It can be. It can be six family. Yeah, but are we encouraging just them just to the get there open? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we could just yeah. simply put more specificity specificity towards um, permanent structures versus non-permanent. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are required to be screened. I don't know. Um, why are we <laughs> what, what, what <laughs> for, for very, very large <laughs> buildings where you have multiple well, air conditioning even like, right, yeah, I was there on the ground, right, so this not, is like yeah. screened as something right. that in my house. Yeah. So this that's a hard one. Okay, so this sounds like it's a little unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it should be I mean, my, my cabins, they're park model cabin. Uh, literally, I have nothing on the roofs, but uh, PTAC units or a mini splits are what are installed in those. A lot of your tiny homes, same thing. They're more efficient than a swamp cooler. Swamp coolers are big and awkward and if you're traveling down the road, it's not going to stay there. Uh, so tiny homes, more or less on wheels, uh, aren't going to have that kind of stuff sticking up out the roof. Uh, my park model cabins, like I say, it's either a mini split or a PTAC unit, which is installed in the wall. So I kind of see the other concerns on that one, but I didn't see it to begin with. It's like, oh, okay, well, it doesn't really reflect to my park model cabinets. Mm -hmm. I but I can see it otherwise yeah. where it could. Okay. Yeah. If it's I'm, referring to an RV, it's, it seems not there. This is a, well, I think to Kevin's point, we're seeing that some of the artifacts of other places in our code are making it in without the intent behind it. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the yeah. need yeah. sounds. So right. Anywhere we can mm -hmm. be simpler without. So with two, maybe even just getting rid of that first sentence. Yeah, the awnings have to be. That's what I was thinking too. Is just right. awnings must be solar stabilized materials that could, should be sufficient on its own. Yeah, awnings and siding. <laughs> and delete number three. Okay. Oh, that's. Mm. But I, and we don't require number three for stick build houses. So right. why would we require it? We could do awnings and structures. I agree with that. Right. Instead yeah, of just that's siding. A good point. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this could, this, I don't know if we want to even, um, because they'll have to get a building permit for us. Well, for structure. certain things, not for, 
only if it's a if it's not if it's going down on a foundation, then it will have to have a, a so building permit. Exactly Otherwise, there's no building permit required. Yeah, yeah. for requiring so, a covered yeah. sink, then it could be pretty basic. Yeah. It might not take a building permit. Provide sunscreens, you know, sunshades. Yeah. They're out there. That's all solar. Yeah. Yeah. Your RV awnings are all solar. Yeah. Because they're expected to be used in the sun. So most of that's just kind of. So we've deleted everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, no charts. I might actually move that to somewhere that makes more sense up above, but we'll, I'll just leave that for now. Okay. <laughs> It would make sense to include that with the common space landscaping. Yeah. Yeah. Aesthetics and screening. Aesthetics, yeah, exactly. I can do that. I'll group it together with one of these, with that section. Um, okay, so we've covered a lot. Uh, Kevin, did you have any other specific standards that we need to revisit? Um, no, I think so. That's all. And I think Dana said she had a couple of questions or comments, I believe. That's like, right. Like and, then, Dana. and then we need to revisit the cap. Like the cap. Yep. Right. Okay. I, I, I have one more unrelated. You just said you didn't have any more. <laughs> well, <that was> good. <laughs> so, so it's actually, there, suppose someone's got an existing overnight RV park and they want to convert it into uh, like a long term RV park. Would that, is that fit in here? I, Entirely sure. I mean, that's, that's pretty much where I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I would. So does this code like make that easy, or you know, or would it somehow not? Like the application or the application, I would think that it would be. I think it would be easy. I don't think it would preclude anybody from doing that. Um, okay. And and it they would be giving up their. Their OAO Oak District for this. So and maybe that. in the future we could offer these things uh -huh. to, to make it more attractive. Yeah. For long, yeah. yeah, for long term benefits that I see is uh, if I can go from a commercial standpoint of being property tax to a residential, that's huge. And I can give that back to my tenants. If I because I'm being uh, taxed commercially, that's a heavy burden. And I'm trying to keep my rates down so workforce can afford it. When nice. you're getting into 30 plus dollars a day for a site, so rent, and that person has a loan on their RV, that gets them up 35%. Maybe even forty percent of their income, they fall right out of it. You're, you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. um, impact fees is another issue that I have to address because I am expanding. I'm hoping to get maybe ten this winter and maybe ten next summer. If I can't. I mean, I've got thirty people on waiting list any given day. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and I'll get three phone calls a week. And I'm talking about doctors to uh, MAs to city workers, uh, police, EMT, anybody, everybody, anybody that wants to work in this town, I'm getting calls because they know I'm long term. They just don't have anything for them because who I have there now, they want to stay. Like I said, I'm expanding. I'm, I'm ready to pull the plug just like he is. We're just kind of waiting to see how this is going to go through. And I'm ready to build. I actually have it scheduled to start building November 15th. I got to get my permit and that stuff done, but I'm still working on the front area of my property for because I never did design it at first. That west fence line is and was designed and ready to go. But I need to make some changes. And, like, and I'll have to get that passed in order for me to start November 15th. But 
as going, that impact, that overlay could actually help where I can keep my cost down to keep the cost down for the workforce. And that's, yeah. that's what I'm targeting at. I'm not out there to make a fortune overnight, but I'm out for the community. I've been here over 30 years and I love this place. So would the overlay effectively rezone so that property taxes would be altered? Right, so I asked about that with um, the tax assessor's office and they said that, it, yes, that it could be um, that the once the OAO is removed, that would mean that that could be taxed as a residential property if it's a residential camp park. Because since a lot of the prospective properties are highly commercial, it seems like that's a good incentive. To... Yeah, and I, I verified that even if there if it is in highway commercial, the commercial zoning district, but it's a residential use, that that portion okay. of the residential use would be taxed residential. Would get an exemption from the commercial from the rest of the property being taxed as commercial. So then, in the future, if a property owner wanted to refer to and use it for commercial use, it's not like they've given up that right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah the overlay would be removed. Yeah. They'd still have to qualify for the conditional uh, use. Right. But even if they wanted to open a donut shop, mm -hmm. yeah, it yeah. would just go back to yeah. being taxed as a commercial. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. I think we're down to like. 15 minutes. So yeah. I, I'm yeah. Okay, Dana, are you still there? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, yeah. again, my dogs are not behaving. Someone is here and I apologize. It's going to be really loud. I just had a couple quick questions just for my clarification. When you are doing the density of the units at four per half acre, is that right? Does that include an existing dwelling? Yeah. So like if somebody was at their house and, and then they wanted to have more, or does the lot coverage thing kind of cover that? The lot coverage is the, is the density requirement. Um, and a single family dwelling would uh, be included in that calculation. So okay. yeah, it would. So they may not be able to fit for more on there depending on how big their house was. Is that, am I getting that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, basically there, the, you could fit as many um, structures on the site that's a, that are allowed in this co max coverage. So 25% for large lot residential, but of course with the single family dwelling, that's only allowed, you know, one of those are allowed plus an ADU on every parcel in the County. Well, I just meant if somebody had, you know, already had a house on their property and wanted to add four, does that count? That I was, it was more just curiosity than anything else. Yeah, um, no, it, if you don't know the answer, that I mean, I get it. No, it 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 would all be calculated together. So the single family dwelling, along with the new um, alternative dwelling sites, would all be calculated within that building coverage maximum. Okay. So if their house now covered 10%, mm -hmm. then they'd have 15%. Yeah, they would have 15% left put dwelling to put alternative dwelling sites. Okay, hang on. I'm going to mute myself and kick my dogs outside. Hang on. They drop it from single family instead of four more units per unit. Yeah. Does it make sense to strike the minimum lot size if the parameters that are restricting is that? four units, you know, minimum within the, the max coverage. I just wonder if that's. Yeah, I think the minimum lot size was a little bit of a, there was definitely some discussion. Some of those lots along the, Mill Creek, I feel mm -hmm. like are probably smaller, are smaller. than an acre. Yeah. And the other comment that I had or question um, was that there, when you were talking about how big the sort of pad or area for each uh, site needed to be, there may be some sort of code or fire situation that says that they need to be X, Y, Z feet apart. So, and I would assume that there's a commercial standard for that um, somewhere that's appropriate. Because um, if you put them too close together, if one catches on fire, they all do, I guess. Um, and then 
would would the single units that are out here already would they still remain out of compliance because there aren't four of them yeah, correct yeah any any rv that's kind of just out on a property in a backyard would not be it would not be legal all of a sudden because of this um, ordinance any property owner would have to go through the two public hearings and the application to get this approved. And yes, a minimum of four sites would be required to make it a camp park. Okay, so there really isn't a way for the for the people who are living there to come into compliance. Is that, we're kind of feeling that? Well, that would be, no, I mean, essentially, no, it would be, it would mean that they would need to, if that property isn't appropriate for being an ADO and it's not approved, with four sites minimum, then those folks would be asked to probably move, relocate ultimately. Mm -hmm. And then the other one last thing, my other comment was, I think you could um, add some definitions at the beginning because I think that the word structure means to me like the thing that's over top of the outdoor sink um, or a, a toilet facility or, or a storage area um, where a dwelling is where somebody lives. So if you if your RV has a plastic awning, that's one thing. But if they put up, you know, just an easy up over the sink, that possibly isn't going to fly. Like, I think the word structure means that you don't live in it. Um, it's more of an accessory building to to the use. But because I think that is a little confusing. That's all I had. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dana. Um, the other thing that we haven't, that's on here that we haven't gotten to was um, the minimum requirement, I think it might be just that we're all in consensus that that the minimum stay would be 60 days. Um, that was suggested for the pilot program by some and but we also had other input saying that that would be a little too restrictive for some of those folks that might be coming and going as part of their seasonal work schedule and that requiring residents to commit to a 60 day minimum lease is maybe a little restrictive. One of my things with that was uh, like with the idea of like a certain company having like workforce housing. Mm -hmm. So if it was like, this is the Navtech spot, right? The Navtech, whoever they wanted. Yeah, and there. we don't need that to be concerned about like, who's coming and going. This is the yeah. tour spot. No they they could come but would they need to verify is, employment through Navtech? Because then NAPCAC tech could just be basically providing overnight accommodations. Right. Yeah. And do you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? But we can't just allow that. We can't allow that because they could be pr produce overnight accommodations and have people come in and just because every the letters. Right, right. So we, to me, you'd have to have some kind of employment. We had had that in the original language. Had we not discussed like having 60 days or verification that you're a seasonal worker? who's coming and going a lot from your employer was yeah. part of the, the, right. the, yeah. the, 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 the county. Right. So the way that this is written in our recommendation would give the county the ability to audit at any time. So if you thought that that was happening, you could ask the person who owned the, and managed the property to show proof that that was not happening. And they might put the burden then to the person who's claiming the land, but the, the uh, fine that we put in place was dramatic. So I, I don't know that, the, I think that's some, well, maybe the burden needs to be in the lease language. So if you're yeah, leasing an app tech, they can't. But that would be the um, owner's choice to put that into the lease language. Yeah, maybe completely. we should have let it be their choice. Yeah, yeah. I think where that could get in trouble is, uh, you know, I can. They, I don't like anything that all of a sudden the burden is put on uh, our code enforcer right. to once again have another. Uh, area that they have to a code enforce. I'd rather have it specific in the language so that it's 
it, but make the language so it's doable. Like you were saying 60 days. I see some people like if you're having doctors and people coming, they might be coming there for a temporary thing where they find a house they can afford and it might take 30 days to mm -hmm. 60 days. We've had people that come, come and stay in our rental for less than 60 days because they're coming into town. They get a and they want a place to land until they find a place they're going to buy. Right. And so I would, if we were going to have a time thing, I think 30 days is, is more appropriate than 60. State law states that residential is 30 days or longer. Right. And yeah, so originally we or had 30 days. Of, or a verification that they're, they're working locally. Which is number three that's been struck. Yeah. So that was at the suggestion of the attorney due to kind of uh complexity with enforcing and uh, which i kind of agree with i thought was keep a google sheet going of everybody who's in a site and if they're not turning over very frequently that's a very low burden you know at most it's someone who comes in for a week-long trip so you've got you know four guides you've got to keep track of that month right. and if the county says show us your log they send you the google sheet right. and if they can't prove it there's a ten thousand well we had a thirty thousand dollar fine you'll have to get down to ten but you know i mean that our our thought was how can we make this as easy as possible this is right. not a use where we're going to have people coming in every day or two and so the number of people who need to be kept track of you know 60 sites people staying here for a month or more that's 60 rows in a spreadsheet that, you know, when people pay their rent, you just make sure to check. I can say who this person was. I kind of agree, though, that the, the that's been my question throughout this whole thing is who is going to place this? And so unfortunate. Right. And so, and so the court, like, that's the problem. It's like, so what will end up happening is we don't have, we don't have the bandwidth to do that. So it doesn't get checked. And then all of a sudden we're into a project and it's being used as overnight accommodations because we don't have the bandwidth to go police it. It's, it's absolutely true that enforcement is an issue. Um, what the planning commission tried to do was to make this as easy as possible, you know, right. so county attorney can say, hey, Dan, send me your Google sheet. I heard some fishy stuff was going on and she gets the sheet and, you know, an hour later she can say, oh, okay, this, this person is not, there's no you know, record of this person working or, oh, I can call up NAPTEC and say, hey, I've got record of Joe Smith coming and staying for a few days and that you verified it. Is that true? And nope, that's not true. Great. That's a $10,000 fine. So that, I mean, it, it's it's true that enforcement will be an issue and it's something we need to solve, but to, to use, it's going to be very, very difficult to solve the enforcement issue in an ordinance. And I think that's the challenge and the balance we need to be mindful of. We should address the enforcement issue and then make our ordinances as strong as possible with the strongest strict sticks that we can legally carry. We're going to be facing the same challenges when we have more um, multifamily development as well, because you could make the argument that people will start renting those out as a nightly basis. So I kind of look at it as in terms of like, Overall, we don't allow nightly rentals outside of OAO districts, and we're upping our game with enforcing those through our new software that we're getting. It's going to be tracking every property and everything outside of OAO districts and um, automatically will be getting reports that program of all of the advertisement that's happening online for illegal nightly rentals if they don't have a business license then we can send a letter and they can get the fine you know so i i just see it as more of a it's going to happen it's going to keep occurring and we just have to get better at enforcing overall I mean, it's going to happen with all kinds of type all types of development just not just the uh, long-term camp parks well, if enough people get their hands slapped hopefully it'll yeah, and if it's yeah, a hard it's slide, enough people it's a hard <laughs> slide. That was, yep. If you make that penalty hurt, fine. But right. if you're just going to slap my hand with a couple hundred dollars, right. I'll do it every night. Right. But I if you're going to make it hurt, I I suggested, I was a little out, but I said make the first fine $100,000. See how many people will do that. I won't do it. I, I won't even think risk. about yeah. it. Those numbers. Yeah. But 30000 or up to 30,000, you know you could get hurt. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna do it. I, su I suggested 60 days instead of 30, based on what I'm hearing from around the county about permanent residents being rented out for 30 day timeframes mm -hmm. and vacation homes and mm -hmm. wanting to avoid that. 
But I hear oh, what Mary I see, is saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Oh, no. About and a temporary, come. people seeking temporary housing. Yeah. And we see that a lot around. That people will come in and will stay there. And we've set it up for just renting people who live in Moab, or working in Moab, and we set it up. So but similarly, yeah. like if a business or outfitter, you know, essentially leaves that spot for 60 days or more, then they could have people in transition, you know, so. As like as I, I have contractors who come in and they'll pull a trailer. They may have two or three guys that work for them for two or three weeks. That trailer sits there for months. So these guys will come in, somebody else, they'll go home, somebody else will come in, they'll go home, somebody else will come in. And I always like and require that somebody coming in to check in with me and I have them fill out a little sheet. Just so I know who they are. But it's the company one pays the bill. That yeah. Basically, leases it for yeah. Yeah. overnight rentals. So would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know it yet. Yeah, so okay. Would that be excluded from my code if it's written now? Not if they rented it for sixty days. I would. I would rather leave it at a higher number. I generally do not see a that, problem with sixty days because right. most everybody living there has been several months right so 60 days doesn't really hurt right. me it may on a few others when you have people that. who come to town to land to find housing so we've got temporary nurses we've got people who get jobs as professionals and they can't find a home to rent at first so they land for a few weeks do you have a sense of 60 days versus 30 days to support? yeah yeah it's not really a big issue okay whether it's 30 or not i just stated state law states that yeah. but 60 days not that big of a deal most of the professionals coming in are going to be signing a year to three year contracts um, a lot of the contractors are usually six to nine months uh, you see your seasonal people coming in working that's your season what, seven months eight months yeah, we have we only have a couple minutes left on this and we want to discuss the cap. Let's go to the river guard. Yeah, yeah, just you know, if a, a, a guy comes in, does he have to stay that 60 days? Um, because you know, I'll have kids coming from college, they might work for a month or two. That's all they really have. As long as you are the one leasing or yeah. responsible for that 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 spot, oh. then that's what Dan is saying is, you know, the company, the con construction company says, okay, we're gonna hold the spot for a month and then they might have some drywallers or some, you know, folks come in and work for a few weeks and they essentially manage. Well, 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 if you've got a guy yeah. or you've got some of your other people coming in and going, you've got sites okay. so the cap. So the work is the cap. Yeah, the cap. Okay, so yeah. the cap was what we were gonna finalize here. So it was, a. Um, of anywhere from 150 units to 50. And are there uh, concerns with 150? I, I, would, I would rather it, since it's a pilot program, I would rather go smaller because if it ends up a disaster, then we have not flooded. Obviously, even at 150, you're not flooding, but you know what I'm saying? You're not placing that burden on the community. And now it's like, well, if it's out there, we're not, can't take it back. And so I would rather go smaller and see how it goes, you know, and then move on from there. That's you just can my always vote to raise the cap. Sure. I, I mean, the, the, the I think 150 is a half of what was originally opposed to 300. So I like 150. How many spots would you be applying for right away, Dan? What's that? How many spots would you be applying for right away? Um, if you're going to base it on spots, or you're just going to ba base it on certain uh, overlay? Spots. Unit spot. Sites. See, I would be going 20. Right. Yes. And Brian, that your expansion. That's my expansion. The 10 on the back and the 10 on the back. Yeah, but, the, <laughs> but if he switches, would it be his total allotment? Right, not just the it's a great question too. So that's it's the whole thing, right there. Because what do you have now? I'm at 27. And if you added another 20, that'd be 47 in one project. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So we'd have three left, and the minimum thing is four. So and I think you're going to have natural attrition. Yeah. Yeah. I think one fifty is fine. I'm inclined to stay with one. I think in a year's time, everybody coming and put in on this, your applicants, you're going to find probably year, half or better not going to qualify. And we're keeping a year sunset. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that, that's that's been an idea. We've only been to 150. Because I don't feel strongly about the cap because we can always slow down and improving it. But I but I do think Trish raises a, a very good point that if we approve a bunch of these things before they even come online, then you know, and then we realize there's some changes we should have made. You know, that puts us in a difficult position. I think the same things happen with my formation detail. What's um, your what's your comfortable zone? I, I think we could, but I slowly. I just, I just think you shouldn't necessarily you know, be in a rush to hit that one. Right, right. I think another option could be to have like an application deadline and like a window, so that like, hey, if you want to be approved, kind of like know, six events. months from now, yeah. your proposal or at least an outline is due. That is in there. Look at like, yeah, it's look at them side by side and say, okay. These guys can have 40, right. these are 20. I don't like this one at all. This one, maybe. Oh, I so see. look at us. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 I'm not too worried about creating too much housing. I can devise some language that would um, look look like that. So we're talking uh, postponing to the next meeting, correct? Right. Yeah, I think that would give it because even if you were at the end of the meeting, that's a yeah. lot. Yeah, I think it's a lot. Sure. Yeah, sure. I think we need to go through and make these changes and, and get it right again. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for county commission yeah. for letting us join. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. It was great. Thanks, guys. You. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
Hey, somebody on YouTube or Zoom, somebody on Zoom, give me a mic check. Ben, can you hear us? I can. Woohoo. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're good. We're on YouTube and we're recording. Sweet. Thank you, Quinn. Uh, I'll call to order this regular session of the Grand County Commission, October 4th. Uh, present, we have uh, Commissioners Mary McGann, Trisha Dean, Evan Clapper, uh, Josie Kovash, Kevin Walker, and Sarah Stock. We also have uh, Clerk Gabe Wojtek, uh, uh, Commission Administrator Mallory Nassau, and Associate Administrator Quinn Hall. Um, all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're going to have a uh, pretty long meeting today, and I looks like there's probably quite a few citizens to be heard. So I'm going to ask everyone to keep their comments to two minutes today. And uh, uh, if you wish to be heard, I'll ask you to please come forward to the table to speak and to introduce yourself. Um, yes, Mary. Uh, there is no way to do citizens to be heard on YouTube. So if you are on YouTube, you need to move to the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And I will, uh, I guess I'll start in the room and have uh, citizens be heard in the room, then we'll, we'll move to Zoom after that. So uh, that said, um, just raise your hand if you'd like and I'll, and I'll call on you. Uh, I saw you first, so yeah, go ahead and come forward and introduce yourself. Hi, okay, except three minutes, I'm gonna do what I can here. I'm keeping track of time. Hi everyone, I'm Celia Lario and I've lived in the county for almost 16 years this time around two years uh, after college in the 90s. And I'm here about agenda item K. And I just really want to encourage you and thank you in advance for considering uh, a letter on the travel plan in support of the reasonable and rationally planned out option B as in boy. I think it's really important that you do it and that you have um, our support, know you have our support as voters for taking that, that action and that your relationship with the BLM is really important. And I know they want to hear from you. They have a really tough job, you know, the multiple use sustainable yield thing. And um, any way that we can support them, I think is important. And you're probably gonna hear from a lot of people who are voters. So I'm not gonna talk about the perspective of being in the canyon on the water, but I've been going out to Three Canyon, which is a region there um, uh, along the rim for two or three times a year for about 16 years. The before story in brief, was that people who went out there were mostly going for canyoneering and other quiet uses. People who rode out in that area rode responsibly. They rode lines and trails that were already there. They weren't interested in carving bigger roads. They weren't interested in all hours of the night driving, loud engine revving with big lights and, um, and loud music. They were going to a destination. They were traveling to go experience the wilderness and the canyon. Back then, you could canyon air in those canyons, and you didn't hear a lot of noise. Today, it's not the case out there. And there's not that many canyons left where you can go canyoneering and experience that kind of wilderness. The right use in a place like that, the rational use in a place like that, where you've got wild and scenic river designation and, and wilderness on the rim, is option B. So that folks like us can go canyoneering and experience a little bit of, of peace and quiet. And if we're dispersed camping, right, you know, in tents right off those trails, we're not getting bombarded by lots of folks just driving in and out at all hours of the day and night. So thank you in advance. I know it's hard. I know it's an election year. Um, this is the right thing. And it's what we want you to do. So thanks in advance. Thank you. Um, Mary, I realized I forgot my phone. I don't have a timekeeper. You got me. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, uh, someone else from the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Jack Hanley, um, and I'm a resident here in Moab. Um, I'm also 
also here to comment and support and thank you for your letter to Moab DLM um, item K in support of alternative B of the Labyrinth Friends Gemini Bridges Travel Management Plan. Um, I have a background working with the National Park Service, and so I understand firsthand the unique challenges of land management. Um, and for the last four years, I've been organizing and leading volunteer groups that work locally here with Moab BLM. Um, and just about every year for the past four or five years, we've been going out and doing project work within the travel management area in question. Um, and so I just want to speak from that perspective of really like what it looks like on the ground and the unique challenges of specifically managing um, travel management in that zone. Um, we've done projects on routes like the Red Wash route um, that, you know, crosses a riparian area. Um, and there's just simply no realistic way to manage use for compliance. Um, there's only so many fences that you can build over a wash until it flash floods out. And we've repeatedly seen the cutting of wire fencing, the removal of signage, uh, proliferation of, you know, so many unauthorized user created trails um, that lead to soil destruction, trail braiding. Um, and it's really just a good example of how difficult it is to manage some of these routes. And that's no fault on the BLM. I mean, like Reed and Andy and Matt, like these people are wonderful and they finally have like a full crew of rangers. Um, but even with the help of volunteer groups like ours, where we go out with 10, 15 people to do these big jobs, um, it's just not manageable. Like the routes in that area weren't designed to be managed it's until now. Um, and so I'm really excited that this is our opportunity uh, to make a good decision moving forward to protect natural resources, cultural resources, um, sensitive habitats. Um, I mean, I could go on. We've done projects out at the Train Alcove Bend um, where motorcycle use has gone around signage, um, proliferating use down to the river um, without building, you know, hundreds of feet of fencing. A few There's seconds. About it. Um, sorry, what did you say? A few seconds left. I'm sorry. Okay, so particularly, I'm excited that Alternative B specifically protects Upper Ten Mile Canyon, in which we've done projects multiple times where we're trying to remediate um, off route use that's literally driving through cultural sites, motor vehicles on top of artifacts. Um, and in a route like that that's in the riparian area, there's simply no way you can realistically manage it when it's getting flash flooded every year and people are driving around flood debris and then they're driving into alcoves on top of archaeological sites, on cultural sites. And so it's really important. Um, and I thank you for supporting Alternative B because I think it's the best option on the table. Thank you. Uh, another person from the audience? Yes, sir. Jim Farnsworth. I'm a lifetime resident here in Moab. Um, I was asked to come to the county commission on behalf of uh, myself, my mother, and some neighbors concerning draining issues, drainage issues, which I'm sure you don't want to hear about at this time <laughs> with the rain. Um, I'm writing to inform the drainage issues on uh, the property of 2130 South Shelley Lane. This property belongs to my mother, lifelong resident of Moab. She's lived at this residence since 1960. Towards the back of her property is a natural spring that flows into a pond. On the edge of her property next to Pack Creek is a sewer line, which she and her late husband graciously gave easement to Buena Vista subdivision so it could be built. Just off San Jose Road um, and Spanish Valley Drive is an old drainage ditch that used to cross the Buena Vista subdivision and drain off the hill into Pack Creek. This last year, she's been receiving water through the spring and pond and sealing it in and overflowing a bank, washing out the sewer line. It hasn't broken yet, but the next storm, it most likely will be spewing into Pack Creek. A while back, she had water come in the pond caused by a break in a water line on Spanish Valley Drive. This water doesn't and has not done this before. Investigation found that the old drain ditch had been abandoned through Buena Vista. At a certain residence, the ditch has been given a 90 degree turn, pointing it onto neighbors and through private property, making a mess for all of its, for all its new undisclosed path, in undisclosed path. I went on her behalf to the county to try to remedy this issue before larger storms came. Uh, not sure who to contact, who we were sent to the road department, planning and zoning, flood plan administrator, county compliance officer and engineer. We have met with our neighbors and we are seeking a solution. We have been assigned a case number by the, the county engineer. Uh, no action to our knowledge has been 
done to remedy the issue. Storms have come and more damage has been received. Uh, the sewer line is about to fail. And even if they do rebury the line, it will sure wash out again unless the drainage issue is, is solved. During the last storm here Sunday, um, I followed the water, noticed that some of the water coming from San Jose Road through some yards off a desert road. The bulk of this came along Spanish Valley Drive, jumping from the four-way stop from the southeast side of Spanish Trail and across the highway. Uh, the old drainage ditch that used to be used for a few neighbors is now collecting water as far as Lemon Lane. Uh, I cannot hold that much collection. A couple of things that would help is to keep water from the southeast side of Spanish Trail on the east side. There used to be a berm heaped up to help it flow into the wash, but it's been removed. Also, the water on the south side of Spanish Valley Drive could be kept on the on that side instead of crossing the San Jose Road, uh, near the culvert near San Jose Road. A portion already follows on that side of the road. A few residents would need culverts for driveways, but the water could go to Arroyo Crossings, which has a much larger capacity to discharge the water down into Pack Creek. I lament that the old drain ditch was uh, done away with without letting us downstream know about it um, and that we are now the target of being washed away. Please consider some solutions. I've written a little hand that map and uh, I'll give this statement to you guys so you can cover it further, but- um, Th Thank you very much, yeah, mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, I'll, yeah. Let me go to, uh, let me go to Zoom. I see a, there's a Patrick McKay with his hand raised on Zoom. Patrick. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Patrick McKay. I'm the Vice President of Colorado Off-Road Trail Defenders. Um, we are extremely disappointed to see the Grand County Commission once again siding with extremist environmental groups over the best interests of Grand County residents and visitors by supporting Alternative B in the Labyrinth Rooms Gemini Bridges Travel Plan. Alternative B would utterly devastate motorized recreation around Moab, closing many of the most iconic 4x4 trails in the region. The mass closure of routes it proposes is simply not justified considering that the BLM already closed 40% of motorized routes around Moab in 2008. Alternative B would close all or part of fully one third of the trails used in the 2022 Easter Jeep Safari, including Golden Spike, Gold Bar Rim, Rusty Nail, Seven Mile Rim, Hedro Canyon, Day Canyon Point, Dead Man Point, 3D, and Buttes and Towers. All of these routes have been used for Easter Jeep Safari for decades and have long been featured in published guidebooks and online trail guides. People literally travel from all over the world to drive them and they bring tremendous economic and social value to the county. If they are closed, it would likely mean the end of Easter Jeep Safari or else force it to be severely downsized. Grand County claims to want to achieve a balance between non-motorized and motorized recreation. Closing world famous Jeep trails that are one of Moab's primary attractions is not how to achieve balance. Valuing non-motorized users' recreational experiences over those of motorized users is not balanced, but simple favoritism. In past meetings, the commissioners have called motorized users selfish for wanting to keep our trails open. How is it selfish for us to not want to, or for us to want to continue using some of the most beloved four x four trails in the country? Would the commissioners call mountain bikers selfish for wanting to keep the whole enchilada trail open instead of having it closed to be turned into a wilderness area? In reality, there is already a good balance between different types of recreation around Moab. Hikers have two national parks, multiple wilderness study areas, and a new wilderness study area on the other side of Labyrinth Canyon. Mountain bikers are constantly having new trails built, yet motorized users only ever lose trails. That again is not balanced. The commission supports closing almost all roads accessing scenic overlooks of Labyrinth Canyon or along the Green River. Yet these routes provide the only way that people with disabilities can enjoy the incredible scenery around Labyrinth Canyon. Once these roads are closed, people who are unable to hike long distances will never again be able to visit areas like Dead Man Point, Hell Roaring Canyon, or Ten Mile Canyon. While the commission believes it only represents non-motorized users, the BLM is legally required to manage public lands around Moab for multiple use. This means con continuing to provide a high quality recreation experience for oh, motorized users Patrick, and please. not relegating us to the land no one else wants for their activities. Many Grand County residents strongly disagree with the commission's action today and are making their voices heard in public comments. We hope the BLM will listen to them better than their elected representatives have and choose an alternative that is actually balanced like alternative D. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I see, let me go back to Zoom to uh, Mark Horowitz has his hand raised. Thank you very much. I completely disagree with the extremists we just heard from. 
Uh, I'm also uh, action plan by uh, option B or A if there is one. That's not what I'm calling about tonight. What I'm calling about tonight is the discussion. Oh, excuse me. My name is Mark Horowitz. Um, the discussion at the workshop with regards to uh, alternative housing. I think you should put the alternative housing, 150 spaces out at Osta, Old Spanish Trail Arena. There's a huge area on the left-hand side. You could easily design a trailer court there and some small clustered uh, villages uh, at various places around the Osta site. Uh, and at a, at a good buddy deal, two or three hundred dollars a month would raise some pretty good cash from OSTA. I'd like to see that. Uh, it's like horses or work workhorses. Um, I like the idea of putting those 150 much needed spots out at OSTA, design it freaking overnight and, and put it in there and figure it out that way. And otherwise, uh, I'm gonna say is good luck to us all. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll call from someone in the audience now, uh, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Nomikoff, and I don't even really know what to say anymore after decades of saying the same thing. It's not about which group can exploit the earth more, it's about the health of the planet. And if we don't deal with that, it's not gonna be habitable much longer. So I think plan B is one way that's more protective than any other plan. And I think it's not about us. We're just a tiny part of the web of life and we need to consider the whole. And I hope that you guys do that because groups like yours all across the country are gonna help mitigate the worst impacts of climate disruption and tampering with every system on the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone else from inside here? Yes, Kent. Thank you for the time here. My name's Kent Green. I'm a lifetime, lifetime uh, resident of Moab. I just want to ask you people, uh, obviously I'm opposed to what you're doing here. Um, how many of you have been on these trails? I raise a hand, don't be shy. How many of you have been on these trails? You haven't? Okay. So you visited these trails and now you want to close them to everybody else. Isn't that a bummer? I, I just totally disagree with that. Um, we have a lot of people that are physically challenged that cannot hike or bike in that would like to enjoy their public lands too, because we have to remember, it just isn't our land, it's entire United States land. And as uh, Sarah said, you know, we need to think about the whole future. And uh, some of you are part of uh, a certain group that's uh, organization in Moab here that have been employed by them or, or thing like that. So I think they're very biased on this. Um, and I totally disagree with what you're doing here. We, I've talked to a lot of citizens in Grand County and you're not representing everybody. You're only representing the only few selected. And that really, really upsets me. We all have a say in this, but some of us don't get a say because we're not the ones that are in power here. You guys are. And, and I'm getting kind of tired of it because uh, it doesn't matter what I say, you just do what you want to do. But I do want to thank you. You guys have uh, taught me a lot. Um, I know now the tools to use upstate, and I can go to the legislation, and I can go talk to people, and we can get things done. And as you know, we have got some things done, and it's coming again. So I just want you to be aware. And I thank you for your time, but thank you for the tools for me to learn from you guys. Thank you, Ken. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, I'm Danny Kent, and I'm not going to badger you guys too hard this time because I've spent a lot of time on letters to you on this particular issue. So I really appreciate that you're doing what you're doing. It's awesome. Um, Plan B is great. It's basically what the county and I and many other people have worked on after many, many hours spent out on the trails trying to identify and manage an area that has seen incredible impact since I've been here. I've been here for 40 years. Just a quick history lesson. The roadmap was triple the size it was in 1976 when the county had to submit what their map was to the federal government because it's federal lands out here. It's not state lands. So I just can't believe that anybody would 
claim that they want to have a local source of management and they go to the state. That's what's been happening. And I'm just really proud of you guys for going with what the locals are telling you they want here and not listening to people calling in from states away that are telling, you know, alarmist, inaccurate. If people that are driving off road vehicles, and I do, I am a motorcyclist. I am so depressed at the way that my user group behaves out here. Um, if people like me were behaving responsibly and managing those trails, we would have an excellent network of motorized trails that are well cared for. For instance, like the route that is, I can't even remember the name of it, it's the Enduro route out around the Red Sand, the Red Wash area. That is a fantastic route. It is minimally invasive to wildlife and to people that are doing other uses. It's excellent. We need to manage. You guys are taking the first big step doing this since I have moved, since I moved here 40 years ago. What's happened? The need for it. I go out there now, places like Poison Spider Mesa, where I got lost when I first got here because there was no trail of any kind, in footprints. And now it's overrun by these giant monster trucks that have been modified specifically to grind over huge ledges that people can't even walk over. A few seconds, Dan. Okay, that's, that's probably enough. I just really appreciate what you're doing. And don't listen to outsiders who are telling you what the roads are like. They don't know hardly anything about it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, is there anyone on YouTube who has their hand raised? I mean, on, uh, I'm sorry, not YouTube. I misspoke on um, Zoom. If, if you do want to speak on Zoom, please raise your hand. Uh, someone else from the chambers, anyone else care to come forward and make comment? Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you very much for uh, having this chance to talk. Uh, I would like to correct one thing on an earlier comment that none of the alternatives closed all of the routes or even a majority of the routes in the Easter Jeep Safari. So at the most, any one of those would have come, um, impact the Jeep Safari is probably dropping it from, uh, you know, 100% to about low 80%. So it's, there's not really anything being closed. I forgot, did I say my name? Oh, please. I never yeah. do. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm looking at people. <laughs> uh, Wayne Hoskins, and, uh, and, and I think it's it's difficult to understand just how much noise impacts people, but also how much it impacts wildlife. And there's a lot of noise out there. And we have lost a lot of space that should have been available for creatures like Desert Bighorn, who are very sensitive to noise and they're very sensitive to movement unusual things they're not used to seeing. Lots of animals are really compromised by the way we use the land and we're losing a lot of land. You know, if we're going to be protecting enough land to have some biodiversity for the next generations, we've got to protect a lot more land and not stay where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Yes, sir, please. Hi, my name is Danielle Parker. This is my husband, Paul Marujo, and we reside at 1925 Shumway Lane. Uh, we're going forward with a plan to mitigate and manage the water that is our responsibility on the property. And we're curious, what's the county's plan to mitigate and manage the water that is their responsibility? And we're speaking mainly of the MW ponds above and the maintenance of them. And the way that the water is running down that road now due to the flood that we had on August 20th, which we've lost our home to now, and our property has been destroyed. Um, and a lot of new waterways were made. And um, so it changed the way that the water is running now down Mitch Williams. And we need, we need some mitigation done up there off of Murphy Lane. We can only do so much. And so we're just bringing it to your attention. And um, yeah. okay. thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Really quickly, yeah. can I get your contact information? Yes. And I want to say I'm sorry for your loss and the difficulty you're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Who else in the chambers would care to comment at this time? Please raise your hand. Yes, Pete. It was, it was Pete Gross. I have to confess I was debating whether I was going to comment because I don't like speaking publicly. I also am concerned about root closures. Um, I moved here 30 years ago, and I remember poison spider bicycles was just a concept at that point. So the places, the go-to places that all the bike shops recommended were poison spider mesa, um, Cane Creek up to Hurrah Pass and beyond. Uh, what am I forgetting? Gemini Bridges was very popular with advanced to beginning riders. These are now, and then Slick Rock and Sand Flats area. Now, three of those four are basically closed by default to quiet recreation. I mean, people still go out there, people still ride their mountain bikes, but basically they've been, due to the lack of management, they've been closed. So I actually think we should reopen some quiet routes um, and leads to a point where you know, as, as it gets more crowded, as we have more people coming to uh, quiet recreation just occupies less space. When you come to, you know, you're not hauling a trailer with big giant vehicles, you take up this parking space, you're still occupying hotels and you're probably eating more because you're burning a lot of calories when it's human powered. So they're, they're still buying food too. Anyway, um, I wholeheartedly support your efforts being proactive in, in, uh, what I would say is reopening some roots, but in plan B to support that. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Pete. Uh, anyone else in the chambers care to be heard at this point? And I will have a uh, last call on Zoom. Any hands raised there. Is that a thumb raised? <laughs> All right. All right, it looks like we don't have any other citizens to be heard at this point. We will have a second uh, citizens to be heard session uh, at six o'clock or as soon after six as, as we can make it. So thank you all for commenting. Um, we are up to our, we have no presentations today. So we're up to department reports. And uh, that is Sean. Looks like Sean is on Zoom today. Yeah, guys, sorry. I don't have the fancy equipment that I need to be in the chambers with this presentation stuff. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, last year, this didn't work as well. So I just had to have Chris share my screen, but um, can you hear me all right? We can, thank you. All right, let's see if I can make this work. I think go here. All right, well, that's not going to work. So, <laughs> I can share it for you, Sean. Yeah, all right. Yeah, if you want to go ahead with that, Mallory. So the slides show up in the right hand corner there. Oh yeah, there it is. That works. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm Sean Fugit. I, um, I run the maintenance department for the county. Um, we are directly responsible for cleaning and maintaining the majority of the buildings and grounds for the county. Uh, these include the courthouse, sheriff's office, Travel Council, Star Hall, EOC, and Lions Park Hub. Uh, we are also responsible for maintaining the jail and information center. Um, uh, my first slide is uh, the pay path. We also maintain the 13 miles of the pay path uh, north of town. Um, these include going up to the ground staff trailhead and the Lions Park uh, trail hub, which I already mentioned. Um, this consists of mowing both sides of the path and sweeping it 
when uh, required. Um, as you can see on the, the left hand uh, uh, picture, that's the cochia uh, comes in strong right there. <laughs> this is the this is the stretch um, up to Goose Island. Um, every year we have to mow that two and three times a year because they just get tall and out of hand. Um, I don't have an after, after picture, but that's the before there. <laughs> um, the, the rock, that didn't happen last year, but it's happened before. So that was fun. We found that I have a... one, one day. And then uh, the bottom half is every time it rains, at some point in time, um, the dirt just comes in on that path. And then we have to take the tractor down there and dig it out. So a little bit of a, what we do for the paved path. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, next slide is, uh, this, is a, this was an, uh, a multi-use room in the uh, treasurer's office. Um, we uh, ended up turning this into a, a, an office for, um, uh, for uh, payroll. So to make space for, for somebody. <laughs> and this was all, this was all in house. Um, the door was actually repurposed from uh, the old senior center. Uh, I saved it and we were holding on to it and found a use for it. So made a nice little office out of that. It is kind of a dark corner, but it'll work for now. Uh, next slide. Let's see, okay, yeah, we have um, the Grand Center uh, water heater. Uh, this died last year on us. Um, it leaked all over the place. And as you can see, we removed, um, removed the bottom half of drywall to to get it to dry out so we didn't uh, accumulate any uh, mold. And we put fans on it, let it blow out, and we helped uh, the plumbers install the, the water heater. And that's a big one too. I think it's like a 200 gallon or something like that. I might be wrong. But that's the Grand Center's water heater. This is, um, this is the jail's booking area raised floor. Uh, we, uh, it was starting to accumulate some damage. Um, so to save it, we filled in the holes and put some new floor coverings over it. Um, can't show you too much of that area cause it's kind of a secured area, but this is what I, uh, this is what I like to call if it's, if it's broke and old, don't fix it. <laughs> cause otherwise it's going to turn into a huge project. Um, the, the urinal next to the one you see on the left there decided to start leaking and it was making a mess all over the floor. Uh, and so we had to, we pulled it off, uh, to see if we could fix the wax ring in there. Well, when we, uh, put it back, it, uh, it didn't uh, go back well. So it, it broke, uh, it got broken in the process and, uh, they don't make uh, urinals like they used to. <laughs> um, the, the, the urinal on the left is the, is the height of them were way less than the new, the, the new ones. And so it, it involved, uh, raising, raising the water and cutting a hole in the wall and raising the water. So we could actually fit that in there. And that it, uh, it ended up becoming a research job for multiple, uh, plumbers in town. We couldn't find a, a urinal that would fit in that area. So. We got it done. Uh, tree trimming. Um, the the tree, the one on the left hand corner is uh, the tree out front of the uh, sheriff's office. That one slowly died on us. Um, that's uh, that's my guy Billy uh, trimming it down so we can bring it all the way down. Uh, the, the bucket truck was borrowed from Osta. Um, thank you, Osta. And then the, the big tree was the tree out, uh, out the side of Travel Council. It, um, 
decided to come down us on a on a windy day unfortunately that was a that was a big beautiful tree and it was really nice so but it decided to die on us and we ended up having to cut it up and haul it away so this is uh this is our jail box um uh, we try and take in specific tools to jail when we have a big job. Um, and uh, this was a, an idea of mine. I wasn't sure how to do it, but it worked out to uh, make sure we go in with the same tools that we come out with. Um, I made pictures, picture cards. So if we ever have an issue where a tool is missing or uh, we don't know if we took the tool in or not, we just Larry, Larry, lay everything out and um, match it up. So we maintain a secure facility and a safe facility for um, the jailers and, and my maintenance guys. Uh, next up is uh, the HVAC for the museum. Uh, this had uh, served its purpose and uh, was starting to die on us and was leaking into the ducting which caused rust on that ducting. Um, we had that ducting removed and replaced with new and then patched it back up and we installed a, had a, a new HVAC system installed using the, the, new, the newer gas. This was an old uh, R22 system, which uh, they don't manufacture anymore, uh, which is getting expensive to get. So <laughs> it, was, it was cheaper to uh, put a new one in. So, let's see. Uh, this okay, and this is um, this is one of our uh, one of the HVAC units on the courthouse that runs um, uh, the treasurer's office and UHP. Um, that decided this one decided to die on us. Um, last year, which uh, turned into an emergency purchase of a new one, unfortunately. Although I did, I, I intended to replace this one this year, but um, it had better, better ideas, so. <laughs> um, this is the Grand Center phase one, roof replacement phase one. I, uh, I broke this into two phases because I wanted to, I didn't want to have a big, big, large project on my hands um, and lots of money. I figured we'd try to break it down so it was a little easier on the taxpayers. But um, the the roof had was pretty much failing uh, and had served its purpose. It, it was 15 years old, or I think we were, we were pushing 17 years old by that time. But uh, the uh, the slide on the, or the picture on the left is a, kind of a before and the one on the right is an after. I think I actually took that today. <laughs> um, but uh, this one, this one was the worst part of the roof. Um, they were leaking into the kitchen and the main hall. Um, the one on the right, the windows, they, the wind, the sun hits the windows and then the reflects onto the, onto the membrane which uh, rots the membrane a lot quicker. It's a, I don't know how to, I don't know how we're gonna fi uh, fix that, but for now it shall be, it'll be okay for now. So, oh wow, okay. So current projects, uh, um, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, this is my, uh, my courthouse HVAC replacement program that I'm kind of doing. I'm replacing four units uh, each year for the next three years, three or four years, depending on how things turn out. Um, this has already been approved. Uh, we're just waiting on the units themselves. Um, these units are all either old and have have spent their life or um, or having problems. <laughs> Each one, the, the two big ones are um, uh, 20 years old. And the little one was, it had a manufacture date of 2000 or nine, 92. 
but I don't know if that was when it was installed. I think it was installed when the other two were installed. But, um, then um, the, Grand, the Grand Center Roof Replacement Phase 2, this is the second phase, which is pretty much complete. We'll complete that, that project for the Grand Center. Um, it has it all, an all new roof, pretty much. Um, the bottom ones, um, <laughs> sorry. Do you want me to talk more on that or should I go back? Or... Um, You're about well, at your uh, 15 minutes, Sean, if you want to wind it up here soon, we appreciate it. Oh yeah, all right, um, okay. So the bottom ones are kind of a before and the, the top ones are an after. Um, as you can see, they're kind of shiny new. So, all right, we can go to the next one. This is a kind of a thorn in my side. This is the courthouse boiler room repair and update. Uh, I've put this project out twice now uh, and no one has bid on it. So, and I've actually reached out to a few people. I haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm hoping to. Hopefully we can get these boiler rooms fixed. Generator. Um, it decided, we budgeted this to be replaced this year, but it decided to die on me. Um, we're in the process of getting emergency purchase replacement for this thing. So, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Some uh, holiday spirit for you guys. This is what we do every year uh, All right. in preparation. So this, we put lights on the, grand, the information center. Thanks to uh, travel council and the information Travel Council for providing the lights and Information Center for providing the building and the trees. So, okay, I'm done. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Sean. You're on an unsung department, but very, very necessary. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate you keeping the uh, the bike path especially clear and uh, very rideable as someone who uses it frequently. Yeah. Nice. I, I try. I try and keep on it, but sometimes it gets kind of pushed to a side. So, it happens. Yeah. Any questions for Sean? Comments? No, just thank you, Sean, for all you do. Thank you guys for all you guys do. Appreciate you and have a good have a good evening. Hopefully it's quick for you. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we have ratification of payment of bills, county bills. Uh, the amount of one million one hundred thirty-eight thousand eight hundred fifty-seven and seventy-eight cents uh, total payroll in the amount of three hundred nineteen thousand nine hundred eleven dollars and fifty-four cents for a grand total bills of payroll of one million four hundred fifty-eight thousand seven hundred sixty-nine dollars and thirty-two cents. So moved. Thanks, Trish. I have a motion by Trish and a second by Mary. Uh, any discussion on bills? All those in favor, raise your hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We're up to general reports. Uh, commission member disclosures. Does anyone on the commission have anything they would uh, like to disclose on any of the items today? Evan. In years past, I've been an event coordinator for uh, the Pride Classic, and I'm not in that role anymore, but I still have a relationship with the event coordinator. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we're on to uh, general commission reports and future considerations. And I will uh, start on the other side of the dais with Sarah. All right, um, sorry, let me pull up my notes. I attended the monthly community renewable energy program meeting, which I'll talk more about next. Um, the mosquito abatement district also had a meeting. I've said a lot about Aiden and Jim Chai. Um, I, the Moab Area Watershed Partnership meeting this month was very interesting. We talked at length about the Great Flood in August, and the we got presentations from various agencies. One thing I'd like to highlight that where there were functioning floodplains, erosional damage was minimal, like up in the creek, um, up in the canyon. So the creek is looking pretty healthy, but where floodplains were constrained, obviously debris and mud was dumped like in the city and that's a huge cost to the city. So they're, they're definitely dealing with multi-million dollar cleanup effort, as everyone knows. Um, something that came out of this meeting was that 
<clears throat> Janine, G Jean Riley, the stormwater section supervisor with the Utah Division of Water Quality was there to kind of talk about stormwater management. And while Grand County is not large enough to be regulated, like other huge cities in, in the state, there are re really great guidelines under the MS4 um, regulations for stormwater for municipalities that come with how to's and pamphlets about how for landscaping and building. And I think this would be a, a great place to look for updating our stormwater code. Um, for instance, they encourage on site retention of all rain events up to half an inch, really reducing that stormwater surge, which is part of the reason why we saw so much flooding, not the whole reason, but um, and that would capture most of our storm events on site. And it would be a code that encourages that. Um, so I don't know, I'm gonna hope to pass that contact on to one of you all, but they have a lot of good resources for updating your code, which I know we've talked about before. That's all, all I have. <laughs> all right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Kevin? Um, let's see, I've... Been, you know, this is the budget season, so there are long budget advisory board meetings on Fridays, but um, I, you know, that'll be summarized later, I'm sure. So nothing specific to report on that. Um, had a meeting with Kendall Laws from Plipco about um, labyrinth issues, interesting discussion there. Um, and I, th I think other things I might report on are on the agenda later today. So thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Josie. All right. I don't have much. I unfortunately missed um, the public health board meeting due to internet issues and Four Corners Community Behavioral Health has postponed their meeting until October 25th. Uh, Mary and I just this morning met with Utah's uh, Ind Indigent Defense Commission um, to sort of check back in with the process that we had been engaged with, but had also stalled out a little bit. And this is around using their um, Utah grant program to support uh, local efforts around ind indigent defense and public defenders offices. Um, so we were talking about how to uh, sort of make that work within Grand County a little better, whether we are still interested. They are also talking to Carbon and Emory and possibly San Juan County about what it would look like to have a coordinated multi-county effort, which might um, sort of streamline and make some of the costs make sense a little bit more too. So for future considerations, um, we would like to put on a future agenda uh, discussion for the commission to gauge whether there is still interest in pursuing um, this avenue. Great, thanks, Josie. Kevin. The end of the month is also quiet for me. Uh, there was a Sand Flats meeting, which, like Kevin was saying, is budget season, so it covered the 2022 budget as well as the 2023 proposed budget. Um, also, some discussions around the monsoon impacts and repairs, and some follow up on House Bill 180 UTV test. That's the test that would. Uh, uh, be required of all folks renting UTVs and licensing. And uh, sand, uh, a lot of the Sand Flats team has had a really close hand in that. And uh, it seems like it's going in a very good direction. It, it addresses a lot of other things, just kind of about uh, backcountry etiquette and that sort. Um, I also attended the land use meeting. Yeah. What was future that? Land. Future land use steering. Uh, <laughs> We were out at Lions Park. Yeah, there was three of them. We, uh, Trish and I attended the, the Lions Park one in the middle, and it, it seemed it was could have been more well attended, but it, it was uh, laid out nicely. So thanks to planning and zoning for, for making that happen. Some of the other ones were attended. Uh, I heard the Thompson one was very lively, uh -huh. and I did not hear about the Spanish Valley one. So. That's all I got. Great. Thanks, Evan. Trish? Um, I just had one meeting with the Southeastern Utah Association of Local Governments. I had another. I'm on the AOG's um, building. They're going to build a new office building in Price, so I'm on their building committee. So we evaluated those construction bids, and that's an interesting process um, when you talk about spending like 
$8 million. Right. I've never done that before. You know, not in my life. I went with Evan. I think the biggest takeaway from that I was talking to Elisa was this idea of like trade-offs, right? Like I was, we did a little, um, I don't know what you call that, a little exercise. And I think that to me was the most valuable, like what are, what, what are citizens willing to trade for, you know, um, and, and I think, you know, to me, a lot of people were willing to say, well, we would, we would trade density for affordable housing, right? Was to me the big takeaway from that exercise. Um, and then actually this morning, I met with the Elm Greens again via Zoom and the Division of Wildlife. Again, just kind of looking at, you know, the possibility that the division would place a conservation easement on that land for, you know, for wildlife purposes. But there's also, they actually sent their archeologist, which was great too. And obviously the archeological resources around that ranch are, are Amazing. So really interesting and lively discussion. So the division is going to send down their archaeologist and a biologist out there to do some more in-depth in look at the ranch's resources. Cool. Yeah. Good. Great. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, the 21st, the International Peace Day observance, I thought went really well for the first year. And it, the attendance was a little, I think, a little lower because of the rain. But people that came seem to enjoy it. Uh, I worked on solid waste, uh, the re how to structure the management at the Canyon Island Solid Waste Authority on the 27th and the 29th. We had an UNTRA subcommittee meeting on the 28th to discuss the future site plan and how we're going to move forward with that and our visit to D.C. The, uh, I think we're looking at the uh, last week in February, first week of March. So... You know, <laughs> I, I, I want some people to go. I, we, I need to start teaching, you know. <laughs> and then uh, we ha I had the uh, Economic Diversity uh, Act, uh, Advisory Board. It's a pretty, in, very good, well, uh, long agenda and a good agenda, but they, this year we spent $36,000 so far on economic diversification and $131,000 131, for promotional. Uh, 17 businesses as of the 28th received uh, flood mitigation grants. I think there were some more that are on the, in the pipeline. Uh, the rural county grants, which are from the governor's office of economic development, uh, uh, funded are funding the upcoming Moab housing series, bolstering the star grants, uh, gave 100,000 to support the child care uh, ecosystem. And uh, like they say, child care and assured and affordable housing are economic, you know, we need those for economic development. So that was really good. And they put 150 attendees at, had, at their summit, funded a position for a Vision of America and Vista Corps, and funded the Nexus study, which will, it's really important. It's going to let us know where we are on how much housing should be developed. So it's, we, want, we have to make, you know, we can't just keep building because we need to make sure down the pipeline than is needed, although a lot is needed now. And they uh, go in also funded uh, the unit, the uh, at, uh, Skyline Arch of Affordable Housing uh, Apartment Grant. So, you know, that's important. Of course, and Aurora Homes. So, you know, they've done a lot of work this year. Also working really hard on the economic development master plan so that we can get a path forward on how we can best spend those funds to get the most bang for our bucks. So we can take it off. On the 30th, the Budget Advisory Board, which did active transportation, justice court, IT department, planning and zoning department, and different funding grants. Uh, Josie already talked about what we had this morning. So that's good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mary. And I.
Yeah, Trish. I was just going to tell Gabe, it sounded like she said Miss America, but she said AmeriCorps. <laughs> Miss America. <laughs> I saw you look. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Verbal dyslexia. What can I say? <laughs> All right. Um, I attended a, a TSSD meeting. That's the uh, Thompson Water District. And longtime Secretary Lori Bell has resigned. She, she was awesome. So thanks, Lori. Uh, and there was a new secretary that was hired at that meeting. So she'd have a chance to um, train with Lori for at least a uh, couple of weeks before Lori left, which is great. Um, also discussed at that meeting was a meeting with the BLM about the uh, BLM spring that Thompson, uh, the TSSD is working on acquiring the water rights for. And uh, the biggest upshot from that meeting was that it's still in the cards, but it looks like they're going to have to do um, quite a few more studies on that. And it, instead of they're hoping that the spring might come online much sooner, but it looks like it's going to be at least a year out, but maybe, maybe two. So, um, so there's that. And then um, with Thompson, there was also a um, contamination of their water in one of the flash floods. Water got in from the, the creek into their tanks and they quickly applied for some emergency from, funds from the state. But the upshot was that they had to get the tank cleaned out by scuba divers. <laughs> it's kind of kind of crazy, but any anyway, uh, I am not sure if I think that I think that just happened. I'm not sure exactly what the date was, but it's, it's right around now. So hopefully that's all taken care of. Um, and they're putting the proper valves on their water releases so that that doesn't happen again. Uh, so lots of excitement out in Thompson. Um, I attended the community rebuilds uh, open house at Arroyo Crossing, which was fantastic. Uh, welcome to eight new homeowners out there that showed off their houses. They were moving in that day. So they're, so the first residents are, are in homes out there um, and beautiful homes and relatively affordable and just what a great program. Everyone was super, super pleased to be in their houses. Uh, last week, I attended uh, the monthly Chamber of Commerce meeting. Um, a couple of Chamber events were discussed. The, uh, the Fall Banquet is coming up on October 29th at Red Cliffs Lodge. So uh, there's details on the Chamber website if anyone wants to attend the Chamber Banquet. Um, also, the Christmas Parade coming up that the Chamber puts on was discussed, and there was discussion. It's, um, it's, a, it's a big undertaking for them, so there's discussion about uh, potentially in the future uh, working on partnering with the city and the county on the, on the Christmas um, tree lighting and the and the lights parade as well. Um, they also we also discussed the, uh, the the debate that the chamber is putting on on Thursday. Uh, discussed the format for that debate and who the moderators would be. Um, so that and that is happening Thursday at is it six, Mary or seven. Seven. I'm sorry. Oh. All right. What is that? It's the, the candidate debate. So it, it's going to be the, the three uh, commission races as well as the county attorney race. And they decided not to do the sheriff. Or, or the right, or the clerk or the, or the fire district. Correct. Um, uh, and future consideration, I don't know if this qualifies, but what we were supposed to approve, review and approve the uh, start grants this meeting. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of eager uh, folks out there who, who applied for the start grants. Uh, ben took sick with COVID last week and we were unable to get to that. So we are going to be looking at approving those at our next meeting, just to, to let everybody know. Um, and that's all I have. So we're on to elected official reports. Uh, looks like uh, Clerk Wojtek is our elected official in the house. Uh, Chris, Chris uh, great. Anything to report, Gabe? Um, what was, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so two things I've um, scheduled the, um, pub I've just noticed for the public logic and accuracy test that will be on 2 p.m. at 2 p.m. on October 17th. The logic ac and accuracy test is the um, open and public process whereby I test um, the tabulation and voting uh, equipment that we have here for the upcoming general election and make sure that it's um, 
it's uh, count it's it's uh, marking votes and counting votes exactly as it should um, before we get to election day. Um, and on that note, by the time that we have um, our next meeting on the 18th, that's the first day that the ballots um, can go out. And so we um, I fully expect them to be in people's mailboxes that very week. Um, somewhere in that 19, 20, 21 range is when uh, folks should expect to see their ballots hit in their mailboxes. Um, and everything is going as planned with regards to the final preparations for all that. We're definitely in the thick of it. Um, that's all I have for now. Great, thanks Gabe. And it looks like, uh, I know Chris Kaufman is on for a couple of agenda items coming up, but if, if uh, you had anything else you wanted to report, Chris? And Chris is on Zoom, it looks like probably not. Um, on to commission admin report, Mallory. Um, I don't have much to report. I think you guys will hear enough from me. Okay, <laughs> and, and Quinn? <laughs> Same way. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've attended some software implementation meetings this last week. Um, excited to get those up and running, but they're still a couple of weeks off. So we'll report back when those are up and running. Special event software and the new agenda software that we hope to roll out at that first meeting in November. So. Great, thank you. All right, we're on to approval of minutes for September 20th, our regular commission meeting. I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the minutes from uh, September 20th, 2022 for the workshop and regular meeting. Thank you. Grand County Commission. Perfect, thanks. Chair, I, I was made aware of some revi of, of, a, of one revision to the to the draft that everyone has right now. So I don't know if there could you be. You want to say what it is so we can put it in the, in the motion? Yeah, please. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Um, so in the in the commission report, um, I had quoted um, Commissioner Stock uh, referencing the Community Renewable Energy Program. Um, that there would be an election of low income plan presentations that will come to the commission this year, along with a re resolution to be presented and voted on for continued support. And Commissioner Stock clarified um, that, uh, to, that the record should reflect that the Community Renewable Energy Program County, or that with that topic, the county will have to select a low income plan and give a nod of approval for a utility agreement and a draft ordinance affirming our participation in the program to be included in our application to the Utah Public Service Commission before the year is out. All right, thanks, Gabe. Uh, the minutes reflect the correction. Great. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I'll second. Thanks, I have a motion by Mary and a second by Kevin. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor of approving the minutes, raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. Let's see, we are up to, wow, looks like we're moving forward and we're up to general business action items, discussion and consideration of approval. Um, item A, presentation and discussion on community renewable energy program. Sarah, Commissioner Stock. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, there's a lot of information and a lot of details I'm going to share with you, but um, uh, yeah. Sorry, let me start this. But I've included a lot of the details on the slides and in the memo. So I'll try not to take too much time with this. I just wanted to give a basic update on the Community Renewable Energy Program since it is a program that we've decided to join as a county and I won't be able to see it through as my term ends in December. So I wanted to share what we've been working on and there's a couple items that we're all gonna have to kind of agree to um, before December. So I just wanna go over how do we envision meeting our goal of the program? What is the program? Where are we in the process? And review those three required program elements. So just a little background. The goal of this program is to acquire net renewable, net 100% renew renewable energy from electricity by 2030. And net 100% means the amount of electricity participants use every year is offset by that same amount of renewable energy delivered to the Rocky Mountain Power Grid. 
So though we may not directly consume renewable energy resources somewhere, that renewable energy is being put into the greater power grid that we, we draw from. Um, we envision meeting the program goals through a combination of newly acquired program resources, as well as resources that are already on the Rocky Mountain Power Grid. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, who's involved? There's 18 participating communities that have signed up. Um, as the state law says it right now, no more can join at this point. Um, but we make up 25% of Rocky Mountain Power's Utah electricity sales. So it's a pretty big chunk of people striving to get 100% renewable electricity together. The agency is structured with an interlocal government body where our 18 communities have joined. We've hired outside council and energy consultants, and there's a board of directors where two board members from each community are represented. Um, only one with voting power and votes are kind of weighted under cer certain circumstances. So I, I won't go into those details, but there are three committees that the board has designated and they're working on these three elements, the program design, the low income plan and the communi communications aspect. So all of these committees are designed to help Grand County participate in this program without a lot of extra staff time and without a lot of extra resources. Program design committee is basically negotiating with Rocky Mountain Power and they're gonna coordinate the application to the Public Service Commission. Um, the low income plan committee is gonna help us decide on the low income plan that we need to select as a community and the communications committee helps with um, press releases, kind of more public facing communications. They do the website and social media. Um, here's kind of a, a diagram just saying, how are we gonna reach our goal of 100% renewable energy? Um, on the top, you'll see over time, as we get closer to 2030, ideally our program is going to bring on new resources, wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, storage, like battery storage, or just energy, energy efficiency. So that, that block is gonna grow. But you'll also see that on the bottom, Rocky Mountain Power offers in the standard energy mix, a certain amount of renewable energy. And their plan is that that renewable energy is gonna grow over time. So what we hope to do is, is basically claim our portion of that, not more than our, our 25%, but um, claim some of that renewable energy program to count towards our program goal. And we do that through, this is like a technical term, retiring bundled renewable energy certificates. So every time renewable energy power is created, it, it creates a certificate. Different people can claim that to say, I'm doing 100% renewable energy. So we would just kind of claim some of that energy that's already being produced on the standard Rocky Mountain power grid. We wouldn't necessarily, I don't think, have to like pay extra for it, but I'm not sure. Um, are there questions with that? It's so, so our program, like say I have solar panels on my house that contributes to our- You know, the, how rooftop solar is being factored into this is, kind of confusing to me. I know that it depends on the schedule that you're on. I know the 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 original like net metering schedule is 135. I have that. We won't be able to actually be a part of the program. I'm not sure why I haven't gotten that detail. But all the other the net billing schedule 136 and 137 the current renewable or current rooftop solar customers will be able to participate in the program. Um, and I think more of that, those details are gonna come out after negotiations with Rocky Mountain Power are finalized and made more public. So maybe in the utility agreement, there'll be details. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it, it'll, I don't know how to count. Yeah, Mary? Uh, two years back, we uh, purchased solar credits Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to 
get back to you about the blue sky program, but I know that if our, I think that if our program, if our community is already buying some power, like from the, what was it, subscriber solar program, I believe that would count towards our net renewable energy. What we're basically trying to do is offset all of the other energy that we're using. So the accounting, yeah, we'll make sure that we're not like double paying for renewable energy, but I think the accounting is going to get a little complicated with all the different renewable energy programs that already exist. But I think they're, they're trying to figure that out. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for those, but okay, so, oh. So once, once our program is approved, it has to be approved by the Utah Public Service Commission. And once it's ready to launch, the agency, the Community Renewable Agency, will that board will review resource bids and acquire new energy or new renewable energy resor resources that will then tap in to Rocky Mountain Power's grid. So that's a good long-term oversight for the types of projects we want to select, the type of energy we want to actually participate with, We'll always have a board member, we'll always be a part of the board that's making the decision about what resources and weighing those environmental aspects versus cost. Um, we don't have that much of a vote, so it will require on the persuasive powers of whoever's on there to make change. Um, here's a brief timeline. I'm not gonna go through the deep details of this. Basically, you can see we've already had enabling legislation. We've adopted a resolution getting us to this step, to participate in this step. And we signed the governance agreement, creating the agents in renewable energy agency. Next, we have to sign a utility agreement with Rocky Mountain Power. We have to submit our program application to the Public Service Commission. They have to give approval. And then we have to adopt our final ordinance that says we want to join this program now that we know what it looks like. And hopefully that happens next year. The, the application to the Public Service Commission is probably going in December. Um, the utility agreement, I don't have more details than I already shared with you in the memo. Um, it's basically gonna talk about how we engage with Rocky Mountain Power and what to do with termination fees. One, one big thing that we get to decide as part of legislation is we get to identify whether there are any initially initially proposed replaced assets. And this would be a coal or a gas plant that the, the program, like all the communities want to identify and say, we want to buy out early. We want to pay off our debt for this coal plant early. And so for example, like say we wanted to do this with Hunter and Huntington coal fire power plants, because they're close to us that contribute regional haze. What would that mean? It mean that we identify them as an initially replaced asset, but basically that just means that our the program would be, or the renewable energy agency, all the communities, we would accelerate the rate at which we're paying off our share of the debt for those plants. So it has a very uncertain result with a very certain price hike. So it's like, it's like paying off a 30 year mortgage in 10 years, but we're still paying it. Um, so right now the draft says that we have not identified any initially proposed replaced assets. Um, does that make sense the way I described it? I mean, it's, so it's like Rocky Mountain Power goes across six states and the debt that's held for these coal fired power plants is divvied up between those six states. So we could choose to pay off our section, which would be 40% of Hunter and Huntington debt is held by Utah and we would pay off 25% of 40% faster than everyone else. The state of Oregon is doing the same thing right now. Um, and even though they're paying off the debt faster, it's not accelerating the closure of these plants. So it's, uh, it's kind of unclear, like would it actually accelerate the closure? This is something that we could choose to discuss if any of you have uh, opinions about, or if you wanna do more research and get, get me to advocate for something before this is due, which is October 14th. Well, so what's the advantage of paying it off sooner if it's not going to slow down the production of uh, 
the pollution. It's in my mind, it's like a way of, of like, of saying that like the state of Oregon passed legislation that they can't customers can't pay for. They have to buy renewable electricity past some certain date. I'm not sure the details. So they're they're because of that legislation, they're buying out of these shared coal plants across the Rocky Mountain grid. Um, but functionally, what does that do? I'm not sure. I think because of what we're seeing happen with Oregon, this the program design committee is kind of saying like, well, it doesn't seem like it's going to accelerate the closure of these plants as much as something like implementing strong pollution controls might or doing some, some other thing like holding those coal fired power plants to a better standard might accelerate their closure. I'm not sure. Right now, I, I don't think I know enough to say that we need to identify those plants. It just, we'd pay more to be able to say that we had done it basically. I'll just keep moving. <laughs> So next, the draft model ordinance. This is what um, I've sent to you guys for review and I sent it to Christina. It's pretty basic. It, it finalizes our participation in the agreement. I would just look for red flags there. Um, it kind of explains how eligible customers were, will, inter, went to, will interact with the program, the opt out. Um, it also explains that the rates are set by the Public Service Commission, so we don't we don't really have a say in that. The Public Service Commission can change those rates in the future as well. Um, and this ordinance must be adopted within 90 days of the Public Service Commission giving approval for the, the project. But we have to have our draft ordinance in the application. That's why it's coming to us for kind of a nod of approval. Um, this basically says what I'm asking for input if you see any major emissions in that draft. Um, there's nothing in there I would I would really like highlight for debate. Just continuity with our county policies, basically, or like how we do our ordinances. Um, okay, so this is the meat of where I would like to discuss. The low income plan is an element that is required by the enabling legislation HB 411, and it requires that each community submit a plan to for low income assistance in the program application. So the committee was formed to help us come up with expertise in order to like come up with this plan. And they're gonna provide a template for us, but they've identified um, three different strategies for low income assistance. One is programmatic, so program wide, all of the communities would sign up to the same things and outreach strategies, which are like, who are we gonna, tell about the program to help us do the outreach and elective strategies, which we will just choose individually as a county to adopt. Um, I have four programmatic strategies. So it's still, oh, dang. The elective strategies, oh, never mind. Let's talk about programmatic strategies. This first one is the one I'm thinking the most about. This, so, the program, how it's designed is that everyone in our community, if we sign on, will be automatically opted in to do this net 100% renewable energy. But this is an option which would provide customers who are on monthly low income assistance through Rocky Mountain Power already or have late energy bills. It would opt them out of the program and then they would have the option to opt in. Um, and it can be done at any time. So that's one of the options we're considering. The next is the termination fee waiver. So normally when a customer decides not to be a part of the program after the initial period, they would have to pay a, probably like a $30 termination fee. That would just be waived in the case that you're receiving low income assistance already from Rocky Mountain Power. Um, the enhanced monthly bill credit is also something, a program that Rocky Mountain Power already has. If you're low income, you can qualify for like $13.95 a month in energy assistance on your bill. And this would just enhance that maybe $3 a month or something to cover anticipated program costs. Um, and a donation program, which Rocky Mountain Power also has one of these, it would be offered to all of our customers to help fund the enhanced monthly bill credit. So these are the programmatic plans 
or strategies that are being considered that all, all of the participating communities would sign on to. Um, the questions about that. Comments on these also are due on October 14th, and there's a little bit more details in the memo. So I don't know if you, you guys see any red flags with any of those, let me know. I, I feel well, like the automatic opt out might be unnecessary if there's also a termination fee waiver and an enhanced monthly bill credit. Yeah, I instance. like the combination of the, the last three. I think the one that didn't seem that useful to me was the automatic opt out, especially the other three are in play. Yeah, yeah, agreed. The last three look good. Yeah, that's my initial feeling. I'm not sure how the rest of the agency is um, leaning, but I feel inclined to advocate for that. I'd worry with the automatic opt out that we just lose customers. They would never get back in. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. As far as the enhanced monthly bill credit, if they don't get enough donations to cover that, then how is that covered? Is it just spread out over all customers? Then? Yep, it becomes a program cost. Yes. And there's, it looked like it added like cents to the average user's bill from what I saw. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very small percentage of people that are actually receiving that assistance. This is um, this is kind of an outline of the outreach strategies. So these are folks in our community, oh, not our community yet, who we might out outreach to. And um, I'll just show this for informational. So we might outreach to all of these different entities and coordinate with Moab and Castle Valley because we're all shared and try to get more information out to low-income customers, generally to our community members. Um, and then one more thing, hopefully I can open this, I would like to highlight here is just, we're gonna have to decide on, on elective strategies. And I just wanted to say that some of these options that are being thrown around are ideas like local funding for energy efficiency upgrades to low-income customers' houses. So that would be a program that Grand County would have to implement on our own, basically. Um, but that's an option. Or program coordination assistance between low-income renters and landlords. Or allocated staff time for assisting with program questions or tabling at community events. I don't know. We're basically going to have to go through pretty soon and kind of select which elective strategies we want to implement. Some of them, obviously, are bigger, heavier weights for the county. Um, but might have bigger uh, impacts. Sorry, I don't have a slide for that one. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give you all an, an update on where we are and and it's exciting. I think the application will be ready by December if we can all, all the communities can kind of give the go ahead for these three program elements. Okay. My mic, oh, almost spilled. <laughs> Uh, the airport's looking at going solar, paying for their whole, you know, so something of that nature, would that uh, move us closer to the, I mean, is that the type of things we're doing to get closer to our 100? I think that does get us closer because we'll be participating with through Blue Sky or making their own solar. Yes, I think so. I need to clarify how those programs interact. And I think that's, so part of part of this is the utility agreement is being negotiated um, with just our, our, our program design committee and Rocky Mountain Power. And so I think a lot of those details are being hashed out right there. And we should know when we get a final, final utility agreement about how each of those programs interacts. But yes, I think that gets us closer. And so in the end, we'll have to procure fewer renewable energy resources from outside of the community if, so the if more, we're doing more of that. If, so the more we can move inside Grand County towards pro providing our own 
energy through solar or whatever, the less uh, credits we have to purchase. Yeah, but you know, one thing, it's, it's like we're going to be weighing all of these things. Um, if, say, the Renewable Energy Agency is able to buy like a giant wind farm or a huge solar farm, it might end up being cheaper than all of these like individual projects. So that's just something that agency is going to be weighing, you know, like, do we support these big mega projects in Wyoming or are we trying to source more locally, smaller scale projects? But yeah, I, I mean, anything we do in the meantime and and locally will will count towards that. Uh, the, the, the question. The other question I have isn't about the program as much as um, it's a really important uh, committee you're on, in my opinion. How uh, is it, what's, because someone's going to need to take it over next year, what's, what's the time commitment, what's, uh, what are you looking at, you know, what should somebody consider if they choose to say, hi, I'll take on this? It's really not bad, and folks are welcome to start attending the meetings at any point. Um, it's once a month. There are two hours maximum meetings. It's very well organized. Um, there's a lot of staff time being put in by the Wasatch Front community, Salt Lake City and Summit County, or I guess it's not Wasatch Front, but. So there's, um, it's basically what you wanna put into it as far as extracurriculars joining the different committees, but the baseline is just two hours a month. And, um, but it is very important and it's important because it's all happening virtually all over the state and we need to bring it back to our community and get that outreach piece done and get the communications done and we'll have support for that but we need to keep the carrying the ball and elisa has joined so she's been attending the last few meetings and she's the staff person but there there needs oh, to be so a commissioner good. Oh, good, good, good. as well yeah, and but I would say it's a light lift for a heavy punch. <laughs> possible. <laughs> you always have to consider these things before yeah. you raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone Hopefully else have I a comment for down. Sarah or discussion? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again. And uh, we will move on to item B, approving ordinance establishing Grand County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and adopting Title Seven Grand County Code. And Quinn, were you taking that one? I certainly can. Okay. <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> okay, great. Um, what we're That's required to do is by the end of the year, um, it has a deadline of November of next year uh, for us to complete the item, but we do need to create it before the end of this year. Okay. What more? Do you have any questions on it? Let's see. We need a, a representative. We do need a representative, yes. Does that have to be decided now or can that wait till later? It's in the agenda somewhere that we decide now. Would, would you be able to speak to what kind of uh, commitment? Absolutely, time commitment, energy commitment. Because yeah, wouldn't it make more sense in January when we're going to be reorganizing all the assignments anyway to, right. to decide then rather than three, you know, three months are there off? there meetings between now and then? I don't believe there are any meetings between now and then, but if we assign someone even now, then whoever switch that role in January. Nominate Sarah. <laughs> that does make it quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> nothing's going to happen before January. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that, uh, is, nothing is going to happen before January, Quinn, as far as you know? As far as I know. Okay. No, I think it's, we have to get the ball rolling right now, and we have to have it statutorily created by the end of the year. Right. And then the, the, the beginning of the work is next year by November is next year. We have to have it fleshed out and be rolling with it. But to my knowledge, yeah. So we're, okay. Okay. So we're developing a council. Uh, if there's no schedule, then I'm happy to put my name on it. No schedule yet. I just feel <laughs> bad throwing around the plus. <laughs> do you want to? Uh, do you want to make that part of a motion, Evan? I would move to adopt the proposed ordinance establishing the Grand County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and adopting Title Seven of the Grand County Code, and appoint the Honorable Most Studly Evan Clapper to serve as the County Commissioner serving on the council. 
I was going to second that. But I'm like, <laughs> I'll, I'll second it. You, you look silly to me. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have a motion by Evan and a second by Kevin. Uh, do we have any more discussion on this? Actually, our uh, if the county attorney would like to weigh in. We, we are up to item B, Christina, approving the ordinance establishing uh, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and adopting we Title Seven. And, and uh, is there, there going to be any <laughs> action on the council before the new year? There doesn't have to be. Okay. <laughs> Decide if we want to get a jump start on it or not. Oh, God. <laughs> You're the guy then, huh? Okay. Perfect. Great. I any, look forward to serving. Any other discussion? I'll uh, call for a vote. All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Looks like uh, that goes unanimously. Thank you. And we are up to item C, approving ordinance to amend Article 4, special purpose overlay districts to establish an alternative dwelling overlay district pilot program. And this is what we just workshopped. I make a motion that we postpone item 12C. Second. All right. I have a motion to postpone by uh, Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Clapper. Do we need to discuss this at all? Well, it, it, just in case there's people who are curious, I mean, I think we should try to summarize what happened at the workshop and that kind of thing. Good, 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 yeah. good um, idea, Kevin. And well, I, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of, you know, constructive fine, fine tuning of the code, a lot of discussion about where these would be cited. Um, I think a lot of the public comment we received is people worried about these developments going, you know, all, all over the county and backyards and things like that. And I, I think that that has not it was not the intent and i think it's even more not the intent after after a few changes were made in the workshop so um i, I think these things are going to be you know cited carefully in, in appropriate areas um but i don't know so it was a long long workshop so i'll stop summarizing yeah no i think i think kevin got to the to the nut of it and we decided um Elisa needed some time to, to make changes in the ordinance that reflected uh, some of the decisions that we reached during the workshop. So um, things are looking good and uh, we will revisit this at our commission meeting on the 18th. So we have a motion in a second. Um, anyone else have anything to say about that? I, I'm always so when we decide to skip an agenda item, do we really need to make a motion to postpone or can we just not make a motion and move on? I think you have to make a motion to postpone right. because people are expecting it. They've looked on the agenda and so they're expecting it. Oh, I mean, we could still say something, but it's oh, not yeah, a, you can say something. I mean, just explain why we're, right. we're not going to make the motion here. It's an interesting point. Do you, would you I know? I think Robert's Christian? rules at least envisions that we postpone. Um, I, but I, I think that that keeps it, like, especially if we say until the next meeting, then it keeps right. it on the agenda. Whereas if there's just like a lack of emotion and you continue to keep bringing stuff up, then it's kind of like. Mm. Mm. Right. So we intend to pass this very quickly. I will second the motion again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, and, and we are just to repeat, which we're expecting this to come up and be voted on two weeks from now. Yes, yes. great. I did say that in my motion, but that was my intent. Great. All so right. We made, but basically, we needed to give her time to get the things typed up and reviewed, and there wasn't time. Yes. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All right, item will be postponed until October 18th, regular meeting. Um, on to item D, Arroyo Crossing Tract J, amended plat, uh, amended final plat, uh, Lisa Martin. And uh, is Lisa on Zoom? I'm going to be on Zoom. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's okay. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen with you all. Can you see the master plan there for Arroyo? We can. Okay, so just to point out where this tract is for your reference, it's down here. Um, I don't know if you can see my uh, where my mouse is, but it's uh, 
just a little bit um, west of the A, the big letter A, and it's those townhomes. There's about, um, let's see, there's eight townhomes that this would be allowing. So, um, so this is a plat amendment subdividing track J of the phase one corrected final plat located at 2047 Bonnie's Way within Arroyo Crossing. The 0.53 acre parcel will be subdivided into seven 0.06 acre lots and one 0.10 acre lot. These lots will allow for the construction of eight townhomes. Track J of Arroyo Crossing was created on October 15, 2019 via the recording of Arroyo Crossing phase one final plat and has remained vacant and not subdivided to date. The subject property fronts Bonnie's Way, a private road that is already constructed to county construction standards. No roadway improvements are required and no right of way dedication will be needed. With the exception of Tract E, uh, all engineering had been completed and approved by the county engineer for subdivision within phase one, pursuant to the phase one SIA recorded November 21st, 2019. Acceptable surety bond for the required improvements is currently being held with the county. All utility services, including GWISA, have provided will serve letters, and the plat amendment is consistent with general the general plan and the requirements of set forth in Grand County Land Use Code Section 9.8.1, plat amendments, Article 7 subdivision standards, and Article 5 lot design standards, and the project conforms with the approved PUD master plan for Arroyo Crossing. And that's all I have for that. It's a pretty... Um, it's a pretty basic plat amendment. All right, anyone have a question for Elisa or care to make a motion, Kevin? I'll make a motion. I move to approve the findings of facts set forth in the staff report dated August 17th, 2022, and the proposed resolution approving the final plat of Arroyo Crossing phase one corrected track J amended with the following conditions. conditions um, the First Amendment to Neighborhood Covenants, Restrictions, and Conditions shall be recorded simultaneously with the final plat in the real property records of Grand County. Thanks, Kevin. I'll second that. All right. A motion by Kevin and a second by Trish. Any discussions or uh, other questions for Elisa? All right. Seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And the motion passes six to nothing with Commissioner McGann absent. Uh, keep it up yeah all right we're on to item b uh, approving property tax abatements and cancellations through september 28 2022 uh, chris kaufman grand county treasurer on zoom thank you i want to make sure everyone can hear me yep well, yeah we can chris great Yes, uh, again, Chris Kaufman, Grand County Treasurer. Um, I'm presenting the approval of 2022 property tax abatements and cancellations uh, through September 28th, 2022. The total fiscal impact is around 360,000, of which around 93,000 will be reimbursed by the state, leaving a final fiscal impact of around 267,000. So in accordance with state law, each year, Grand County accepts applications for property tax relief. These include abatements uh, and exemptions. There are a number of different categories and eligibility requirements. And in your packet, I did include the property tax relief table for 2022. So if you're interested in any one of those individual programs and how people um, uh, get approved for those, you can check out that table. Uh, that table also shows which ones are mandatory for the county and which ones uh, are discretionary for us to, re to uh, approve. In addition to abatements and exemptions, every year there's also some taxes that are canceled or adjusted by the commission for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of the taxes are incorrectly assessed, others may not be effective to um, cost effective to collect, and uh, courts can also uh, order reductions um, through the appeals process. And also in your packet is a list of all of the tax cancellations that I'm presenting today. Um, and there is a reason for each of them uh, included um, in the list, but feel free to uh, ask any questions that you have about any of those. I did wanna point out that in the tax cancellation list, there are 11 uh, parcels where the uh, taxpayer applied for 
uh, an abatement or exemption, but was over the state's income limit. However, they were not over 120% of that limit. And earlier in the year, the commission passed a resolution um, stating that they would uh, consider tax relief for folks who were in that category above the state's income limit, but below 120% of that limit. And so I have included all of those um, in the cancellations uh, for your consideration tonight. And um, we did get uh, a, a number of applications uh, around the number that I expected. And the amount that is being proposed to cancel is right around the 10,000 mark, which is what um, I had told you I expected to be about the maximum for this. Um, so we did get quite a bit of people who this could help. And I think it would make a big difference uh, to them if it gets approved. Also in your packet is a graph that shows the uh, abatements, uh, the abatement amount um, after the reimbursement from the state and the cancellation amount for the last five years. And if you look at that graph, you will notice that in 2022, we are seeing a fairly significant increase in the amount of abatements. And <clears throat> I did look back at the numbers and we don't have a significantly we don't have significantly more applications. So I think the explanation for this um, is that individual applicants are receiving more of an abatement this year. And that makes sense when you consider that uh, a lot of our tax relief applicants live within the Moab City District. Uh, and it was the Moab City District's turn this year for reassessment on the assessor's five-year schedule. And uh, as everyone knows, market values have been going up a lot. Uh, Moab City hadn't been reassessed for five years. And so it was a fairly dramatic increase. For some folks, uh, they saw their market values go up double or triple. And that results in a, in a significant increase in the taxes that are owed. And when you're receiving an abatement, um, there are several different types of abatements. Uh, many applicants uh, do qualify for more than one. And one of those abatements um, is based on a percentage of your market value. So that one saw a big increase just as market values went up. We also have some folks who last year wouldn't have used the full abatement amount that they were eligible for. But this year when they owe more taxes, they are using the full amount um, that, that they can. And so I think those explain uh, the increase that we're seeing here in the abatements. It's just that people are receiving a bigger abatement because they have a bigger tax bill is, is the basic answer there. Um, and just a reminder that the fiscal impact of abatements and cancellations gets spread across all of the taxing entities, not just the county, generally in relation, in proportion to their share of overall property tax. However, uh, cancellations and abatements also uh, uh, reduce the collection rate, which has the uh, impact of raising the, uh, the tax rate for the following year. And so the taxing entities won't actually see uh, a fiscal impact over time or very little. Uh, what will happen is that all of the other taxpayers uh, in the county will see a small increase in what they pay due to the collection, the collection rate going down and the tax rate going up next year. Okay, I think, uh, I think most of you have been through this with me a time or two, but please feel free to uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, anyone have a question for Chris on this? I will make a motion. That'd be great, Trish. Um, I move to approve the 2022 property tax abatements and cancellations through, uh, sorry, September 28th, 2022 as presented. Second. All right, I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Hedin and second by Commissioner Clapper. Any other discussion on this? Kevin. Um, I just wanted to, I always feel like I learn a lot from Chris's very thorough reports yeah. on these tax issues. I, I bet in most counties, this is a pretty boring agenda item, but you know, Grand County, you know, we almost look forward to this. So thanks Chris for doing a good job of explaining all this stuff. Absolutely, and I did I did notice that the it went up significantly in 2022 and I, I Obviously, that's a bit of a obvious answer, but it didn't occur to me. So, thanks very much for explaining that. All right, um, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Passes unanimously, um, and we'll keep Chris on for the next item: approving denial of tax relief applications through September twenty eighth, twenty twenty two. Thank you. 
Um, so this is the, the downside of the, the tax relief uh, equation here. Unfortunately, uh, some applicants um, uh, are not eligible, uh, even though they apply and may be in need. Um, this year, we do have four applications um, that we received, uh, and all of them were, were over the income limit. Um, and these applications, um, uh, my office has determined, uh, should be denied uh, due to being over income. The tax commission last year recommended that uh, we bring uh, applications that are complete to the county commission for an official denial. And so we're continuing to do that this year. Um, I do want to make it clear that um, when I say they're over income, they were over the state income, the state's income limit, but they were also over that 120 percent um, limit that the county set. Uh, again, anyone who was in between those two limits would have received a cancellation, which you just approved in the in the prior um, agenda item. So these are folks who are over uh, forty two thousand nine hundred sixty eight dollars. Um, I will also mention that uh, tax relief applications are protected documents uh, and records under state law. And so therefore I haven't included them in the public packet. However, I have uh, provided them to each of the county commissioners uh, so that they can review them. And I've also numbered them one through four so that if we do need to discuss any of them, we can uh, without using any identifying information for those folks. Um, also in your packet is the tax commissions uh, standards of practice uh, for tax relief, which cover all of the eligibility uh, criteria. But again, these, are, these four are just all over income. Um, and there is one typo in my agenda item. It says uh, in the last paragraph, all five applications, but there are only four. So I apologize for that. But um, if there are any questions about uh, these applications and, and why I'm recommending to deny them, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Chris. I, I had a question about how the, um, so is the, the amount that can be canceled, is that phased in or out as you cross that income threshold? And another way of asking the question, you know, suppose my income is just below that threshold, I'm looking forward to this cancellation, and then I have the opportunity to earn an additional $10, which would put me over the threshold, would I actually end up losing money if I did that? Or yeah. Yes, you would, you would lose money. Do we, in the future, do we have the option of, you know, kind of phasing it in so there's not that discontinuity around people whose incomes are, you know, maybe just above the thresholds? So, and that's um, kind of what the 120% is, right? It's that gray area between. But, it, but it's still this paradoxical situation that some, you know, for people, you know, your, your income could raise slightly and you end up Seven, several hundred dollars poor because your income's higher. And the way you know, like income taxes work is, you know, they, they kind of, you know, that, that's why your income taxes are so complicated. There's all these formulas that kind of make it so yeah. if you earn an extra $10 it puts you over there, you lose maybe only $9 and you still come out ahead. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the ACA I had to be very careful about income as far as right. qualifying because you end up, if you make an extra hundred bucks, you could right. lose $15,000. <laughs> I think the commission could, um, you know, revisit their resolution and, and structure it in a different way. That's certainly possible. Okay, um, right. that, that's, I, so maybe sometime in the future we can do that. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting point, Kevin. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. Back to the uh, agenda item. Um, any questions for the uh, denial of tax relief? Actually, so the... Um, just following up on my question, so for applicant number one, who's the one who's closest to the limit, they earned an additional $2,200. What's the amount of the tax that might have been canceled that they were asking to have canceled? I'm just wondering if it's bigger than smaller than $2,200. So that, that, the answer to that question is going to change each year with the, with the state's uh, guidelines because we the way we created the resolution was to make the was to um, consider these folks as being eligible for the low income abatement that's sometimes referred to as the indigent abatement. And the value of that abatement is either half of the tax that you owe, or $1,110 this year, whichever of those is less. 
Um, so the maximum that person could have missed out on was $1,110, but that amount would change uh, slightly every okay. year. It usually goes up a little bit. Okay, thanks. Any other, sir? I'd make a motion. Great. I move to approve the denial of tax relief applications numbered one to four for 2022 as presented. Thank you. I'll second. All right, I have a motion by Commissioner Stock and a second by Commissioner Walker. Any discussion before we vote? Seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And that passes uh, seven to nothing. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yes. On to item G, approval of the 2022 Mob Craig and Classic Special Event Permit, uh, Angie Book. Hi, Angie. Hello, everyone. So this event is the 2022 Craig and Classic out at OSTA. Um, this isn't their first year out there. They did do um, last year at a different location due to COVID. Um, but it's a rock climbing event with clinics, expos, and camping at OSTA. It will be November 4th through the 6th. 250 participants, 200 spectators, 50 staff and volunteers. Um, and there will be rock climbing venues, which those are attached. And I believe I put those in your packet. Yes, I did. Do you have any questions on this event? Any questions for Angie? So how many people do you anticipate camping at uh, those to Angie? I would say 300, 350. Well, are they just, are they like tenting on the ball fields then? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, racetrack. Racetrack, okay. Yeah, no camping on the ball fields. Okay. Van lifers. <laughs> All right. I'll make a motion. I move to approve the 2020. I move to approve the 2022 special event permit for the Moab Crag and Classic. Thanks, Mary. A second. All right. I have a motion by Mary and a second by Josie. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Uh, all those opposed. All those abstaining. <laughs> All right. Motion passes six to nothing with Commissioner Clapper abstaining. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Um, on to item H, approving a resolution modifying the Grand County Employee Handbook on Work Policies, Work Hours, and Remote Work. Uh, Renee. Sure. Um, yes, good evening. Um, so this, we just wanted to update uh, our policy to... Um, uh, Section J allows just for some flexibility for department heads um, to staff their departments how they see fit as long as there's uh, that business hour coverage for the public service. Um, and then a schedule should be filed with the commission admin and, of course, my office. Uh, in the resolution, I need to make two just small adjustments um, as a elected official's office can, can staff how they see fit. And I don't think that comes across, across super clearly. Um, in the resolution. So under number one, um, it'll read personal services director, commission admin, and or, or applicable elected official. And then under 1B, it'll read this alternative work schedule um, will be changed to a department head's alternative work schedule um, should be filed with the personal services office. And then um, there's a new addition. Um, section X is on our remote work. And this kind of solidifies the, poly or the current practice that we have been doing um, coming out of the pandemic. And that is that we're approving a remote work request as a case-by-case -case basis. And really just if there's an extraneous circumstance for that employee um, to not be able to come into work and the expectation is that we're in the office now. Great, thanks Renee. Um, anyone have a question? Sure. I move to approve the resolution titled a resolution of Grand County Commission updating the Grand County Employee Handbook Section 10 Work Policies. 
Is that a 10 or an X? I can't tell. Um, all employees in J work hours and another X or 10 uh, remote work, effective October 5th, 2022. All right, thank you. Second. All right, motion by Commissioner Walker and second by Commissioner Kobosh. Yes, Kevin? Was it, I mean, I think, you know, ever, ever since COVID, there's been all, lots of debates about remote work and how much is appropriate and all, all these things. And I, I think they're really thorny questions. I, I don't actually have strong opinions about that, but I do think I'm, I'm inclined to just you know, to, to defer to you know, the commission administrators, what they think is best. I think, you know, we would need pretty strong reasons to second guess them on this. And I don't have you know, strong reasons. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah, and I, I appreciate the policy, the clarity. I do have a strong opinion about it. Um, I've, I've worked for the government my entire life being a school teacher, and so it was very, and the expectation is that the taxpayers are, you know, you're paid your paycheck, you need to be there, and, and people want to see when they come in, they want to see offices open and staff. Thanks, Trish. All right, anybody else? Um, a motion by Kevin and a second by Josie. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And the motion passes seven to nothing. Um, still five minutes before six o'clock comment period, so we'll move on to item I. Uh, approving demolition of structure northwest of county courthouse. And I don't have a presenter for this. This is the, the Mealage House. Okay. Is is Sean on Zoom? Would Sean care to speak to this? If Sean's not there, Chris Chris Baird is here. Great, Chris. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so we discussed this a little bit via email, and I uh, asked if anybody had any objections to going forward with the demolition of the uh, old Milich House, which is just immediately uh, north of the west entrance, that old house. Um, I don't think that the upgrades or the cost of the upgrades would be worth doing. That's right in the also the vicinity of the area that we'd want to redevelop if we were to build new office space. <clears throat> so I'm just proposing that we go ahead and, and demolish it. And I asked uh, Sean to solicit some quotes. And this was the cheapest one. I think there was one other that was about twice as expensive. Um, we did find one little piece of asbestos, but it's not friable, so we'd be able to take care of that ourselves. And ask any other or answer any other questions if you have them. Great. Any questions for Chris? I would move to award the bid to SNS Enterprises Moab, the amount of thirty-eight thousand, and authorize the chair to sign all associated documents. Second. All right. Uh, motion by Evan and a second by Mary. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All right. And that also passes uh, seven to nothing. Um, one more item before this is to be heard. Item J, approving a study of rents and fees at the airport. And uh, I don't have a, is Tammy on presenting that? Or? No, I'm going to take it. Uh, okay, that. thanks, Christine. Tammy and Tara. Um, it's been many, many years, at least five, since we've done a rent study at the airport. Um, so one more, just wait for you to see what market rents at the airport look like for our various um, commercial users but also our airport tenants with hangers out there. In addition, our old study didn't include certain unimproved lands or land side, right? So not air side, but parking lot, et cetera, which we're now starting to develop. So we have a big gap there. And the way our fee ordinance is set up is we can't charge rent for these unimproved areas that we don't have a rent study for that's also not in the fee ordinance. So we need to establish a basis for determining these rents. Um, we are, the proposal is that Armstrong would manage this. And so Armstrong, of course, is our consultant of record at the airport. Um, they have reached out to uh, an, a group 
that does this all over the West. I actually have seen a couple of the RIT studies that the consultant have done for other airports um, across the West. Tahoe is for sure one of them I can remember. Um, it's $16,000. One tricky thing is that we don't exactly have a budget for that. Chris should weigh in here. Um, I believe that airport management thinks that we can use certain unused grant funds for this. And I think Chris and I are not so sure. Chris, I don't know if you have a more firm um, opinion on that. So we might, the sticky bit here is coming up with where we, where we find the money. Although I do think the money will quickly return itself and increase rents at the airport going forward. Chris, do you want to weigh in on the budget part? Oh uh, yeah, thanks. So I think that at this point, we're just going to have to say that it's coming out of the commission's discretionary account, which is still have quite a bit left. Um, if we can, you know, use a grant, which I am a little bit skeptical of, um, then we would use that instead. But I think, you know, the backup is going to have to be the commission's discretionary fund. Is that fund twenty five thousand? I can't remember. It's uh, we we budgeted quite a bit, um, one hundred twenty seven thousand total, and a lot of that was um, possibility of of uh, even do, drilling a water monitoring well, and some other costs associated with water stuff that I think we probably won't um, expend this year, maybe next year. So I think we do have the money in the discretionary fund for it. Okay, and you'd be fine with uh, using that those funds to fund this, Chris. Yes. I am coming next week with a proposal for spending some of them, but not. Yeah, I think, you know, the the water component was around 70 or 80,000. And so um, I don't know how much you're coming uh, with, Sarah. But uh, I mean, I agree with Christina. I think this will pay for itself. Um, and so I, I just you know think that we're safe to move forward with the commission's discretionary account at this point even if we use it for other things as well. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, Mary. I move to approve the study of rents and fees at the airport to be performed by Aviation Management Consulting Group for $16,850. Thank you. I'll second that. All right, I have a motion by Mary and a second by Trish. Any further discussion? I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And it passes seven to nothing. Uh, it is just after six o'clock. So we are up to our second uh, citizens to be heard session. Is there anyone in the chambers here who would like to come forward and make a comment? Uh, yes, sir, please. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Lauren Campbell. I'm a resident of Virgin, Utah. And I've been coming to Moab for many years. I'm a board member of the Utah Public Lands Alliance, a sustaining member of the Blue Ribbon Coalition, and here is a visitor with over 70 of my friends, families, that are here visiting to wheel in this area. They're mem all members of the Family Motor Coach Association. I used to hike, backpack, rock climb extensively when I was younger. Can't do that anymore. Not fit for it. So there's no way I can enjoy this beautiful countryside without the use of motorized vehicles. I'm shocked that the County Commission would draft such a scathing endorsement of Alternative B for the Travel Management Plan. The 2008 Travel Management Plan was approved. Motorized vehicle traffic was reduced by 700 miles. You add to that the 437 miles in Alternative B, that's 1137 miles. That's a 72% reduction from what existed in 2007 leaving only 600 miles left. Roads being eliminated in this plan affect many iconic and world known trails, such as Gemini Bridges, Seven Mile Rim, Golden Spike, Gold Bar Rim, Mashed Potatoes, 3D Pennington Canyon. In addition, many spurs that people want to go out and see the beautiful views from the edge of a rim are being shut. This is gonna cause other problems with the other trails that are left open because it's gonna increase traffic on those trails and it's gonna increase the potential for use or conflict. I support responsible recreation. I've done lots of work. I've spent weeks of trail maintenance over my life. 
but proper management does not mean closing trails. One of the treasures that everyone in Utah values are the bighorn sheep. Doesn't mean that to protect them in the lambing season, you, you can use seasonal closures to protect that. You don't have to do it as a forever closure. Repairing concern in many areas can be done by better signage. I noticed today when I was on fins and things, the signs out there are great because they really show you why resource management is important. They explain it. BLM has done a lousy job of that. They just put up closure signs. Well, you point out that alternative B would close most routes along the Green River of Mineral, Fell Roaring, and Ten Mile Canyons because they're the most important and popular for non-motorized recreation. They are also the same important and popular for motorized recreation. And those same priorities particularly apply when you have an aging population in the United States that is growing, the fastest growing part of that population is over 65 years old. We can't get out like we used to. So you're denying us the ability to recreate in those, in those areas. It seems not only irresponsible, but it seems discriminatory to discriminate against elderly people or people with disabilities. And as I drive up and down the 191 today, I see so many of the same businesses that cater to the off-road community, hotels, restaurants, all the business repair shops, they all cater to the off-road community. And, you know, I noticed from the 2020 Grand County Economic Report that the biggest employer in Grand County is the travel and leisure industry. I also noticed that you lost 21% of your employees from the year 2018 to 2020. 2021, 2022, I could not find any reference on updated statistics. That's a big drop, 21%. I'm here this week with 150 friends that come every year with their RVs and their Jeeps, and they spend money in this town. Our RV sites are almost $100 a night. Add to that the food, all the other expenses that we spend, we'll easily all spend $2,500 for our 10-day stay here. Now, if you do the simple math, that would equate to $375,000 in this 10-day stay. I ask you the question to consider before you endorse this proposal. How much do you think those non-motorized visitors spend when they're hiking Mineral Canyon? I urge you to support the more balanced alternative C of the TMP. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, anybody else in the chambers who'd like to come forward and make a comment? Yes. Hi there. My name is Sam Van Wetter. Um, I'm really excited about uh, agenda item K on tonight's agenda. Um, I, I really appreciate you all using your platform and your position as a stakeholder in this uh, decision-making process to advocate for uh, B, obviously with some concessions, which I think are warranted. Um, I've been working with some uh, a consortium of river guides and permit holders in the Labyrinth Canyon area. Um, and they uh, are supportive of B, uh, a, a group of them are supportive of alternative B. Um, there are some real world uh, uh, considerations to be made. Uh, as you might know, uh, Mineral Bottom Road washed out a couple nights ago uh, in the big rainstorm. And I think we have to have some pragmatic planning about access to the river. Uh, they, the, many of these folks have signed a letter that asks for Hey Joe Canyon to remain open for emergency use. I think that's a perfectly appropriate use of, of these routes. Administrative use is a good use um, of some of these routes. But as you well know, uh, this was never planned as a recreation area. These were these were mining roads. These were seismic testing roads, uh, and it doesn't. It's not commensurate to the capacity of, of visitation here today. Um, places like Fins and Things, Sand Flats Recreation Area, which is a world-class recreation area. It's a really good partnership between the county and the BLM. Um, that's that's an excellent spot. And, and as we've heard, it's, it's well signed and it's well managed. Uh, when you're getting further out into the wilderness, uh, that's, that's when we have to be more careful. More than 80% of these routes, uh, sorry, uh, more than 80% of this travel management area 
area is within half a mile of a route. So I think the argument that we're closing off access is inaccurate. Um, there, there's many ways to get within half mile to every point um, in this travel management area. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to speak and I hope you pass this letter. Thank you. Uh, anybody else in the chambers who would care to comment? On Zoom, do we have anybody uh, who would like to make a comment? Okay, it looks like not. So we'll move on to our next agenda item, which happens to be item K, uh, labyrinth rims, Gemini bridges, uh, travel management, <laughs> travel management comment letter. And Commissioner Walker is presenting this one. Um, okay, so we have discussed this issue, I think, at least two other times, maybe three, as, as we've worked through the NEPA process. We wrote a, an initial scoping letter, some other letters about you know, the range of alternatives the BLM was offering. Um, so this is probably the last time it will come before us. Um, so I, did, I can't decide what... Yeah, so, so maybe um, I should give the rationale behind the proposed letter. That's okay. Um, yeah, I often say that you know, public lands issues are very con contentious in Grand County because you know there's so many of us trying to enjoy public lands in various ways that are not always compatible in exactly the same place. But the good news is I think there is something we all agree on and that's that we should have a balanced plan. The, um, the difficulty is we don't agree on what constitutes a balanced plan. And, um, you know, that's, it's, you know, it's, it's not a super cut and dried issue. It, it's, it's hard to get people to agree to that. Um, but I do think the approach we've taken in the letter is, I think it's pretty solid and defensible. Um, we look at, you know, using BLM numbers that the BLM complied, compiled on um, what percentage of this area is, is close to a, a road or motorized trail um, in the, and alternatives um, B and C, C and D, excuse me, alternatives C and D is over 90%, um, is, is, it, is it with it within half a mile. Um, alternative B, it's 78%, which is still a large number, but not as large as the others. And I, I think it's, that is one, one of the reasons that I, I do think that alternative B and what we're proposing does seem balanced to me. Um, I think, you know, there is kind of a fundamental fact that there's more and more people trying to use the backcountry. And if there, if we could wind the clock back to the 1990s or 1980s, you know, we probably wouldn't really need a big tra travel plan revision because there wouldn't be those many people on the, on the trails. I, I think a few public comments at four o'clock referred to this. I know, you know, personally, my favorite running places back in the 90s are Poison Spider Mesa and Amasabak. You know, those are great loop runs there. Um, yes, they were used by Jeeps, but, you know, we didn't usually bump into each other. I think these days, you know, you'd have to be choose your time very carefully to have a similar experience. And, that, and that's repeated all over the area. And so the point is that as the trails become more crowded, we need to do more segregation of uses. And that's, that's what we're advocating. So um, public lands is a big issue that we care a lot about in Grand County. So I could go on for a long, long time, but I won't. I will um, stop there. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, Sarah. I'd make a motion. Okay. I'd move to approve the attached letter, comment letter for the Labyrinth Rims and Gemini Bridges Travel Management or TMA Draft Environmental Assessment. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion by Commissioner Stock. Second? I will second. All right. Thanks, Josie. Uh, discussion. Um, um, I do appreciate all of the feedback that we've gotten both for and against you know various iterations of this plan i'll come about it from my kind of love or, or or my passion which is wildlife i have a huge concern for wildlife and i do think and i i look at the lasalles and and i think about these little pockets of refuge in the lasalles that these animals have and it's not much and so when I think about oh, specifically bighorns, um, desert bighorns, they are just on the edge. They are just, they're just on the edge. And so any kind of 
assistance we can give them, I think we need to give them that assistance. And I kind of backtrack real quick. Next week's my family elk hunting trip to Elk Ridge. And they, they've done a couple minor closures. I mean, and I, when I say minor, I'm talking about roads that are 400 yards long. And with those closures, I mean, the animals have just filled, I mean, it's just crazy the amount of animals that just come into those areas where they don't have to deal with vehicles. And I'm a hunter and I drive a vehicle to get there and I recognize that, but we need to give refuge for, specifically in my, my case, wildlife. But um, so that, that's just my, my, my shtick. Thanks, Trish. Yeah, Mary? I'll follow on Trish. Thank you, you said that so eloquently. I just, uh, I'm concerned about the wildlife and I also grew up in Moab. And we traveled all the time in the backcountry. It was one of my favorite things to do. We did it every weekend. We spent many times out camping, dispersed camping, because there were no other types of camping. And it was uh, a joy. And we could go out and camp and stay four days and not see another person, not see anyone. It was a different time. You didn't have to worry about you know, management, the wildlife was, we're not being pushed off in any place. Things have changed. I, you know, I don't even go on some of those routes I went as a child because I just want to, you know, it's eating dust or the noise is really large. And so it's a different time. It's a different time. And, and for balance, you know, a lot of the machines carry the noise travels far, especially in this hard rock, you know, and for balance and recreation, I think we need to have more areas that are further from roads in order to do that. And the other thing I wanted to mention to, uh, on Trish's is that in the east side and the west side of, uh, I had got this, the sheep population estimate from both the east and west sides of the river are only 72% of what the Department of Wildlife and Resources want, only 72%. Uh, on the east side, there are mess, uh, estimated only 160 sheep. That area could manage 300. That's close to half, half. And on the west side, uh, estimated 200, they're doing better. They have 190. So that's doing uh, better than the east side for sure. So, and that's our side. <laughs> so, you know, I sympathize and I understand the frustration of any time you lose something, it feels like, it, you know, it's been taken away and you, you want to cling to it. So I understand the frustration and the anger of people who do not support me. But as a person who's grown up in this area and a person who's passionate about the back country and wildlife, I think we need to look at protection on many, many levels and balance. And uh, B is the one that provides the most balance. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'll, I'll comment. First, I wanted to say that uh, I, I am on the trail mix and the motorized trail committee um, committees, and both of those committees had a chance to comment on this. Um, we discussed it at the previous meetings. Trail mix submitted a, a letter that was in our documents. Um, the motorized trails committee wasn't able to get the letter in in time, but but Cliff, the chair of that committee, did submit the letter today. So I'd, I'd ask that be part of the uh, public or part of the part of the record. Um, I think is is fair. And they did they the trail the MTC um, liked option A or possibly D as a compromise option. So I'll just put that out there. Um, I, uh, I I I support the letter. Um, I do have some heartburn about. Um, Limiting limiting recreation. I've I've heard from some very close friends in the last week who are who are motorized enthusiasts um, about their uh, displeasure with with some of the closures, and I very much get it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'll ju I'll just say that I I, I definitely uh, empathize there. Um, what we did get a lot of comments about 
about our uh, exception to gold bar, um, there's quite a few uh, letters that were written in that, that thinks that we shouldn't have included the um, exception for gold bar in our letter. But, uh, but I support that. I think gold bar is a, is a, um, is a viable Jeep trail. And uh, uh, anyway, that's enough on that. Uh, and I think that's it for my comments. I would also echo some of that. Um, I don't love option B. Um, I think another thing besides gold bars also uh, motorized single track. And I think that the thing with a lot of the single track options around the white wash is, is that it is difficult to manage. And, um, and the areas that do go down to the river that aren't necessarily designated. And I, and I hope that the BLM will consider creating new single track options out there. And with that in mind, like this isn't final, this is uh, just uh, an option to begin working and planning around. And I hope that this is just the first step in actually creating um, more recreational opportunities like what we've seen in Sand Flats where things are created with a, a goal in mind and, and done in a in a well manner so i don't love it but um like i said it's not final and uh um i for my own selfish reasons also hate to give up access but it's undeniable the amount of volumes and the change in volumes that we've not just seen uh over long periods but even very recently in very short times that volumes change so Although it's not ideal, in my mind, it is the, the best option and a place to start a planning process from. So I support the letter. Thanks, Evan. All right, anyone else care to comment before we vote? All right, I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Stock and a second by Commissioner Kovash. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All right, motion passes unanimously. Uh, on to item L, adopting ordinance repealing and replacing chapter 8.16, special events of the Grand County General Ordinances and related ordinance number 658. Mallory. Great, another fun conversation. Um, so after the workshop and discussion at the last meeting, um, we worked to kind of update it and integrate some things. And I, Yes, there is a lot in place or, that we've been working on. And I'm quite, I don't know, I'm very tired. I don't know where to start, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but in the recent version, I just updated the packet on the website um, and the changes in that ordinance. There are some, some modifications, but I would say for the most part, it still aligns with the process that we went over last time. And so perhaps the best place uh, to start is actually getting into the ordinance. Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I think some kind of overview might might be helpful because not everyone's immersed in this like, like you are and some of, uh, the rest of us sort of are. Um, and I could try to do that if you're feeling tired, but you know, you probably know it better than I do. So no, I can I can do it. So one thing in the workshop that came up was what I was using as this, what the commission under ordinance 658 is using to trigger when the applications come to you all. I was just calling them commission approval and then everything else was everything else. <laughs> um, so we cleared up that language. So it's now high impact and low impact, which I, I think was actually a, a takeaway from the conversation. So as it is set up now, and this is a very draft document, um, <coughs> that the applicant will submit the intent to apply and what that will do right away is have trigger the special event advisory committee to do a quick review of it and to determine um, which impact tier it is. And that's something we can get into um, 
with the ordinance and with a list of characteristics we have. But if it's determined to be high impact, it will come to you all at a quarterly review meeting, um, which is something we did discuss at the last meeting and everybody seemed comfortable with that. We do have a draft calendar or a proposed calendar for what those review dates would be and the intent to apply deadlines for high impact. Um, going back, if you aren't deemed high impact and you're deemed low impact, then uh, the special event advisory committee will do that review. And a big thing for applicants and everyone to know is that nobody will be able to proceed with the complete application until their intent to apply has been reviewed. So it's really just splitting it off um, where the in, intent to apply hits the special event committee and then from their determination, um, high impact goes one route to you all, low impact goes to the special event advisory committee. But after assuming you all approve an intent to apply, it goes back on track with the special event advisory committee process. Um, so that's just the one diversion, if you will. So I somewhat tried to summarize that, but maybe the best place to start for the ordinance at least is with characteristics. And this is a little challenging to read because there's a bunch of blank sections um, and this was talked into the draft ordinance. But I think the big thing to note is we wanted to make sure that some of these characteristics, low impact characteristics, in combination with um, you know county ordinances, laws, are considered when we're determining what's high and what's low. So there are exceptions that are in here, a little lower for if you are a local sponsor and you've had an event for five or more years, even if you would hit the high impact um, determination, we can in writing say you actually can proceed as a low impact. And that's a very similar to what we have right now with the pre-authorized streamlined. I remember we changed that word in a little bit. Um, so <laughs> that being said, if you haven't had a chance and you want to look at characteristics, I believe I put So, so, I'm not so sure. I, I was just going to interject quickly. So we, we have like two different in, in the, the ordinance draft right now. There's two important cutoffs. One is what even needs a special event permit, and there's a list there. And then and then there's you know the high impact versus low impact distinction. Um, and the high impact events they their intent to apply comes to the commission, and we also you know, we have a limited capacity for those. So those in some sense, you know, competing against each other. Yes, absolutely. And that's the intent of the quarterly review so that you all can see for a chunk of time, everything that is being proposed instead of a final mm -hmm. approval right before the event happens, or even, um, you know, a piecemeal one where you're getting an intent to apply for something six months out while also looking at one one month out. It just helps with that um, larger, larger view of what is being proposed. And, and, and I guess the, the cutoffs for, you know, between, you know, enough, no special event versus low impact special event versus high impact, those are still being fine tuned. And that's maybe something the commission should think about and, and weigh in on. Yes, um, and personally, what I feel that we have sorted out enough is the quarterly reviews in terms of what goes to the commission, more or less. <laughs> um, when those reviews are held, 
the schedule of those reviews, and then also tying in the special event coordinator. But I'm, I'm not sure how everybody feels looking at the characteristics or other things that we've been sending along. It's a lot. Just to clarify that, that a little bit, low impact event has criteria that's set out and a high impact event is everything else, right? Yes, so if you're not deemed low impact, you're automatically moved to high. Okay. And what about the no special event? That's defined, and we need to discuss that a little bit more tonight. Maybe before we pass it. I don't know if now's that time. I think you should keep going. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. So I attempted, it's not very pretty, but put together just a one pager <clears throat> of the tables that are in the draft ordinance right now that just break out who the approval authority is based on the impact. So people know along the way Okay, the special event advisory committee will approve everything except high impact intent to applies. Um, and then below is the deadlines, which are also broken out by high and low. So it really just as soon as it makes that determination, high or low, they go into two different paths, but high comes back in pretty quickly once you guys sign off on it. But it is important that we have the calendar for the reviews, uh, just to make sure that we're kicking it off whenever it is implemented. So you guys have those quarter breakouts to look at everything. So it's a lot. In my head, it all makes sense. Um, and I do think once we have the process a same platform in place, it will make a lot more sense than me trying to explain it. And today I think it's best to maybe shift to the exceptions and the criteria. Just real quick, um, the just on this table, I think if this is included in the code and it's what people are going to be looking at to try to figure out when to apply, I think that under table two, when it says the ITA submission deadline, it says first Monday of the month for high impact, but it refers to the first Monday of the month of the relevant quarter, something. So I would just, I would refer people in that section just so that we're not receiving a bunch of last minute applications. But it says that it clarifies in the ITA review date box, but yes, no, but it is a messy. I mean, it makes sense to me after like kind of scanning <laughs> back and forth, but it's like a word problem. <laughs> it's the first Monday of the quarter. Or So another thing you, you haven't mentioned yet, Mallory, is whether we want to try to pass this now, <laughs> knowing that we might need to make you know a lot of relatively small revisions pretty soon, or do we want to you know put it off two weeks? Um, and if we do put it off, do we want to give some kind of direction to staff saying that you know we we're going to start using this new system even though it isn't quite nailed down yet? Um, so and I think. Either of those would be fine. There definitely would be more revisions to come specific to the ordinance. But I also think the current ordinance gives that ability to direct us and to start doing um, the pieces of this that would then be fine tuned when the draft ordinance comes back to you. Yeah. Does that answer it? Yeah. I probably recommend two more weeks. 
I think there are enough little tweaks that's going to be a little bit overwhelming to try to um, capture all tonight. And none of them are most substantive. And I know Mallory wants to be put out of her misery. <laughs> um, but I, I have, you know, I, I, I want to see some tweaks to the definitions and a few other things. And I want to talk very specifically about, you know, whether we're this SRP issue, Cliff Coons not where he's on, but he, um, we went back and forth with him today and some good questions he had about the sort of S BLM SRP thresholds. And I want to talk through that. And so I'd like to get feedback from the commission about where y'all want to see us take that. And, um, you know, I don't think we can drop all that right now. Uh, so, so could I, I mean, so here, the big issues I, I think that you know, we might want to discuss right now, um, some, maybe some of them aren't that big. You know, so one is what, what requires a special event permit, I, and that's Christina was just referring to one aspect of that. Another is the cutoff between you know, what, what counts as a low impact event, which would you know, never come before the commission typically. Um, two more, and now I'm forgetting. Um, Those are my main two things. I, I, I guess another another one is this idea of of, of capacity or limits. Um, we you know there's in, been discussion about various approaches to that, um, like saturation. You know, yeah, like what when are things saturated and we shouldn't approve any more large this would just apply to the high in, high impact events. Um, and and I think a, a few different approaches have been dis discussed. Um, and well, if I think of the fourth one, I'll I'll speak up. Sorry. Uh, the other thing that I thought of that you all might want to consider tonight as part of what's in the current ordinance and giving staff direction is modifying the intent to apply. It seemed like there was a lot of uh, agreement in having the noise impact mitigation plan, the residential neighborhood impact plan, the event narrative, which is already part of the intent to apply, and then also an optional community benefit uh, little narrative. So I think adding those into the intent to apply would be helpful, uh, just because it wouldn't require any change right now, but it would allow you all to see um, what efforts or planning the applicant is doing to be mindful of the county, the philosophy, um, ordinances, and kind of give them that voice to, to try and self-address or to recognize any challenges and how they would want to tackle them. So you're saying um, per the ITA application language that's in here, we, we, we get the blessing of the commission to go ahead and make those changes and start forcing them. Mm -hmm. And I also think the quarterly reviews would be ideal to start doing. And actually, there is enough in the ordinance to, to make that change right now. I think for some people, if we went with the quarterly review and the first round came to you guys um, it would actually be under the deadline for some people of what is required right now. And then another thing along those lines that was discussed at the last meeting is what to do with the events that would have then missed the review deadline. And I think the, the outcome was the idea of going with, hey, you're going to be moved into this one. So even though your quarter has passed, since this is new, you have to be reviewed at the 18th, and we won't say you missed the deadline. Does that make zero sense? <laughs> made, made sense to me. So, so in other words, I did, during this transition into the new system, we're going to be a little flexible about deadlines, yeah. just so people who are caught in that interim period you know, don't, aren't treated unfairly. So. And, yes. and we'll also be basically and stating this new program immediately, even if we don't pass the ordinance. Yes. <laughs> and we'd be reviewing next spring's events at our next meeting this month. Yes, and because the deadline was missed 
For implementation, you would be also reviewing the January, February, and March events, which are very minimal. And staff's already doing this. Staff's already put people on notice. Staff's already sent out a revised ITA. And I know Angie got back immediately within the same day, you know, many of these for the spring, because they've been doing this for a while now. So um, I, you know, it shouldn't be an issue, especially with flexibility, but. What's that? The narrative part, was it on most of those ideas? The beneficial impact uh, come, come up. Yeah, yeah do you want to? Angie, you come. <laughs> The narrative part was added after those ITAs were set out. So we might not see those, but those are simple questions that I think we could answer or I could get those answers if that's what you want. There's other plans in here too. Did you get that like noise impact mitigation plan, residential right. neighborhood? Those questions were after the... Okay, yeah. all, all those plans. Okay, got it. It, it does. It, it's a bigger ITA, but not not the one that's in this ordinance. That one was just created last week. It does seem ordinance. like a lot to me in an intent to apply to require something called a plan for noise mitigation or anything like that. Maybe it, I mean, I don't know, unless everyone feels like they want to demand that right off the bat, but perhaps it could be like, give the narrative and describe how you will address some of the big concerns or impacts or something like, I don't know. It's an intent to apply and it's required like way before the event. So, so I guess the tension and the intent to apply is we, we want, need enough information to make a decision about the event, but we don't want people to invest a huge amount of time if they're going to be turned down. Right. Yes. And um, right now there is an area um, in the ordinance, the current one, they do need to have the narrative just up what the event is, something very simple. So if we don't want to do a plan at wording right now, or maybe not at all in the future, we could look at just breaking that out. So it says event narrative, and then saying, you know, suggested content is also addressing these things. I mean, I'm also willing to defer to y'all who have been working and thinking and dealing with these people. Like, if it seems reasonable to request a plan at that early of a stage. I think it's sufficient to include it in the narrative, but we need to let the applicants know what we want to see in the narrative. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we could do that in the application, which you guys are going to adopt a bunch of policy documents later. Yeah. Not in the, so, I mean, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm in agreement that I think a, a plan is a little bit much at this stage, but that the, the general intention of having a plan should be in the intent, and that seems to be a narrative uh, more than a plan. And with the intent to apply, uh, regardless of who reviews and has the approval authority, there is the built-in term of hey, anybody could request more information or um, add conditions. So that would have the flexibility for the committee or for all of you to say, wait, we want this plan. We want you to formally address this before we process an application. Angie, the ITA list includes a list of initial vendors, which would be uh, formalized three days before the event is how it's in there. But how do you feel about getting folks getting a list of vendors that are I think three days before is fairly early. I think Jeep Safari is probably going to be the only hard one. There are 300 plus vendors. Um, they're pulling out the day before and then some are coming in the day. I think that might be the only one that will be a little tricky. Well, and the ITA is asking for a list of initial vendors. And so is that useless to have six months in advance because oh, the yeah. vendors are changing so much oh, yeah. that we shouldn't yeah, bother? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like the PGP, for example, all their food vendors pulled out the week before the event. Could we ask for vendor type? So if they can mm -hmm. say, I guess that would kind of be well, are you event. serving food? Are you selling stuff? I mean, we have to allow our referral agencies enough time that if an issue, which has come up before, mm -hmm. that we have sufficient time for the event. So, And I think just having that special event coordinator, you're going to have that one person that's in contact. I think that communication is going to be there just like with that one issue. As soon as I found out about it, I was able to get it out and we were able to get on top of it. 
Um, I think we're going to be able to mitigate that problem, but vendors are hard. Okay, so that would be that we would go ahead and start enforcing the ITA requirements, except for the three plans that are mentioned here in the list of vendors. So we would take that out now and bring those ITAs to the commission next meeting. Yes, so ones that would. That's schedule. what I was hoping we would do. And so do we need to approve the ordinance tonight in order to do that and then no. amend it later or no you can give stuff i mean you can create policy orally y'all have done that for a year it's just not going anywhere so you know um, <laughs> right but <laughs> some things haven't gone according to plan um so no well, you can direct staff to make this change now and then we're going to formalize it we'll ratify it in the uh, ordinance next meeting I definitely do not recommend approving and then, uh, you know, amending the ordinance two weeks from now. Okay, so what form that direction to staff? What form do we want it to take? Can we, can we just say, yeah, what just what Mallory and Christina just said, or do we want to restate it? And <laughs> so Andrew's hearing it live, so that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, so so to, just to make sure I understand. So tell me if I've got this wrong. So so one thing we're doing is this quarterly review se section, which means we're going to see a bunch of applications of the high impact events next meeting. And then we're not going to see anything for three months after that. Right. And then, January. And, January. yeah, so this, you know, have, having individual events kind of trickle in every meeting. So that that's, that's going to cease and we're going to have view them in bigger batches. So that's one thing that's going to start now. And that's part of the new ordinance. Yes. And at the review in October, assuming you all want to move forward with this, you would see probably the busiest quarter for events. So April through the end of June. Uh, yeah, okay. so it could be a long, a long list, but I envision like an agenda summary where every event is listed out, maybe alphabetically. Yeah. <laughs> and then the details that Angie shared earlier for like Moab Craigan of how many people, what type is it, and then you guys would have that in advance with the applications to look through um, and then kind of look at the calendar and. Yeah, but I'm, I'm presuming there would be maybe some kind of staff recommendation about which ones to approve and then we can we take that as a starting point and so, or if there's difficult issues that will yeah. be left as options A and B or something. I, I think kind of like when we get uh, reviews from planning and zoning, where there's like a recommendation and then if there are like curve balls, there's kind of like, be sure to consider this or consider that. And, and like, this is what we want the commission to weigh on, you know? So it's not like we're starting from a blank slate. It's kind of like teed up for us. And we know. Like we know how you like it. <laughs> well, that's a good segue into what a low impact event is, I think, to discuss, because obviously y'all aren't even going to be looking at low impact events. Right. But so do y'all want to put it there? Really no? quickly, can I make sure that I have this correct for what we'll be incorporating now? It's the intent to apply changes, just the, the suggested inclusions for the narrative, um, the quarterly reviews for high impact, and the review schedule for when things will come to our view. I feel like there's one thing I'm forgetting. So if you want to talk about low impact. Um, I, I guess we can talk about that next. But I, I was just saying, but on these attempt to apply things, if I understood Angie correctly, some people have already filled in something that's not quite you know the current version and i no, we're yeah. going to align the current version. we're going to move we're, ta we're taking out the plane so it was her only oh really okay so there's not a signal because i was just going to say i think during this transition period we should show some flexibility about what counts as a complete ita and yes definitely does yeah. your it include an event narrative yes general? it does it just wouldn't specifically list the 
then we can pretty much that. give it a bit narrative like I can um and if Rachel's here she can on the county ones I'm still learning all the county events So okay, so is that is that clear? We got enough some work to do. So yeah, can we move on to the work then. details? Yeah. Would well, y'all want to talk about what is a special event, no, what isn't gonna, a special event, event or a low I'm impact event? A note down, I'll come back to it. Go <laughs> okay, my brain wants to go to a low impact, do and it. I don't have any changes. So what, um, Mallory? If you guys have this, Mallory has drafted um, low impact characteristics. And what would be identified as low impact is all of these characteristics. So, um, so can we put that on the screen? Yeah. yeah. It's 160, I think. Nope, I'm wrong. Where is it? No, I'm wrong. That it's 81660. I can't find it. 81660. Oh, 60, not 160. We'll talk next about what it, what events are and aren't, but this is what you won't see. <laughs> Unless you want to, and then you can. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. Okay. So here are the characteristics. It's really hard to see, isn't it? It's an and, the list is an and, and some of the tweaks I'm going to make in the definitions um, will clarify that you have to meet all of these to qualify as a low impact event. 200 people or less, no anticipated impacts on neighborhoods or roadways in residential areas, and we, we include three roadways that we hear a lot of complaints about noise on these roadways, but if, you know, think hard about that. Is that a complete list? Is that accurate? Is that what y'all wanna see? I like um, nothing illegal, a minimal impact on county resources. And there's also the very last one, which I love is um, no public safety resources required. So if, if you need EMS there, if you need, uh, you know, the sheriff's office there, then you're a high impact event. <laughs> Could, could we zoom out a little bit on the screen? So? <laughs> oh my goodness. I need a mouse or something, okay? Too close. No or minimal impact to roads, traffic, or resident access. You know. So, so, so one thing I, I wonder is, um, I mean, does, does two need to be made more specific? I mean, it seems like, you know, noise is something we have in mind there, which I, like, you know, events with, like a concert or music event with amplified sound. Um, I mean, that, that's, you know, potentially a, a big sound impact. Is it, is it clear? Does two need to be rephrased to take in that sort of thing too? Maybe. You tell us. You tell <laughs> I, us, I, I think so. I mean, I, or, or when could, um. That was probably supposed, you know, a general impact um, subsection. Yeah, it's, so I mean, just just off the top of my head, number two could you, know, you could either add or rephrase it to say something, you know, that this includes, you know, cr cr crowding or noise in, in residential neighborhoods, you know, and then parenthesis, um, you know, offer of vehicles, amplified sound, you know, whatever else we think there is out there that causes noise. Or looking at the roads is difficult. Are we going to include city streets? Are we talking about just county? Because I mean, a lot of the impact is in hap is happening in uh, the incorporated area. So that's all we can really control. Right? Yeah. Well, but we can still. That would make a difference between a low and a high. Is you know, are they? You know, Mill Creek's both in city and out of city. Most of them are. Right. So okay. all of okay. those are both. Oh, yeah. Both. I, yeah I, so I, I would say if it's a county event, but it's having noise impacts within city limits, I still, I mean, the city would, is within the county and we should, we should put them in. Much. So like, uh, you know, what is it? Third, third South, Spanish Trail. I, I think. Or do we want to go and name them all? Just. Uh, it could it could get just yeah, really complicated. Yeah, I, I think a general statement would be better. 
So no names at all. Yeah, but but just make it clear that. We started thinking about it. Yeah, I think one example we have in mind is large numbers of loud vehicles in you know off of Highway 191 and not in the back country, you know, near places people live. Another, I think, is ampl amplified music. Uh, my my issue with the the vehicles is that I don't think a lot of our out of town permittees consider driving on Mill Creek Drive up to Sand Flats a residential yeah. impact. So we're telling them, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. a residential impact. Uh, I see what you're saying about that. Yeah, it's, 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 we're not talking about locusts, right? We're talking right. about a different road. Okay, um, but but okay. but they're not going to be assigning themselves low. I mean, you know, staff's going to look at what they're proposing to do and. It's true. It's and there's always this tension between specificity, which I like, and more general, which there's some value to being more general too. But. Okay. I mean, if this is both general and it gives some examples, but does that exclude yeah, other example, streets? Maybe put an example there. Um, including example. I can say including, but not limited to or whatever. We can work yeah. on that. Okay. Yeah. Because you've got Fifth West, you have, there's just a whole bunch of streets that when there's a lot of people in town, deal with a lot of traffic yeah but i but i think other other than like wordsmithing item two there this seems like a good list to me i can't think of anything that's being left out so. one thing that comes to my mind is um like say an event is happening in the back country so the event proper has minimal impact to county neighborhoods but i would like the special events committee to weigh the impact of a thousand extra guests in town who own certain vehicles or uh, on residential neighborhoods as well. I might, I'm not well, going that, back. That would come to us because it's going to be more than 200 people. Right. Okay. So, I mean, are right. there are there other examples where you think like people are currently in the high impact status that it's like, man, these guys should really be low impact? Well, and that's something that we would hope to catch in the review and the exceptions um but it also might be something that you know we yeah. roll this out and see what kind of events are being captured and pushed up when they shouldn't be or maybe even vice versa but then again i think maybe would i think the public safety piece of it is going to push some events that we might otherwise be considered low impact into high impact but as you're going to hear more about saturation and how to calculate that public safety resources is critical and our law enforcement is really starting to tell us we don't have enough people to staff these events in case things happen and things will happen um and so you know i i think it'll be interesting but but i do think just that one thing alone will will push things to you. Yeah. So I, I wanted to address Sarah's point or, or question about noise impacts, which aren't part of the event proper, but are you know a foreseen as side effect of, of the event. And I, I think that would count number two as well. You know, like if you know someone's having some you know Harley Davidson fest, you know, up by Cisco, but we know that everyone's going to be staying in hotels in Moab. I I would say yeah, that's probably that potentially has noise effects in neighborhoods and therefore that's a high impact event. I'm going to use yeah. that statement against you later. Okay. <laughs> which, but I agree with you. Which which one are you going to use against me? We'll find out. Okay, <laughs> okay I think I know. Um, and really quickly talking about the public safety piece. I, I don't know if you said this part, but I think an, an emphasis is just on the behind, beyond normal operations. Uh, Which, uh, right, is in the definition. Oh. <laughs> What's okay. in the definition of special event? Oh, I see, you're beyond, okay, yeah. Which ties in with special event? Yes. Ignore me. Uh, ignore me. And really quickly, that triggers another thought for the intent to apply. The one thing we might want to put on there right away is um, the number of vehicles, if it is a motor vehicle or a motorized event. That is something we definitely need to talk about. And even in subsection one, where it has people, it should be daily total attendees, because that's our term. And then we need to probably tweak that to determine because what we've seen even the very last meeting where we had special events one of the special events we were unclear 
whether their participant number was people, vehicles, drivers. Um, the second event y'all looked at, it was very specifically drivers. They were counting 95 drivers and that was specified by August. Um, so, you know, we need to be as clear as possible everywhere in the ordinance, I think, about how we want to do it. And that's up to you guys, right? What that, what you want to see and where you want to put these limits. But, and so talking about that, subsection one is low impact is less than 200 people. Um, you know, is that a number you like? Well, that should be daily total attendees, which right now is defined as humans, but it's all the humans associated. It's the owner, it's the I, staff, it's a volunteer, it's participants. Spectators. Or spectators. Like, all at of a race, there might be like 50 racers, but they all got two people right. with them. Yeah, so it's, every, so it's the whole thing. It's not vehicles, and we'll talk about how the BLM regulates their permitting processing based on mechanized vehicles, which includes bikes, for example, mountain bikes. You know, so there's different ways. Um, well, 200 seems reasonable to me. I, th I think it's also an, an easy thing to tweak if, if we find that it's too many things are falling above or below it, that they shouldn't be there. We did Just... analyze it. I looked at it. Um, and then the last few years, um, well, I can't remember the numbers, but about 500 is where a lot of our events split. Mm -hmm. And most of our events are under 500. I can't say about under 200. I would say, our, well, our smallest vehicle event is probably Raptors on the Rocks. That's 40 registered vehicles. And then our next, which would be smallest, would be Jeep Jamboree. That's about 300. But doing 200, that will keep like the dog shows right. and the junior sure. rodeos, um, the barrel races in low impact. Oh, yeah. Those are the three I think of right off the top of my head. I think I would be comfortable increasing that number of total daily attendance if we also specified a, a vehicle limit that was different from that. But, yeah. And one thing to consider with the 200, limit is that there is the exception section that would uh, you know the recurring local events would have a little more room yeah uh, but okay. again if you want to put something in about the number of motorized vehicles but right now i would imagine any motorized vehicles we would be kicking to high impact either way but right there's any I mean, this Raptor on the right. rocks, and 40 trucks or whatever. It's like, they usually just, would, if there was four people in a rig, <laughs> there's it's not very many whites that come to that event. <laughs> right. But I would say vehicles, even if driven by a single person, have so much of a larger impact than, mm -hmm. you know, because it numbers are so qualitative. You know, I mean, Star Hall has a capacity of almost 300, but it's, you know, you would never notice that there's something going on there. Whereas, 40, you know, truck driving people going through town would be much more noticeable. So, um, but I agree with not expanding that 200 number, but I like the um, sort of process that will hopefully become more effective of not grandfathering in, but taking repeat um, events that we kind of deem to be low impact, even if they're numbers exceed that and there will definitely be conversations with um, local event sponsors and people that would have really good insight um, even in the parts of the ordinance that would be coming to you guys in the coming weeks but also with what we're planning with the processing platform just to figure out those logistics and kind of their lived experience so want to make sure those things are taken into account but that would not affect any of this which is to affect the behind the scenes but also give the ability to come back to you guys and say this isn't working this is where we think a change needs to happen so do you want to see the vehicle number or and what would that number be Like yeah, what are those thresholds? 25. 25. Right. right. That's just to count it as an event, not as a high impact. Right. Correct. Right. 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 That's the threshold for getting a permit, whether it's competitive, um, 
commercial or just organized. So 25 people with mountain bikes, 25 people with vehicles, you gotta get a permit from the dealer. It's considered beyond the normal use of public lands, that, that gathering. And there's some doubt that being consistent. Yeah. Right? But then there's the question of, would we then kick the can of, this doesn't even require a an event permit if we don't wanna permit 25 mountain bikers? I think the next that that number 25 would be very useful in defining what a special event is, since it seems kind of unclear. Um, but then hopefully this whole process would funnel any of those t types of events towards the high impact if it was going to be high impact. So maybe we don't need to specify the number of vehicles in this instance. I think if it's really clear that the 200 is total people in attendance, you know, if it's supporters, spectators, ride alongs, whatever, that right now we might not need a, a vehicle number to determine between low and high. That's my two cents. I agree with that. All right, let's leave that there. We'll chew on that and maybe bring something back to you. So some, some right, one other thing on related, related yeah. to this, though, to look, um, I, I think in the Mallory's current proposal, if we've got like a, a very large event, you know, thousands of people, but it's been going on for a long time, we're, we're calling it low impact. Um, I'm just wondering whether it makes sense, you know, that's clearly it's not a low impact event, it's a high impact event. And we can still streamline the approval of that bit by allowing them to you know, get approved early instead of waiting for the court reviews or things like that. But I just think it might make it, make it easier for us when we're thinking about capacity to have all the events that have a high impact be officially high impact events in terms of thinking like how many we want in a month and things like that, rather than call, you know, making them technically low impact, even though the impacts might be high. So, so, so I'm, I'm not, so I'm, I'm agreeing that there should be an easier approval pathway for events that have been going on a long time and or maybe locally organized, but I just, you know, it's maybe more a terminological thing that, you know, we, we should recognize that they're high impact events and that affects whether we want to improve other high impact events at the same time or nearby. I think um, we threw around the term legacy events, uh, but I don't know if that would take away good, right? field acquisition. <laughs> the, uh, the impact of the impact here is to have legacy events that wouldn't necessarily be defined as either. So maybe that's not the way to go. But, but what's so, or we could just say it's a high impact event and we, it has to, you know, pass in front of set some quarterly review meeting, but they can do it like 12 months out if they want to. Um, I, and I guess I don't see the harm in that. I think that serves the blockout date discussion too, because hey, no events in these peak weekends except for legacy events or whatever. That's a whole another big conversation, I think. Mm, that's maybe the fourth thing I forgot to mention. Yes, I think it is. Um, before well, we go there, <laughs> it, it um the the kind of event that Kevin is describing, I think would be a high impact event receiving an exemption. That's already written in here. It is, but but the, the committee could approve it. The committee that could approve it, written. but the policy then change would be, it also comes back to the commission in that package of events that we're approving at that time so you can see it. But it, right. it's still a high impact event. It, it didn't get classified as a low impact event. It just got an exemption. Yeah, I guess another way of saying it is if, if I ever look at a list of our high impact events, I would like that list to include, you know, the legacy events and things too. That's what it comes that makes to. Sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a better way to write it even. It's not exempt from being high impact, it's exempt from the commission's quarterly review process. So kind of going back to what we have in the current order ordinance of the pre-authorized streamlined yeah. list, but instead, so legacy events status. would sort of skip the intent to apply stage. No, no, they would just be able 
to be reviewed by the committee instead, instead of the commission. Of, I argue, but you um, would see them on the calendar. But, but why, I mean, what, what's wrong with the following proposal, which is, no, they are reviewed by us, but they have the option of getting reviewed earlier. You know, and there, there's an understanding that probably will, you know, we, we've written into the code that one of the things we take into effect into account is events that have a good track record because they've been going on for years and, you know, we know they don't cause problems. Um, that that doesn't seem to come. We want to keep these quarterly review meetings so simple. We don't let you. Well, yeah, so we're going to get some proposal. You know, in March we're going to have these three events, and maybe all three of them are legacy events, and we just say, yeah, that looks good. I mean, that's not that hard. Okay, I think we're going to come back to you guys with a legacy event proposal. How about that? <laughs> well, yes, but. I guess the piece to know for the October quarter review, I assume, because we wouldn't have deemed these things, I don't know, legacy yet, we'll just bring all of them, Sounds all good. of the high ones. Mario yeah. will be great. Um, and then one other small comment on that. I think in the draft language, you're saying legacy is like more than five years. I, I would make that more like 10 or something. I mean, I. Five years, I think, is a very short, you know, if there's an event that's been going on six years, to me, that's a kind of a new, newish event compared to some of the others that we have going on. We did talk about it. We, we started at two, and then we said, no, from two to five, you're really growing still. Um, I mean, I'm fine with that. How do you guys feel? I, I think 10's appropriate. 10? 10. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So given, okay, the circumstance where in the future we prove, uh, we give the SEAC ability to approve legacy events, it never comes to the commission and there's never an option to impose conditions or any like thing like that? Well, the committee could impose those conditions. Okay. And, and you guys can pluck an event anytime you want. So you have could, authority okay. to review yeah. events. That's yeah, but I, I just think rather than us taking the initiative to pluck it, I just, we can take the initiative as, okay, you know, we've got, 10 events on the agenda, but seven of them are shoe ends because they've been going on for more than 10 years. And then we focus. I, the, the latter thing seems better to me. So. Can, can we tool in some sort of review as part of the quarterly meeting? So before we look at like the next, like, oh, these are the what just happened in the last quarter. Anything crazy? You know what I'm saying? No. Uh, so, like uh, so like when we meet October 15th, we also look at what just happened the post today. Oh, yeah, yeah. October, September, August and say, hey, before this is a year away and popping up on us, how was last weekend? We are beefing up the post event evaluation process. I think the special event coordinator is going to be critical for making that an effective tool. Which right now, it's not that effective. I know Angie does bring up some good things now and then. But then we got to enforce it. We got to be like, okay, the, this hurts you now. I think we've run into that before when we were considering denying events and they're like, you never told us it was bad. Yeah, exactly. So got to do something. About Are we ready to move on to what isn't an event? Yeah. Event. Yeah, let's talk about that, and then we're going to talk about when the event is. <laughs> Do you want to bring up O four the exceptions provision just above that? I don't know. Yeah, it's not if I want to. I can I? <laughs> there goes. There goes. Um, this is what we have now, um, which is expanded from our current ordinance. Special event does include non-commercial, non-competitive family, friends, and youth events, right? These like friendly gatherings um, or conferences, trainings, lectures that are held in capital facilities. Um, well, what's come up in this discussion with Cliff is one, the BLM permits non-competitive, non-commercial organized events at 25 mechanized vehicles. And that's a local field office rule. There is no national rule, it's local field office and it's black and white hardcore, can't get around it. Um, 
And that is because they've deemed it. What their special recreation permit regulations say is that the local field office gets to determine when you've exceeded like the normal threshold of use, when um, lands are sensitive enough that these thresholds start to matter, blah, blah, blah. So the local field office has determined that's 25 mechanized vehicles, including mountain bikes. You know, do we want to have a similar threshold? which arguably we actually have right now, but we need to clarify it because Cliff brought up great questions where it's not clear. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly been on group mountain bike rides larger than 25. Right, or do we not? Right. Um, well, I, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, I think, you know, with, with the internet, you can organize some really large events without them being commercial or having any entity sponsoring them. But I, I think the, the largest of those types of things, I think probably, you know, I think we do want to be able to control those by requiring them to get the permit, et cetera. So I wouldn't say just because it's non-commercial, non-competitive, it doesn't require a special event permit. And right, I think so that also creates the threshold. A... Do we accept BLM? Do we create our own? Well, I think we should also differentiate between anything that might be on public lands like BLM land and might be right. on non-public lands or like, you know, uh, like within Spanish Valley or within private property, both, you know, I'm thinking of like, um, you know, mass bike rides through town, obviously that city, but like if they went out onto the soon to be trail down Spanish Valley, like does that require? How about, how about NICA practice, Evan? That gets yeah. up to 25 people sometimes. But that, I I mean, that's, I was, I was thinking like football games, but I guess that's consistent with the facilities occupancy design standards, but. I mean, the NICA races are permitted, but practice has more than 25 bikes. So. Does the BLM um, have a, a cap on the number of permits like this that they issue and evaluate it? As... I'm not aware of, I've never heard of anyone being denied an SRP. I, I have heard of, of people being dinged for like organizing something through a Facebook group and yeah. people showing up for like even a training. Right. And it was like a... yeah. So what if we put a in in item A? I guess item A up there, they have to be less less than 150 participants. So total daily attendees. Days, yes. And um, okay, I mean, how do you guys feel about that? And do you want to have this vehicle or mechanized equipment language, or just the daily total attendees? Well, I mean, a wedding could. Yeah, you can have easily weddings. Be yeah, same with a family reunion or a dance. Party. But I feel like a lot of the weddings would be at um, private at uh, facilities, or they might be on public lands, or out in Castle Valley on a lot private you know. property somewhere. <laughs> so if you if you have a wedding with the BLM, you have to have a permit. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I don't think you should have to have a permit from the county if you have a wedding on private land. I don't know. That's yeah, just my. Yeah. Okay, so what about 250 people or 50 vehicles? You know, they, they have to be under both of those. If they're non-commercial, non-competitive. Yeah, yeah. 250 yeah. and 50 vehicles. And that's motor vehicles or mechanized vehicles? <laughs> motorized. I'm not going to say motorized. Uh, Divergence from the BLM's. 250 still feels like a lot, though, to say don't need a permit but, but it's specifically okay family friends i mean cliff had examples yeah. he had examples of motor bike groups <laughs> that get together in the many dozens and whitewash various four by four groups and they're friends and family but they can be you know more than, <laughs> for sure more than the 25 and so they're getting an srp from the blm do we care um where again it's non-commercial non-competitive Maybe we don't. They're getting permit through the BLM, but then his point was, well, where's the where do y'all start to care? Because a thousand's a big deal, yeah. you know. Yeah. And like you say, it's easier with social media to organize big things. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm almost if the BLM requires an SRP. Maybe they're a low impact. You know, like just check the box, get the thing. I don't know how. I, don't, I have no idea how many of these BLM permits are being issued for these 
small events. I don't either. We could probably do a little bit more work with Todd with the BLM and, yeah. and but, that, but that is there. a good point. If they're already getting an SRP, then the BLM can also let them know, yeah, you also need the county yeah, permit. Yeah, I think, I think the more we're in line with other people, the easier, the easier it'll be. Right. If it's like, well, it's 30 people with these guys and 25 vehicles with those guys. And the original intention was to align our new definition of a special event precisely with the BLM so that there's no confusion. Well, it turns out there is no precise definition of a special event with the BLM. And so it's very squishy. And, you know, this 25 mechanized vehicle rule is one black and white rule they have. Otherwise, it's like, you've got to tell us what you're doing. We decide. It's, you know, right. Well, if they've so, got a black and white rule, let's stick with it. Okay, I think I have enough to do some research and or propose something different. Okay, and then going up to the definition of special event. Um, and then I'm done. For the permitted permanent facility, like what 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 exactly are the parameters of that? Um, well, that could be, oh, so for example, we do lots of trainings, right? Yeah. Um, so train, you know, Grand Center, that's not our building, but, mm -hmm. but right, Grand Center does a ton of training and conferences. If yeah. that was in the county and we're permitting it, we would not have a special event permit. Just like OSTA, they go through, you know, um, booking OSTA, booking right. the Grand Center, but right. booking Star Hall, but we're not requiring a special event. So like the Mark, Star Hall. Right. Woody's. What about a campground? Woody's. Like a group site at a campground? Um, I think the group sites have like limits too. So I think if it's like within its, but then that mm -hmm. probably go back to the BLM. It's like, oh, you're getting a group campsite. The health department would come in on that one for occupancy oh. at the campgrounds. Um, and same with probably Woody's because it's far. Right. And then let's say it's Woody's plus some organized thing over here in the county, then they're yeah. going to need a special event. Right. Anyway. It was like just an event at Woody's. Right. Like an there's event a at Woody's. There's a Halloween party. So, uh, it's like whatever. That's Evan will awesome. be there. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, be at Woody's. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't think we need to look at okay. because the my question on the special event definition is SRP related, and I don't think we need to look at that. So should we talk block update saturation and all that? Or um, I don't personally think so. <laughs> I think it's best I to kind of. Really see okay. how this goes but we can certainly talk about potential saturation considerations outside of the public safety mm -hmm. okay you guys want to pass this thing <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> we didn't change that much have we already made a motion to postpone uh, I don't think, I don't so. think so I make a motion we <laughs> postpone until the next uh, meeting and hopefully that will be <laughs> the yeah, last. I have postponed. Second. So did we decide we need a vote on a postpone? Can we maybe take action uh, while the uh, chair we've had is a, gone? We've, we've, had a, we've had a motion and a second. Uh, motion by Mary, second by uh, Josie. Uh, any further discussion? Call for the vote. Oh. I have some further discussion. I was just looking for an update on the uh, coordinator position and what was going on with that. So it is posted, but we've decided to kind of just go slowly with that uh, before actually doing interviews or hiring because we've realized that having the positions great, getting the processing platform is great. But right now, I think things are still very confusing and probably will be. Um, so I, I, I think getting through the first round of quarterly reviews, uh, late approval up and running soon, that will. I mean, is there value in having somebody like do the approval? Like, cause there's gonna be like a build when it comes online, right? Yes, but I don't think there would be because it's still, it's still confusing enough that, gotcha. especially okay. in, without it being the, I don't want to say the right person, but yeah, I think that at this point it would be best to say, here's some parameters, here's a system, here's what's gotcha. being rolled out right now, and then 
internet? I don't know, but I'm quite certain you guys will hear a lot more about special events. And if we take one step forward, it's not going to be a, a fix. I did, we spoke to some people from Aspen. They said it's truly never ending. Yeah, make it a standard. So, did we Any further the discussion? No, I derailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a count? There was hands in the air. All right, it sounds like we have a motion on the table to postpone. Um, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. That passes seven to nothing. Next. <laughs> All right, so we are now, that was, uh, was that item L? We're on, we are on to item M, uh, recession of resolution number 3245 from 2020 ATV special event moratorium. Mallory. And so this is in essence what it, it needs to be, which is uh, rescinding the ATV moratorium that was put in place in 2020. Um, and then Part of this is also looking at the changes with the special event uh, process and how it kind of empowers people to look at how they can address issues um, that could be highlighted by the community or that might uh, bump up with ordinances. So this is just kind of to to lift that piece, but to move forward and can give people more more freedom to propose and have buy-in to their event in align in alignment with the county philosophy. The summary mentions upon passage of the special event ordinance ordinance overhaul on October fourth, which we just postponed. Does, does this seem like the order of operations is off if, uh, if we don't have the uh, I think we have the spirit of ordinance the ordinance passes, ready. Passed. We have the spirit. Yeah, we I don't think we're moving. obliged to approve anything. And I think the gap between the two is small enough that it doesn't seem like an issue to me. So can I, can I yes, I'll, can I'll move to rescind and void Grand County Resolution number 3245 from 2020 shall be of no further force or effect. Second. All right, motion by Kevin and second by Mary. Yeah, and I think Mallory already said some of this, but I, I think, you know, with this new special event policy that's, you know, gradually coming into effect, I think that gives a much more holistic and flexible way of dealing with noisy and disruptive events. I, I think that is a very important issue. Um, and, and you know, as we go deciding which events we approve or which not, we should be really vigilant about events that have caused too much noise. So I, I think the, the spirit of this ATV event moratorium is still in effect. I think just we have a better way of kind of implementing that policy now. So we don't need the, um, you know, the sort of simple way of doing it. Right, thanks, Kevin. Um, my only thought on this, because I understand that for the future of this process, that makes sense that it's only a couple of weeks before we're going to pass um, our new special events ordinance, but our next item is approving uh, an event that has ATV components. So this does actually feel uh, consequential, at least to me. That's my thought. Thanks, Trish. I think it's important we move forward with, uh, you know, rescinding this uh, ordinance and uh, so that we can allow our next item to move forward. And we have had the moratorium in effect for just about two calendar years. They're always supposed to be, traditionally, they're not in effect that long. I think that's for land use code. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking that. Never mind. <clears throat> All right, any further discussion on this? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote on the motion by Kevin and second by Mary. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand, say aye. All those opposed. 
Motion passes four to three with commissioners Clapper, Kovash, and Stock in opposition. Uh, on to item N, amending the approval of the 2022 Fallen Peace Officer event. Angie. Okay. I believe you guys originally saw this event back in February. Um, and it was approved with some conditions. So I'm bringing it back to you um, and amending it. Um, so this is a memorial trail ride at the Fallen Peace Officers Trail um, with a ceremony at the Old Spanish Trail Arena. Um, the dates will be November 11th through the 12th, 250 participants, 50 spectators and 15 staff. Um, the locations will be at the Fallen Peace Officers Trail and the Old Spanish Trail Arena. I've included in your packet the special event application and the schedule of events. I'm sure you guys have questions. Um, I can answer those. All right, questions for Angie? November 11th Veterans Day, isn't it? No, I think that's right. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, All cool. Right. That's a perfect day to have this. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I was misremembering some of the history. So I, I do remember voting on this previously you know, within the past year. The event got rescheduled or something, so it, we need to do it again, or is this a, a second iteration of the it, same event? It got rescheduled. Okay. It didn't so, so this is something we approved before, and now we just have to approve it with the new. Yeah. Okay. And okay. without the that one condition that was put on. What, what was the condition? It was for um, Jeeps, <laughs> ATVs, for ATVs. Oh, I, I thought we did. Mayor? I move to approve the 2022 Fallen Peace Officer event originally scheduled for April 22nd to 23rd to the new uh, date of uh, November 10th through 12th. Thanks, Mary. I'll second that. All right. Uh, discussion. I'll, I'll say that um, I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of this event. I think this, would, this has been going on. I think this would qualify as a legacy event. Um, and uh, I have, Mary and I have uh, worked with the organizer for a few months um, trying to um, work through a few things to make this work. And uh, we have the organizer's word that um, everyone will trailer to the event at the uh, Fallen Peace Officer Trail for the trail ride. Um, and I, the, the event is a charity event. It's put on by uh, one of our Grand County local heroes. And um, I, I think that it's, uh, yeah, I'm very much in favor of this. I'm really excited about what they do on the nights before and how they recognize the families who have lost members through, you know, in their active duty and I think these type of events are really, really important for our society and for our community. So I'm really excited to see if we vote to move it forward. So I was, I mean, um, one of the concerns about this is, you know, does it, or to, to what extent does it set precedence for, for other things? And so one thing we might want to do is amend the motion to include some findings that kind of explain why you know this, we're approving this so yeah, if, if someone else thinks that's valuable i'll propose such an amendment it would be things like you know it's this only one ride the trailers are going to be used etc um, or we could just say it without yeah, amending the motion yeah certainly kevin I, I think i think that might be valuable the amendment or just saying uh, I, I, i'd rather it be formal and i'd rather be very specific. So for example, how long has it been going on if we're talking about as a legacy event? Charity, it's a hundred percent of proceeds go to charity, right, Brody? One hundred percent. Yeah, Brody, do you want to come forward in, uh, in case anyone has questions or, yeah, thanks. The, the makeup of the motorized vehicles involved um, really flesh out details for your findings. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'll be as detailed as you're proposing, but I'll try to include some details. But so I, I guess I move to amend the motion to include the following findings. Um, this, this is, there's only one ride associated with this event. Um, it's in a place that's pretty far from town. Where can 
The Fallen Peace Officer trail ride is on Sitla land north of Moab. Is that a good description? Yes. Fallen yes. Peace Officer yes. trail. And uh, the state park. I think it's about 15 miles north of town. But in particular, it's not, it's not one of the trails that's immediately adjacent to the town where people tend to ride vehicles through neighborhoods to get to it. So it's not that kind of trail ride. Um, we've been assured by the organizer that trailers will be used to get to the trailhead. That's also kind of typical for one that's this far away. Um, I wasn't going to mention the legacy thing because that, that's kind of not an issue for me. Um, but, but I think the, those three things, so that, that's the end of my proposed amendment. Um, 100% goes to charity. Okay, sure. And 100% of yeah. the things go to charity. I'll, I'll throw that in. It's finding number four. Um, How long has it been going on, Brody? Uh, 2013. Yeah. Okay. 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 So this would make it the 10th. Okay, sure. It's, it's an event that's been happening in our community we'll make, for near... We'll shut it down for... Uh, right, gotcha. Yes. Ne so, nearly 10 years. And the moratorium. Okay, so. <laughs> shut it down. It was convenient, right? Moratorium and COVID. <laughs> It wasn't our fault. <laughs> right, not entirely. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that that's the end of my imprisonment. I'm I'm sure I'm torturing Gabe here with, <laughs> and then with all the interruptions and stuff. Okay. But but I but I think the the point is the, the reason I think that's improvement important and the reason that I'm inclined I think I, that I will vote for this is if we just look at the spectrum of noise in our community and even narrow down on motor vehicle noise. Um, you know, this event is, is just kind of a drop in the bucket. You know, a lot of our noise comes from vehicle, you know, UTV rentals that we allow to happen. And I, I think, you know, if we really want to tackle the noise problem, we should be thinking about the land use code and what we can do to address that part. I think we also just have large numbers of private users who come to town. And so I, that's why I'm, I'm inclined, you know, I, I just don't think this is, a major issue when it comes to noise because it's so small and, and also because I, this is not the beginning of such a slow slope where we're going to having something like this you know once a week you know forever i i think this is an unusual event we're not going to see something that's exactly like this coming before us and so i don't to me this doesn't feel like we're on the road to approving other things which might eventually amount to a significant noise impact we get a second before we second sure. yeah. great thank you mary so if we're, one were to vote for this amendment, you're just voting to add the findings. It doesn't mean you're voting for the main motion. To clarify the trailering promise, um, trailering ATVs, because it's ATVs, it's motorcycles, it's Jeeps, it's other four by fours. It's a mixed it's use horses, motorized event. Horses, okay. And mountain bikes. Yeah, mostly motorized. Okay, so the trailering is are the ATVs. So yes, are we all so on? Saturday morning, the major ride there's, we have an event in Spanish trails, it's a ceremony, and then the distance between the ceremony and the trail is significant, right? It's 20 miles really of, yeah. more significant or easier to just trailer. They trailered here to get to Moab. Definitely ask them to trailer to the event. And the Friday ride is very small. It's just the families of the fallen officers who ride out there. It's, as large as what we see on Saturday. So we do a dinner for him that night. Honor their, you know, fallen family member and it's a great event. And 100% of the profits, proceeds, that it, it goes to a scholarship which a family member can apply for to further their education, their trade. So the Brody Young Scholarship. The Correct. Brody Young Scholarship, not much choice to <laughs> scholarship should be named after Dead people. <laughs> <laughs> That's really very good. decidedly not dead. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, it's a good thing, and it's helped actually a lot of uh, you know kids, uh, spouse, uh, get get on with their life. And, yeah. yeah, it's nice, nice little thing. So again, voting voting for the amendment doesn't obligate one to vote for the, the whole thing let me say one more thing the ride is unique at every mile marker we have the, you know one of the 13 officers that we're honoring that year in their stage there so a lot of family it's a slower ride they pull over and as other people ride along and we only allow 
think it's 15 machines at a time every half hour. So it's really not this race, you know, it's not a poker run, it's just a home or memorial kind of thing. So, kind of unique. First trail uh, it's been named, you know, Fallen Peace Officer Trail in the country as far as well. Oh, wow. That's so neat. It's unique, kind of fun to have that here and being able to do that every year. Yeah, thank you, Brody. Yeah. Um, all right, so I will call on a on a vote to amend the original motion. So, all those in favor of amending, raise your hand. Passes seven to nothing. Um, the original motion. Any further discussion? On, or I'm sorry, the amended the original motion. Any further discussion on the amended motion? I would just say that it. Uh, uh, sounds like a great event um uh it sounds very well organized and because of the broader picture and kind of what's going on in the community i'm not going to vote for it today but it's nothing about this individual event as much as um, kind of sticking to policy and what i think we should be doing don't take any of it personally. I don't. Thanks, Evan. Joseph. Um, well, kind of going off of that, but this has been hard for me because especially on the um, ATV issue, I've been very inclined to just keep a hard line because I think it's been crossed so much in this community. But um, to be honest, I don't know that this is the event that I want to stake that entire um, claim on. So I've been very conflicted, but I think that uh, I'm not opposed to this. Thank you. All right. Um, seeing no further discussion, I'll call for a vote on the amended motion. Uh, I think that was by uh, the uh, motion by Mary and second by Trish. So all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All those opposed. Motion passes five to two with Commissioners Clapper and Stock opposed. Thank you all. I'm really glad we got to this point, Brody. It's been a long time. Yeah. All right. Oh, we got more on the agenda. You can stay. <laughs> How much more? <laughs> we, great, great. This is and this will started at four. Yeah. We had a workshop. Yeah. We had a workshop. Yeah. We have consent agenda, which is easy, and then we have a closed session. Great. I'll get out of your way then. Thank all right. You all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for uh, sticking with us all meeting. Brian. I hope it's a good time. <laughs> yes. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Angie. Um, on to our consent agenda. Um, and I just want to say that we did change something around on this. You'll notice that there's some board appointments. We decided to put board appointments when there is only one appointee and they have the approval of the board uh, or the body that um, is uh, nominating them. Uh, we're just going to add it to the consent agenda. I think that's a bit of a no brainer. Yeah. All right. So the consent agenda tonight consists of a uh, letter of support for safe streets for all Safe Streets for All Grant, SS4A2. The abbreviation, SS4A2. Oh, okay. <laughs> Safe Streets for All, sorry. Um, it's like, huh, that's interesting. Uh, ex uh, item B, extending a state of local emergency due to severe rain and flash flooding. Uh, item C, Grand County Children's Justice Center, uh, Utah Attorney General Office, Vita Nix, annual contract 2022. And uh, appointing volunteer member to the airport board, uh, council on aging board member, member approval, and ratifying signature on road equipment order. I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thanks, Trish. I'll second unless someone already did it. So, All right, motion to approve consent agenda by Trish and second by Kevin. Uh, discussion on any consent agenda items. All right, all those in favor of the consent agenda, raise your hand. Uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. 
I'll make a motion to go into closed session to discuss reasonable, intimate, imminent, or pending litigation. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> yeah. That I'll second that. <laughs> yeah, my yeah. happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, is it your birthday, not today? Yesterday. It was yesterday. Yeah. Oh, good. You didn't spend your birthday. 